I'm going to try to keep this intro relatively short. Before I start even that, however, I do realize that this is an incredibly long video, and as such, I've included three sets of time codes in the pinned comment. The first set covers what I think are the most important points John makes in the overall video. This is essentially the core of his defense for Fallout 3. The second set covers the entire video from beginning to end, so if there's any particular point you're looking for a response to, it should be there. Finally, the last set of time codes is for the music being used, since people ask about the background music. In 2019, I first made a response to many a true nerd's video, Fallout 3 is better than you think. This was made when I was still fairly new to YouTube, as someone actually making videos, and admittedly, I didn't handle it as well as I could have. My arguments were clumsily constructed, I threw out unnecessary insults, and generally, the video could have been a lot better. Despite being just under two years ago that that video was uploaded, I feel I've improved considerably, to the point I'm in the process of remaking a couple of my other videos as well, because they don't meet my current standard either. I completed part two of the response in October of 2019, and received plenty of valid criticism in the comments. Criticism I took to heart, and much like the Fallout 4 analysis videos that I'm remaking, I had issues with my own video. Between that and the suggestion of a friend, I decided to combine the two videos together and rework a couple arguments, which I uploaded in April of 2020. Admittedly, I should have just remade the entire video then and there, so I wouldn't ever have to touch it again, as over time I grew to dislike the video more and more. This left me with three options. One, simply leave it up as is. This isn't ideal, as it's not a great first impression of my channel, and as mentioned, the arguments aren't constructed as well as they could have been, and the video is a bit insulting. Two, take it down. Again, this isn't ideal. I still believe most of my points were accurate, even if the arguments made to support them weren't the greatest, and there's so much wrong with John's video that basically warrants a full response and deconstruction. Also, taking it down might have been seen as a win by the people who hate my video simply because it's critical of a popular game or popular YouTuber. Or three, remake the video. I feel this is genuinely the best option. I can make my arguments more clear and refined, respond further to things I've missed, avoid using insults as they're unnecessary in this case, and fix that really annoying thing I did with the original video, where I describe what John is saying, then play the clip of him saying it. We all make mistakes. The best thing is to recognize them, try to improve, and move on, which is what I'm doing here. My entire reasoning for making these response videos is because I genuinely believe there to be misinformation, fallacious arguments, and plenty of other issues with these videos, and I feel that warrants a response. That's not meant to be any kind of attack on John, and I'm genuinely not trying to start any kind of drama or dumb bullshit like that, but these videos, simply put, are not good. I understood going in that, as a response to a popular YouTuber, this would likely result in my channel getting more views. I view that as nothing more than a side effect of responding to someone popular, but it is not in any way, shape, or form the goal or intended purpose of these videos. If that really was my goal, it would have been far more beneficial to do a whole bunch of smaller videos responding to a bunch of different people in a short period of time. I also wouldn't have delayed the Fallout 4 response in order to spend two months making an analysis on a shitty game everyone forgot about a week after its release. Seriously, fuck Amnesia Rebirth, I fucking hate that game. I genuinely believe that remaking this video is the right thing to do, and I have no intention of half-assing it. My new method for making response videos is to get the entire transcript of the video, so I can see everything said in the video and respond to it properly. I believe this has led to a far higher quality response on my part, as I can more accurately see each and every statement without having to listen to a clip numerous times and potentially missing stuff, which is what happened in the original video. Additionally, since people in the comments of the original video had trouble with this, I'm not here to tell anyone they're wrong for liking Fallout 3, nor am I here to say you shouldn't like Fallout 3. It is entirely possible to watch through this entire video and agree with every single point I make and come away from it still liking the game. For some reason, it's become a somewhat common sentiment that I won't let people have their opinions or that I can't stand that anyone else likes Fallout 3 or 4. 
But that's simply not true. People are free to like or dislike whatever they want for whatever reason they want, and I don't have the power to make anyone change their mind, nor would I do so if I did have that power. The act of criticizing something isn't meant to tell anyone how they should or shouldn't feel. Finally, another common sentiment is that John's video is just his opinion, therefore I can't or shouldn't respond to it for some reason. However, it's not as simple as it being strictly his opinion. He makes arguments as though they're fact, not something he simply feels. The point of his video is to convince the audience that Fallout 3 is better than they think, not to share how he personally feels about the game, and as such, arguments for or against aspects of its quality can be responded to, especially if those arguments are wrong. If someone tells me they hate Lord of the Rings, there's nothing I can do with that, except maybe ask why. If they tell me it's because there's too many gunfights in it, they're citing a reason, one that is factually incorrect, and as such, I can respond to it and point out how it's wrong. Despite what some people in the comments seem to think, calling something an opinion is not an impenetrable shield from criticism. With all that out of the way, let's get into this. In 2008, Fallout 3 came out, and most people seemed to like it. Not everybody, this was a new dev team, new publisher, and the first ever Fallout in 3D, so some stuff had changed, and changes never universally liked. But aggregated reviews of both critics and the public were generally very positive. The game sold well, and five DLC packs came out throughout 2009. It's worth noting that positive reception doesn't necessarily mean the game is good. This was also during a time when perception of Bethesda was really positive, too and you're less likely to see blemishes from something you like. This was partially the case for me. At the time, I was a huge Bethesda fan, and as recently as 2013, I've said that I actually prefer Fallout 3. It was only years later, when I took a deeper look at both Fallout 3 and New Vegas, as well as watching some detailed critiques of them, that I had realized that not only was New Vegas a lot better than I had realized, but Fallout 3 was also worse. Rather than having to wait another decade for the next Fallout game, in 2010 Fallout New Vegas came out, which was initially more negatively reviewed than Fallout 3, largely due to the fact that for many people, Fallout 10 via Stopped Working was the only quest available, and disappointingly it only had one solution. However, patches and DLC followed, and by the release of 2012's Ultimate Edition, the game was not only a lot more stable, it had also come to be fairly widely considered as a better game than Fallout 3, especially true among older Fallout fans. So we got two Fallout games, both generally well regarded with plenty of DLC, within a couple of years of each other, so I'm sure everybody went on to be really pleased that we got to enjoy two different games in a franchise we all love. I'm the Overseer's daughter, so what? That like, I get any kind of special Tell treatment. That didn't happen. Instead, something odd happened. It wasn't enough to simply enjoy New Vegas more than Fallout 3, like having a preference for the mechanical or narrative direction it took. No. For some people, if you liked New Vegas, you also had to dislike Fallout 3. You weren't a true Fallout fan unless you thought Fallout 3 was garbage, Bethesda were trash, and Todd Howard was your sworn nemesis. And that's not fair. So I want to examine Fallout 3, because Fallout 3 isn't just not bad, and it's not just good. Fallout 3, despite some issues we'll also be discussing, stands up alongside all the other games, and prepare your angriest comments now, because to my mind, in some ways, I think it's actually the best Fallout game of all. So already he's poisoning the well and being incredibly reductive about this discussion. Just about everyone knows of this at this point, but these games were made by two very different developers, and those developers very clearly had different design philosophies, resulting in two very different games. In an ideal world, this would have resulted in two really good games that were simply made differently. Unfortunately, that is not the case. I'm confident in saying that by the end of this video, I can not only prove that most of John's defenses don't stand up to scrutiny, but also that as far as the writing, plot, story, and world building goes, this game is a disaster. He's starting this off on the wrong foot by getting hostile with the people he's supposed to be trying to convince. I said this before in the Fallout 4 response and I'll say it here too. Statements like, prepare your best angriest comments now, will only predispose the people you're trying to convince against you, because you're acting as if the critics of Fallout 3 can't discuss things maturely. 
The blade cuts both ways, however, because this statement could just as easily be applied to massive fans of Fallout 3, who are also very critical of New Vegas. It should go without saying at this point that any fandom on the internet is going to have its zealots on all sides of the discussion. Why poison the discussion from the outset by focusing on an extreme minority and acting as if critics of Fallout 3 are unreasonable? Yes, he prefaces the statement that some people said you had to hate Fallout 3 if you love New Vegas. But that ends up being a really weak shield from criticism. He's going out of his way to draw attention to the minority of crazies that literally every fandom has, and acting as if much of the discourse on the game is due to them, and not more level-headed people discussing the quality of these games. Why waste your time on drawing attention to this trite? Is it because you don't think your arguments can stand up on their own? Here's the thing. You can point out the bad fans in any discussion, so your opposition looks unreliable or even crazy. Furthermore, why start off the video with a statement that seems designed to annoy people? The phrasing, to my mind, in some ways, I think it's actually the best Fallout game of all, is a really weird thing to say. What John is essentially saying here is that Fallout 3 does some things better than any of the other games. As a statement, I can't do much with it until it's qualified and references are provided, but the specific wording of the phrase makes it sound like he's saying it's the best Fallout game. But first, we need to dig a little into the criticism, because it's not entirely easy to get people to pin down exactly why they think Fallout 3 is bad. Now, I've spent a lot of time looking into this. I've watched feature-length videos and read forum posts the length of academic essays ahead of making this video. That's a bit of a strange comment. There's plenty of discussions and videos for why people think it's a bad game. There's plenty of arguments to support the claim. I realize John's video is apparently a response to H Bomber Guy's Fallout 3 video, but there's Mr. Caption's videos, there's the blistering stupidity of Fallout 3, and so forth. Point is, there's plenty of references for why people say Fallout 3 is bad. Hell, you just admitted yourself that you watched plenty of videos and read massive forum posts on it. Are you telling me that through all that, you couldn't figure out why? The problem is that it largely ends up being a death by a thousand cuts. Typically when something is bad, most of the casual criticism will revolve around a few really big or really obvious things. Stuff on the surface that is really noticeable. Jar Jar Binks is annoying, it makes no sense that Daenerys slaughtered women and children in Season 8 of Game of Thrones, and so forth. When you start getting into hours-long videos, though, they often go into far more detail and there's far more issues beneath the surface. This is the case with Fallout 3. There's a few big issues that most people focus on, the general lack of choice, super mutants on the East Coast, Brotherhood being out of character, and so forth, but that's really just the tip of the iceberg. Now, I know John is aware of many of these criticisms as he brings them up throughout his video, so it's really weird that he just says it's hard to pin down why people think it's bad, when there's plenty of reference for it. Now I've spent a lot of time looking into this. I've watched feature-length videos and read forum posts the length of academic essays ahead of making this video, and I think it's fair to say that one core idea keeps coming up. Fallout 3, contrary to what you might think from its title, isn't a proper Fallout game. Yes, just because it's titled Fallout doesn't mean it's a proper Fallout game. Much in the same manner that J.J. Abrams' Star Trek isn't proper Star Trek. Do I really need to explain this? The title means that it's officially part of the same series or intellectual property, but that does not necessarily mean that it's crafted with the same design philosophy or level of quality. The previous entries in the series set base expectations and standards for future works. It should be no surprise that Fallout 3, a game that entirely ignores many aspects of its predecessors, has had far more difficulty integrating itself into the series as a proper Fallout game. Just look at any terrible fan game as an example of this, like Hunt Down the Freeman. It might not be titled Half-Life, but it's a game that's very clearly supposed to be part of the Half-Life series. The obvious difference here is that Bethesda owns the IP and they can do anything they want with it, but when your design priorities have completely moved away from the original entries in the series, I think it's a fair criticism to say that it's not a proper Fallout game. 
In fact, I think the fan game comparison is pretty apt, as Todd Howard was a fan of Fallout, and that's why he won Bethesda to buy it. It's essentially a canon fan game, if we're going to be honest. Now just in case Fallout 3 was your first Fallout game, the original Fallout game is just Fallout 1 and 2 that is, as just about everyone has quietly agreed to pretend tactics and Brotherhood of Steel don't exist, were isometric, turn-based RPGs with a focus on open-ended exploration, quests with multiple solutions, and a sense of pitch-black humour. Now if that all sounds a bit similar to New Vegas to you, gold star, because plenty of folks who worked on the original Fallout ended up at Obsidian, where they did indeed make New Vegas. And those points are probably in fact a pretty good starting point for pinning down the issues people have with Fallout 3. Why not just refer to all the forum posts and videos you've watched? Why build this argument on the basis that people think Fallout 3 is bad because New Vegas came along and did just about everything much better? Here's the thing, Fallout 3's quality did not change due to New Vegas existing. All of the issues it has, it would have had regardless of New Vegas existing or not. New Vegas simply made it easier to see the issues as most newer fans had something to compare it to. If you eat bland, tasteless porridge all your life, and don't know any other kind of food, then one day you eat a steak, you have something to compare it to, and can more easily recognize why the porridge wasn't all that good. Next to the older Fallout and New Vegas, it isn't open-ended enough, its quests don't feature enough branching alternative approaches and solutions, and overall it doesn't facilitate role play and choice. And I think all of that's a very strange conclusion to come to about Fallout 3. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start, appropriately enough, at the beginning, and take a simple factual look at Fallout 3's opening and what that tells us about the game and its developers' intentions. Happy birthday! So welcome to Growing Up Fast, the first area and mini quest of Fallout 3. Technically it's the second as you do get to play as a baby, but as that's literally just character build and thus it's equivalent in Fallout 1 was a menu, let's omit that. No, there isn't really an equivalent in Fallout 1. All character building is done in the menu in Fallout 1. Special, tag skills, naming your character, and traits are all done in the menu. Fallout 3, on the other hand, stretches character build across the intro. In the baby section, all you do is pick your special. It would be more accurate to say that this extremely long intro accomplishes as much as Fallout 1 did in a menu. You see, the first area you play in when you get control can actually be very interesting, because what the devs choose to tutorialize first shows us what they think the core gameplay elements are. While the correlation may appear to exist, this is not necessarily true. He states this as though it's fact, and while many games do tutorialize their more important elements first, this isn't a rule set in stone. He's just saying this because it supports the arguments he's about to make. The thing is, some core gameplay elements are going to be a bit too complex to tutorialize immediately out of the gate. And others might have narrative reasons for not including those mechanics right away, too. Take Breath of Fire 3, for example, one of my all-time favorite games. It's a turn-based RPG, so much of the game's content will be fighting enemies in battle. While the first area does have mandatory combat encounters, you don't actually have much control in them, and they're not a proper representation of how combat will actually be through the rest of the game. To take another example, Morrowind doesn't really tutorialize anything. It gives you some equipment and throws you out into the world to do as you please. The starting town has options for just about every type of gameplay, which you can choose to do or entirely ignore. This ended up being the best introductory sequence Bethesda did compared to everything that came after, as each of the following games tried to force you through most types of gameplay, rather than letting the player engage as they please. It's like how in Mass Effect 1, it's actually quite slow to get to the gunplay. Instead, we start off by explaining scientific principles that underpin this world's technology, seeing that technology in action, meeting characters, engaging in conversation, learning about the universe, because the Mass Effect team understood that what makes Mass Effect work isn't the gunplay, it's the universe and the characters that live within it. So I'm a bit surprised that this needs to be said, but, uh, Lauren characters are not game mechanics, nor are they something that are tutorialized. So, 
back to Fallout 3, where it's your 10th birthday party and you have to deal with a bully trying to steal your sweet troll, and yes indeed, it's a recurring Bethesda joke dating back to 1994, but how it's handled here is very, very interesting. You see, in both Daggerfall and Morrowind, the same conundrum is asked, how to deal with bullies stealing your sweet troll, except the three options there are to throw the sweet roll as a distraction and then punch the bully, destroy it so he can't have it at all, or hand it over and then go and get friends to beat him up. But over in Fallout 3, that's all changed. Now, you can refuse to comply and when he attacks, run to get Officer Gomez's help, which is a fair approximation of gathering up your friends. So this is a pretty dishonest manipulation of the scenario given. When Butch attacks you, Officer Gomez jumps into action to save you regardless of what you do. Running to get him for help doesn't actually do anything. It's scripted that he ends the fight for you because it wouldn't end otherwise. It's so this kind of really dishonest framing of events in the game that really paints a picture of how he's going into this and why I feel a response was necessary. Ultimately, this is a small point he's making in the overall video, but much of the information he presents is handled in this way, where he's essentially looking to give the game extra credit, where he's overly generous in describing how things work to the benefit of Fallout 3. This will only get worse as the video progresses or you can spit on it so he doesn't want it, a fair approximation for the middle option, but option one is missing. You can't punch Butch. Violence is not an option yet. The first tutorial is about how you handle conversations and how to avoid or resolve conflict without fighting yourself. Is it though? It's pretty clear a couple of the options would anger Butch, where you insult his mother. That's literally asking for a fight from a kid. But more than that, how does this teach you to resolve conflicts without fighting yourself? There is no Officer Gomez in the rest of the game to end fights for you, and as explained, you don't actually run to him for help, he does it automatically. So what is this teaching us? That the game has dialogue options? That's really not a hard thing for people to understand. Now the mission does go on to tutorialize guns at the end, but the game interestingly didn't put it up first. We move forward in time to Future Imperfect, and dealing with Butcher there can be a combat tutorial, but again, it's the secondary option. Your choices are to stop Butch bullying Amata with a skill check, speech in this case, resolve by digging through other available information, by speaking to the other tunnel snakes, resolve it without violence by flipping sides and joining the faction you'd otherwise have to fight by joining in with the bullying, or finally, by violence. But getting to that requires a second confirmation. The game clearly flags it as a last resort. So in both cases, violence is there, but it's not the primary solution. That's not necessarily flagging combat as a last resort, but simply an option in a list of available options. You have to consider that some people are going to be rushing through the tutorial so they can get to the actual game. Some people are likely going to be button mashing through the dialogue to do so. As a result, having the top option being an immediate combat option simply isn't a good idea especially considering people might accidentally press the button too. It's better game design to have the player accidentally not get into a fight over accidentally getting into a fight they do not want. This is likely why there's also an additional confirmation too. This only appears to be a last resort if you overanalyze in an attempt to defend it from criticism. Now let's compare these opening rooms to other Fallout game openings. Fallout 1 puts you straight in a cave of rats. No discussions, no skill checks, no alternatives, just kill the rats or run past the rats if you don't feel like killing the rats. Yes, your point. The whole idea is that you're thrown out into the world to complete this highly important mission. What skill checks are there to have? Please don't send me? Then the game doesn't happen. Are you supposed to talk down the rats? What is the criticism here? Oh right, it's that developers tutorialize the most important gameplay elements first. Even though that's not a universal rule, and something John just invented to defend Fallout 3 from criticism and make the other games look worse, because Fallout 1 does combat first. What John is missing here is that back in the day, games came with manuals to teach players how to play the game. Tutorialization wasn't really needed, as players were expected to learn the game on their own with the manual. Needless to say, combat is a big part of these games. Teaching the player about dialogue or combat can be done in any order, and says nothing about what the developers think is most important to the game. 
Learning to fight in Fallout 1 is pretty important, due to how the game mechanics work. And a cave full of a bunch of low-level rats is an easy way to give the player time to familiarize themselves with how combat works. New Vegas, meanwhile, started you off with the Gecko Hunt. Sunny Smiles immediately tutorialized us shooting, iron sight aiming, crouching in order to shoot better, sneaking to get close to things that you want to shoot. The skill checks don't come into the game until quite a bit down the line. More of the false framing of the situation. This one is pretty egregious, though. So now that he's set up his claim that developers tutorialize the most important aspects first, he goes on to give this example about New Vegas teaching combat first, and saying skill checks don't come in until quite a bit down the line. Except that's total bullshit, and he knows it. There are no less than four skill checks available in Doc Mitchell's house before you leave it for the first time. After talking to Doc at the end of the opening, you could talk to him again for a speech or medicine check to ask for more stim packs. These can be missed fairly easy, as it requires talking to him again, but they are there. Now I won't hold that against John if he doesn't know about those. What I absolutely will hold against him, however, is the obvious repair and science skill checks with the broken submachine gun and the chem set respectively. Not only are these objects hard to miss, but I've got full-on actual proof that he knows about them. In April of 2016, he uploaded the first episode of his survival mode run of the Jay Sawyer Director's Cut mod, and in this episode, he goes to both the submachine gun and the cam set fully aware of what they are and what they do. You see, the first area you play in when you get control can actually be very interesting, because what the devs choose to tutorialize first shows us what they think the core gameplay elements are. And I believe I should have the skill to... Can I activate this? Yes, I can repair the 9mm machine gun. And let's chemistry set... Yes, let's make some stim packs, because I have science 25. Beautiful. Ooh, four stim packs homemade. That's interesting. What do those do? The skill checks don't come into the game until quite a bit down the line. Jesus Christ, I literally could not have asked for a better smoking gun. I hope what's happening here is plainly obvious to everyone watching. Feel free to call me rude all you want, but this is what happens when you prioritize defending something at all costs over actually looking at the facts. This was just over two entire years before he uploaded the Fallout 3 is better than you think video. He knows these skill checks were there, and he ignored them entirely for the sake of the narrative, for the sake of defending Fallout 3 from criticism and trying to make it look better, while trying to make the other games look worse for apparently prioritizing combat, which, again, isn't even a bad thing on its own. All based on the faulty premise that developers tutorialize the most important aspects first. And all of this is even before we consider all the skill checks and dialogue that New Vegas has, that Fallout 3 doesn't. There are a few skill checks in Fallout 3, but they're extremely rare, whereas New Vegas utilized them quite extensively. That alone shows the degree of focus the developers put on both making skills more useful and on dialogue in New Vegas. Now this is where I start getting a tiny bit confused, because the criticism I see over and over about Fallout 3 is there's no freedom, there's no choice, there are no skill check resolutions, there's no opportunity to roleplay. But Fallout 3's tutorial section seems to be trying to provide exactly that. Is that what the criticism is? I thought it was that there's not enough freedom, choice, skill checks, and so forth. There is a difference between none at all and not enough. You haven't really proven anything significant here either. You have a few rather basic choices in the first two encounters with Butch. Is that supposed to disprove the idea there's not enough choice? Even if the tutorial segment had a ton of choice, that absolutely does not make up for the rest of the game generally lacking in significant choice or meaningful choices. Also, where are the skill checks in the tutorial? What freedom do you have? It should go without saying that this tutorial section is highly limited. And it gets even better in Escape, which contains some really interesting and pretty unique ideas. 
For example, at the start of Escape, Amata offers you a gun. You can decline it and insist that she keeps it, which goes on to have consequences down the line, not just for you, but for her in the interrogation scene, where she'd normally need to be rescued, but doesn't if she can shoot the guard herself. And that just strikes me as a really lovely story touch. And I tried to think of another example of it anywhere in the entire Fallout franchise, where if you decline a reward or a gift, the game reflects that by showing the character going on to utilize what you yourself declined, and I genuinely can't think of one. That is a cool idea. It's too bad it was relegated to a tutorial sequence and not used anywhere else in the game. Genuinely, I'd love to see more of this type of thing. That the world accounts for what items and equipment characters have available to them, and utilizing them in situations where they'd be useful. And I don't mean the current system, where NPCs will run to the nearest weapon in the world space, pick it up, and attack. I mean actual checks in the background, for characters in the world to see what they have available and putting them in situations where they could use them. Also, this is a minor point, but Amada doesn't need to be saved. John even acknowledges this shortly when he references sneaking by. And then Butch shows up and asks you to save his mother from rad roaches because he's scared of them. Sure, you can refuse because he bullied you or jump in and save her, but the really interesting option is the speech check where you can persuade him to save her by arming him with your old BB gun. Because he's just run up to you and tried to give you a quest to do, and your response is to empower him to complete the quest by himself. You can go and help or watch after that, but you don't have to. You can just run off. You've just persuaded an NPC to sort out their own mess. Again, I tried to think of another example of this anywhere in Fallout, and I couldn't think of one. New Vegas' first proper quest, Ghost Town Gunfight, is somewhat similar, as you can ensure the town is armed and well armoured, but even then, the quest remains centred around you. The fight doesn't trigger until you're there to trigger it, even though you can choose to sit it out subsequently. Butch, once he gets the weapon, runs off to sort out the problem by himself, and that is really rather interesting and unique. Again, something that's only done in the tutorial, and nowhere else. This one at least is a bit more understandable why it might not appear outside this example. The setup here is actually incredibly contrived. As Butch's mother has an extremely high amount of health, this is so she'll survive the rad roaches longer than just about anyone else would. If she had normal health levels, she'd likely die before Butch even managed to reach you. The reason this doesn't happen anywhere else in the game is likely because facilitating these kinds of encounters would either lead to NPCs getting killed or NPCs being given godly amounts of health and other stats to prevent them from dying. The escape itself has plenty of options too. The overseer's door can be opened with a lockpick skill, or you can steal the key from his bedroom, or you can threaten to badly hurt a martyr if he doesn't comply and give you access. Beyond that, there's a science shit you can skip if you choose to thoroughly search the rooms as well. Fallout 3's message here is clear. Explore thoroughly and you'll find alternative solutions, which, again, seems to be exactly what people claim that they want out of a Fallout game. It really bugs me how he gives some loose examples of choice and throws it in the face of critics as if they're stupid for not realizing these options are there. When in reality, the complaint isn't that there's absolutely no choice whatsoever, the complaint is that there isn't enough choice overall. He would go on to do this far worse in his Fallout 4 is better than you think video in 2020, over two years after this Fallout 3 defense video was released, where he gives examples of perks, and runs that straight into a snide comment about people wanting choice and consequence, showing he fundamentally misunderstands what the criticism is. How about your faithful canine companion? Up to this point, there's been literally one perk in the entire franchise for the dog. In Fallout 3, to make him respawn, because people were sad he kept dying. But in Fallout 4, you can power up dog meat to give him new moves and make him cause bleed or limb damage. Fallout 4 gives you a lot of options for how you want to specialise. I mean, this is what we've always said we want from RPGs, right? Difficult choices that lead to meaningful consequences. Thing is, this is a tutorial section. If you got locked out of hacking the terminal, or if you ran out of lockpicks and there was no key or terminal password, you'd be soft-locked and unable to progress. It's basic game design that you would avoid soft-locking your player, and plenty of games go to extreme lengths to avoid this. Point is, if these options existing in the tutorial do not make up for the rest of the game generally lacking them. While there are absolutely instances where exploring will help you find keys and passwords, there's also instances 
where said key or password is in plain sight of the thing they unlock, such as the password for Dr. Lesko's computer during the quest, THOSE. But even more than that, this isn't even the kind of choice people are referring to. Having options in navigating the world and accessing parts of it is not the same kind of choice as solving conflicts or disputes between various groups. Having these options are good because they help support more unique character builds and allow general freedom for the player, but to point out a key or terminal password are meaningful choices is a ridiculous misunderstanding of what choice and consequence means in these games. I'm gonna have to say this a lot, but the complaint about choice is down to having different outcomes and may be a lasting impact on the world. The terminal password and door key, or hacking and lockpicking them, are gameplay choices, but they all lead to the exact same outcome. Now, some people also seem annoyed that you can't talk down the very first guard that attacks you at the start, but you can very easily run away from him. He's distracted by the rad roaches. In fact, I kind of always assumed that's why the rad roaches are there, because he never seems to die to them, so it's just a good opportunity to run if you want to be more of a pacifist. Except, the problem is deeper than that. First of all, simply running away isn't a special choice of any kind when we're talking about an open world game. It is part of the basic design of how the world works that in most instances, you would have the option of simply running away. Narratively, this scenario makes little sense. The Overseer sends its guards to arrest you for interrogation, which I guess naturally means they're out to kill you. Yeah, this logic doesn't quite follow. The game mentions that one of the guards got overzealous and ended up killing Jonas, but that shouldn't automatically turn them all to psychopathic murderers. Even when you rescue Amada, the guard turns hostile and immediately tries to kill you, and the overseer, who apparently only wanted to ask you some questions, makes no attempt to get him to stop. Furthermore, these guards are people your character has essentially lived with and seen daily for all of your life. 19 years! It seems more than a bit strange that, despite knowing you for all your life, that a switch is just flipped, and the default response to you is attempting to murder you without even the possibility to speak at all. Bethesda clearly won an action-packed escape from the vault, but couldn't do it organically, so they had to contrive it. The only guard that isn't hostile is the one you met at your birthday. The rest of them are just two-dimensional cartoon goons that are treated no differently than common enemies you encounter throughout the game. In fact, it's actually incredibly easy to escape the vault without killing. Using the rad roaches as a distraction, the first guard loses you immediately. You can avoid the guards in the atrium corridor incredibly easily. There's even a specially recorded dialogue option for a master to say if you sneak past her interrogation and don't intervene. So the game's fully aware that this could be an option. I didn't think I would make it. My, my, my father, he, I, my officer Mac, I, I didn't tell them anything, I swear. When the warning sirens came on, they all ran out. I, I guess that was you? And I honestly don't understand how people look at that and think that doesn't feel like a Fallout game in the style of the original game. As mentioned earlier, John said Amada would need to be rescued, but here he proves that isn't the case. She is freed regardless of whether you save her or not. Also, it should be pretty easy to escape. This is a tutorial level. It's much more difficult to be a pacifist later on in the game when you're required to kill super mutants for the scientists to enter Project Purity. I've seen people argue that you can still be a pacifist there, as you can just use a companion to kill the super mutants. But, realistically, that wouldn't really wash your hands of guilt. As for the comment about this not feeling like a Fallout game, having some options here and there does not make up for the fact they're lacking elsewhere. This isn't a points game, where every positive point negates a negative point, when the criticism is that there isn't enough choice. Pointing at a few choices here and there does not render the criticism invalid. We all know there's choice in Fallout 3. The issue is that there's not enough choice. At every stage, you can solve things with skill checks if you prioritize the right skills, and if you haven't, you can search the area to find alternative ways through, you can blast your way through if you want, you can complete the whole area as a pacifist, I honestly don't know what more people want. You cannot use skills at every stage. There are no skill checks in the birthday sequence or the goat test sequence. In fact, in my Fallout 3 analysis video, 
I argue that Fallout 3's character creation should have just been a menu, like in Fallout 1 and 2. So you pick your tag skills before you spend any time in the vault, as this would lead to interactions in the vault that acknowledge your tag skills and having those skill check options. For example, in the game, as it is, Amada's gift is a comic book that increases your melee skill, and Butch trying to take your sweet roll only has basic options, no skill checks of any kind. If you had chosen tag skills at the very start of the game, a neat little way for the game to acknowledge this is by Amato's gift being based on one of your tag skills. The game responds directly to your character build, rather than giving a skill book that will be entirely worthless for many players. If science is one of your tag skills, there could be a chance to get a big book of science from her, and she could make a playful comment about your character being a nerd or something. As for Butch, there's potential for skill checks here too, had Bethesda thought to do things this way. For example, if unarmed is one of your tag skills, you could threaten to beat him up instead. Or maybe a barter skill check where you have a chance to convince him to make a deal instead. Also, again, you keep banging on about not knowing what people want, yet you're still in the tutorial. It's the game at large that matters. If this intro had all the possible choice in the world, and the rest of the game didn't, the available choices in the intro would not make up for the lack of choice in the rest of the game. I've also seen the complaint that people dislike how you start in the vault, as Fallout's supposed to be a big open game, so the restrictive corridors of Vault 101 start things off with the wrong ethos, but that's kind of the entire point. You start the game in a tiny, cramped, dark environment because it makes the wasteland feel so much bigger when you get there. I think the complaint is more about the length. Starting with Oblivion, Bethesda decided the best way to start their games was an overly long introductory sequence that basically forces you through every type of gameplay available. There's also very little to do in these segments as you're mostly on rails, aside from a few small changes here and there, so most people don't want to go through them again. Starting off in a small cramped environment doesn't really make the world feel any bigger either. Morrowind had a pretty quick starting sequence before you were thrown out into the world, and its world felt huge. Ultimately, the world of Fallout 3 feels... about the same as any other Bethesda game. They're huge, full of plenty of dungeons and NPCs, and... stuff. Morrowind and New Vegas handled their openings best. They got character creation out of the way, and set you free into the world to do as you please, with a starting town that offers just about every kind of gameplay available, and a few quests. I think the developers at Bethesda back during the development of Morrowind, as well as the developers at Obsidian on New Vegas, understood that a long, drawn-out introductory sequence, especially in an open-world game, acts as one hell of a speed bump for anyone who just wants to get in and explore the world. Once you step out of the census office and Doc Mitchell's house, you're not obligated to do anything, it's total freedom. Oblivion, meanwhile, feels the need to stop you every 30 seconds to explain its functions, and for Captain Picard to talk about how he's going to die. Fallout 3 feels the need to fill out your character's entire backstory for you, and introduce you to a whole bunch of characters that end up not being all that important. Skyrim, in similar fashion to Oblivion, repeatedly stops you to do all the tutorial stuff in an overly long and unnecessary dungeon. Finally, it's Fallout 4 that spends fucking forever with two plot devices, one of which is killed five minutes into the game, and the other is kidnapped for a stupid twist. None of this shit is necessary, aside from the narrative and oblivion of your character being a key figure in the Emperor's premonitions of the future. It ends up feeling like an overly curated experience. Now obviously, I can't objectively prove that these starting sequences are bad, however I can prove that there's a general distaste for them among people who play these games. In H Bomber Guy's video, he points out that an alternate start mod is a highly popular mod for Fallout 3. Additionally, these kinds of mods exist for Oblivion, Skyrim, and Fallout 4 as well, and they're highly popular on the Nexus. Ultimately, the only thing that matters in the vault is if you kill the Overseer or not. None of the other choices really impact anything significant. The sweet roll with Butch, Amada being bullied, it ends up being an illusion of choice more than anything, which is even worse than no choice at all, because at least with no choice, you know what you're getting. With the illusion of choice, 
The game is flagging that there are options, but when all paths lead to the same destination with no change or consequence, the act of choosing becomes entirely meaningless. It's super neato that you can let Amada keep her gun and give Butch your BB gun, but the outcomes they lead to are rather small. Amada kills a guard to escape, and Butch saves his mom, and whether these two characters survive or die doesn't impact anything either. Now I know what one of the responses to this will be in advance, since I've already gotten them in the original video. Why are you expecting any kind of significant impact from the tutorial sequence? Well, I'm not, really. Remember, this is a response video. John is spending a significant amount of time hyping up these choices as being really significant and important, to the point he seems to think this is already good enough and says he doesn't actually know what more people could want. What it comes across as, to me, is that he saw some choices in the intro and thought that that should be enough to please critics who complain about a lack of choice. So it seems as though they're complaining about nothing. Now this really shouldn't have to be explained, but the point of having choices is for there to be significant consequences as a result. Characters and the world change due to your actions. Necropolis dying out or surviving. Gecko power plant being shut down or blown up and further contaminating the water. Or optimized. How you handle the quest solving the murder of Richard Wright leading to numerous different outcomes for New Reno, dealing with Boone as a companion, and how his life has changed due to your actions. Now obviously I don't think anything in the vault will necessarily have consequences as significant as those examples, but there should be consequences beyond nothing at all. New Vegas's tutorial area, Good Springs, did have its own ending slide that was dependent on how you handled the first quest. While the choice between the Powder Gangers and Good Springs is almost completely black and white, there is still an impact made, depending on which side was chosen. And Fallout 3's post-vault introduction is truly spectacular, one of the finest moments in gaming to my mind. Just so much of it's perfect, the white flash as your eyes adjust to the outside world for the first time, the wasteland spreading out in front of you, the orientation of the vault and its elevation so that the Capitol building and the Washington Monument are both silhouetted in the distance. It's just such a perfect moment that both New Vegas and Fallout 4 straight up copied it, but neither executed it quite as well. One of the finest moments in gaming? It's a nice moment for sure, but I don't think it's so significant as to call it one of the finest moments in gaming. That just seems a bit hyperbolic for what's essentially just a fade-in effect to simulate being blinded by seeing outside light for the first time, as well as seeing the destroyed ruins of the old world. It's also a really bold claim to say that New Vegas and Fallout 4 just copied it, and it comes across as though he's only looking at the surface level elements here. In all three games, you step outside and are blinded by the light for a brief moment. It's only natural if you're inside and in the dark for a long period of time that when you step outside and see the sunlight, it's going to be blinding for a brief moment. So it makes total sense in both New Vegas and Fallout 4 that this would happen as well. In New Vegas, you were inside a doctor's office for what I believe is an indeterminate amount of time, and in Fallout 4, you're frozen in a vault for 210 years. To say it's outright copied is a bit absurd, because that's not necessarily going to be the case between two very similar things. Maybe Obsidian and Bethesda both thought it out logically and concluded that it makes sense for the Courier and the sole survivor to both be blinded by the light when stepping outside. This also further dilutes John's plate when you think about it a little more than not at all. If New Vegas was trying to copy stepping out of Vault 101 for the first time, wouldn't Doc Mitchell's host be positioned so you see New Vegas in the distance, instead of the starting town, which we don't have much reason to visit after we leave it? The reality of the situation is that this isn't even something Fallout 3 invented. 
This effect is based on a very real thing that happens to people. It's a long-standing trope that this happens to characters for exactly the same reason in various entertainment media. This is something that Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild does too. So does that mean it straight up copied Fallout 3 as well? Well, this is something that Shawshank Redemption did in 1994. So does that mean Fallout 3 copied it from there? So we've got to the main game and we're in the wasteland. So let's quickly talk a bit about that. You see, one of the really bold things about Fallout 3 is that it put Vault 101 pretty much in the middle of the map and let you decide to start running in any direction you want to. This is exactly what Fallout 1 let you do on leaving the vault as well, but for whatever reason, Fallout 3 never really seems to get credit for that. How is that bold and why is this a thing Fallout 3 deserves credit for? Which is odd because it's pretty much the most open Fallout game at the start. Consider New Vegas, with a solid wall to the west and Cazadors in a narrow canyon to the north, who may as well be a brick wall to level 1 characters. Fallout 4, meanwhile, opens in the very northwest corner of the map, severely limiting your options, though it is at least perfectly happy for you to head over open ground to the east or the south. So this seems to be another issue he's inventing out of thin air to try and prop Fallout 3 up. There's nothing particularly special about starting in the middle of the map when you're in an open world game, and you're free to go just about anywhere right away. Even starting in the corner of the map in Fallout 4 isn't an issue for this reason. That doesn't make the world any less open, it just means you start closer to one of the impassable borders that exist in all of these games. His example for New Vegas isn't entirely accurate either. The Cazadors can be passed by level 1 players. I realize this is anecdotal, but my very first time playing New Vegas, I went north and managed to get by them with little issue. And obviously at that time, I had zero experience in dealing with this new enemy type. But don't rely on my word alone for it. A friend, Father Elijah Cole, is in the process of making his own response to John's video here, and in his own video, he proves that it's entirely possible to not just bypass them by simply running, or even by sneaking, but also that they can be disabled and killed at level 1. Check them out! Even Fallout 1's Vault 13 was at the northern extreme of the map, with nothing to find further north at all. And? Your point is? Again, it's a faulty premise that any of these games are more or less free depending on where you start. It's also amazing you'd contradict yourself within moments. You see, one of the really bold things about Fallout 3 is that it put Vault 101 pretty much in the middle of the map and let you decide to start running in any direction you want to. This is exactly what Fallout 1 let you do on leaving the vault as well. Even Fallout 1's Vault 13 was at the northern extreme of the map with nothing to find further north at all. Fact is, all of these games let you run in any direction from the start. One game having more directions doesn't mean it's any more free than the others. The same thing happened with Morrowind and Oblivion, too. Morrowind started you at the very southern end of the map, and you immediately have access to the entire island. Oblivion started you just outside the Imperial City, and you have immediate access to all Cyrodiil. Total freedom to explore is total freedom to explore, regardless of where you start. The idea that starting in the middle of the map allows more freedom is totally asinine and baseless. The next part of his video I'll be skipping because it's not anything that really needs any kind of responding to. John basically describes how you can skip part of the game in Fallout 1, 3, and New Vegas. After that he describes in extensive detail how the game directs you to Megaton fairly well through the world design. It's a point I agree with, but I'm cutting it for time, as it's a fairly large section, to which my only real response is that I agree. I can't really add much to it. However, there are a couple comments he makes in that section that I am clipping to respond to. If anyone wants full context, you can just go to his video for it. Instead, most players want to find their way to Megaton, and I want to examine this initial journey in detail as it really demonstrates the level of care and craftsmanship that goes into Fallout 3's world design. While I do agree that leading the player to Megaton through world design is handled well, I have to heavily disagree with the praise for the level of care and craftsmanship that goes into the world design. I can't go too in-depth on that right this second, but I will absolutely refer back to this line throughout the video, as I continue to respond to his arguments. Another line I'll be referring back to is this one. And once you get to Springvale, you see the eye bolt in the distance. It might seem a bit random at the moment, but I'm setting something up for later. 
because this line becomes extremely relevant much later in the video. Now I love Megaton, and that's partly because it has great visual design, because it's easier to get attached to a place if it's visually distinct. For example, I'm pretty sure I know where everybody lives in Megaton and in Rivet City, but in New Vegas there's Good Springs, which has a much smaller population, it was only years and multiple playthroughs later that I learned Easy Pete sleeps in the long three-room house in the middle of town. I always just assumed that was player housing. I actually can't remember off the top of my head where Trudy sleeps now I think about it. Megaton is visually distinct, and totally nonsensical. Again, this is something that will have to wait just a bit longer for me to go in depth on, but what is worth responding to here is everything else. The comment about knowing where everyone lives seems a tad bit anecdotal. The general layout of Megaton is fairly well done, and I think I know where everyone lives too. However, I don't know where anyone lives in Rivet City. This isn't meant to be a debunking of his argument either. It's simply pointing out that how well someone remembers where all the NPCs live will vary from person to person. Visual design does certainly help with that, but Megaton could also have been designed in a way that makes more sense with the world and still have a distinct layout so most people know where everything is. More than that, however, why do you need to know where Easy Pete or Trudy sleeps? I'd say it's important that these characters have a place to sleep from a world design perspective, but it doesn't seem like something the player actually needs to know. I've also played New Vegas for years, and I've never needed to know where Trudy sleeps, or Easy Pete, or Billy Creel, or Jericho, or Lucy West. It's also really strange to just assume the homes in Good Springs are player housing, like, as far as I know, no one refers to any of these houses as something you can just have and keep for yourself. And I think part of that is Good Springs is just a town made up of a group of houses, and it's hard to be interested in the comings and goings of the townsfolk when they're just walking from one building to another, as opposed to unique salvage vehicles clinging to the side of a bomb crater. Why does that make it any harder to be interested in the comings and goings of random NPCs regardless? Aside from quest NPCs and lore dump NPCs, most of them exist just to fill up the world. Again, this is entirely subjective, but I never cared about the comings or goings of Billy Creel, because aside from talking to him for the first time, and exhausting all of his dialogue options, there's nothing for him to do, and he holds no relevance in the world. He's not involved in any quests, he doesn't ever need to defend the town from any attacks, he doesn't hunt for food for the town, he doesn't trade anything. As a result, the coming and going of Billy Creel is nothing more than an NPC wandering through town, doing nothing in particular on an infinite loop. By the way, this isn't actually a criticism against the game. New Vegas does this too, as does Oblivion and Skyrim. NPCs wandering around in their day-to-day -day is meant to fill up the world and make it seem like people actually live there. The point is, John is trying to make it sound like Megaton having a distinctive design makes these characters more interesting as a result. In both cases, it's just NPCs walking from one building to another. Speaking of that, some people really bloody hate the bomb, by the way, because it's odd to build a town around a bomb. Odd is the understatement of the fucking millennium. It is not odd to build a town around a nuke. It's downright fucking stupid. I should hope this wouldn't need to be explained, but I'm not sure a word exists in any known language to properly describe the level of stupidity needed to build a town around something that can destroy that town and everyone living in it in an instant. I literally cannot come up with a hyperbolic or extreme example of something more stupid because this is the limit. If that thing goes off, they're all dead. End of story. Bombs that were dropped in World War II are still being found, and they're extremely fucking dangerous, because they can still go off and be just as deadly as they were 80 years ago. At the time of writing this part of the script, I checked for recent news stories of World War II bombs being discovered, and there was one not even two months ago that was found, which prompted a military response and a controlled detonation which resulted in thousands of residents being evacuated, extensive property damage, 
and a crater the size of three double-decker buses. It never bothered me though, because I always thought there was a fairly sensible reason for it. Actually, there isn't. The game tries to justify it, but fails utterly, and only makes this whole scenario somehow even more stupid. As Mania describes it, a plane crashed in that location, creating the crater. Now already, this is a bit too much, as a plane wouldn't create a crater that deep. We're talking literal tons of soil being displaced as a result. This is one of the only times I'll refer to John's Reddit response to the original video. He dismissed this criticism as a nitpick. However, he uses this crater as a major part of his defense for Megaton. So applying consistent logic to the crater existing is a nitpick, but using it as a defense for something that makes no sense is totally fine? Yeah, I'm totally sure we'll be getting consistent standards from John. Which is hilarious considering his biggest gripe in the Fallout 3 vs New Vegas debate is inconsistent standards. Anyways, this plane was carrying the bomb that sits in the middle of town. A bit odd that the bomb is placed in such a way that it looks like it was dropped, rather than being placed there. Anyways, people who weren't allowed into the vault took shelter in the crater from the dust storms of the time. Keep that in mind for later, I'm not done with it yet. These dust storms eventually died down, but people kept coming back to the crater as a meeting place. Literally no idea why they wouldn't pick somewhere safer when there's a town literally 20 feet away, including a school they could have taken shelter in. See how fast this shit is falling apart? Eventually, they decided to settle there. Again, no idea why they wouldn't pick somewhere safer, the entire world is literally free real estate right now. Why not build around something that could destroy you in an instant? They scrapped the plane for parts, and they decided to go to an airport a few miles away to scrap it for parts too. And they spent months dragging all the metal from the airport to the location of Megaton to build the town. No, I did not misspeak. Most of the material used to build the town was already in one location, and they spent literal months dragging it across a dangerous wasteland to build around a bomb that could wipe them all out in an instant. The excuse for this was that the Children of Adam had already formed by that point, and they couldn't have done it without their help. Which is a cheap cop-out excuse, because if they had just settled at the airport instead, they could have spent those many months simply transporting the materials to instead build their town at the airport, which should have already had buildings, with the airport terminal and the hangars. Here's the thing, if you're going to build a town, you're going to want it either in a strategic location, such as on a hill, for the sake of defense, or near an important resource. Megaton has neither, and as I'll explain shortly, it gets far worse than it already is. Also, another note, the airport doesn't actually exist in-game. Mania says the whole place was scrapped, to the point you wouldn't even know where it is. Which I suppose means that even the concrete buildings and asphalt runways were also completely scrapped. How convenient. Additionally, John was just talking about how he knew where everyone in Megaton lived, yet he doesn't know the town's history from Mania? You see, there's an old video from about five years ago that discusses Fallout 3 in New Vegas called The Shandification of Fallout, which basically discusses how games work better if their basic logistics have been thought through, and it's obvious how basic human needs are being met. So in the case of Megaton, the city has food because the one upside of the apocalypse is that wildlife is massive now, and there are plenty of mole rats right by the side of the town. It's false. No way. Not this time. We created it. Not this time. No. Not this time. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. It's fiction. It's fiction. We made it up. We made this one up. It's a made-up tale. It's a total fabrication. It never happened. This is 100% false. It's fictitious. It's a total fabrication. It's made up. It does not align with reality. And it is something John absolutely, positively, 100% invented solely for the sake of defending this game from justified and accurate criticism. Not only am I going to thoroughly prove it, 
but I'm going to use John's own video clip and the context behind it to help prove my point. First and foremost, there is absolutely nothing whatsoever in the entire game that references mole rats being a food source for Megaton, and there's nothing to support John's claim here. No one in town hunts them, no one in town herds them, there isn't even a scrap of mole rat meat in Megaton as far as I've been able to find. When I said this was a pure fabrication, I wasn't exaggerating. John literally just saw that there were three entire mole rats behind the town, and concluded that they absolutely must be the town's food source based on that alone. Also, if these three mole rats are a food source, then what happens after you kill and eat them? No more food, I guess. But wait! There's more! So that already completely disproves this claim. It is 100% absolutely invalid. But not only is it invalid, the game actually proves the opposite to be true. And I know he knows this because he used the clip during the Wasteland Survival Guide quest. Moira never once refers to the mole rats as being any kind of food source. She in fact refers to them as a nuisance, a pest that causes trouble for the locals. And furthermore, she doesn't want to kill them. She sends you out to test a repellent, something to make them go away. She does briefly mention the idea of maybe domesticating them, for milk and meat, but that's just an idea she has, and nothing more. The very fact that she of all characters is presenting this idea too, it's probably meant to be taken as a joke, because she's a stupid character who commonly says stupid things. To put another nail in this coffin, the part of the quest where she does want you to find food she sends you to a pre-war grocery store, essentially to scavenge 200 year own ruins that should have been picked clean by now, not to mention the food going bad. The only reason you do find food is because it's being used as a raider base, which she was not anticipating, as she's surprised to find out that there are raiders there. So not only is there nothing in the game to support John's claim that mole rats are food, not only are you sent to scavenge food from a store for the survival guide, but when it comes to repelling and killing mole rats, Moira's main concern is them being a pest. Killing them is undesirable, and domesticating them is only a theory she has. There's likely only two reasons these mole rats exist behind Megaton. Firstly, for Moira's quest, and secondly, be a small challenge for anyone going to the hollowed out rock. Yes, the mole rats aren't actually a challenge to fight, but it's actually an aspect of game design to have enemies guarding loot, and it's extremely doubtful their proximity to the hollowed out rock is pure coincidence. Furthermore, most hunter-gatherer societies in ancient times didn't have a fixed settlement. They moved around because animals migrate and naturally growing food gets depleted as you eat it. If Megaton hunted the already fairly rare wildlife for their food, they would soon run out of animals, so this wouldn't be sustainable. But I'm going to go another level deeper on this to further disprove this point. At the start of the video, John said he had watched numerous feature-length videos and read massive forum posts, so I find it a tad bit strange he doesn't reference Mr. Caption's video here. Maybe he didn't see it. It's entirely possible. Mr. Caption did delete his channel around the end of 2017 or the beginning of 2018. I'm not entirely sure when it was. Point is, his videos were up for a few years, and they were re-uploaded in March of 2018, a couple months before John released his video. So, maybe he did miss it. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt here. However, in Mr. Caption's video, he raises a very good point. All the plant life in the Capital Wasteland is dead. Everything outside of Oasis, that is, which is a recent development and hardly anyone knows about, so for the remainder of this section I'll be omitting Oasis. Now I want to bring back this line for a moment. And I want to examine this initial journey in detail as it really demonstrates the level of care and craftsmanship that goes into Fallout 3's world design. Yeah, the world design for Fallout 3 is broken on nearly every level. This is going to be a rather large tangent, 
but it's necessary in order to fully debunk John's point beyond a shadow of a doubt, and additionally, preemptively debunk responses in the comments. As the response to the mole rats as a food source is the one point I made in the original video that saw the biggest pushback from people who defend Fallout 3 or John. Furthermore, this will be greater support for my arguments and points later on regarding aspects of the world building, so let's get to it. All of the plant life in the capital wasteland is dead. They're either burned trees or dead grass. There's no fruits or vegetables growing. There's no mutated plants growing. Everything is dead. If there are no plants, all the herbivores are dead. If there are no herbivores, then the carnivores have nothing to eat besides each other, which is not sustainable. The defenses for this particular point in the comments have been nothing short of absurd. Some people have claimed it doesn't matter, which isn't even an argument. Some people have claimed that the plants are totally alive, they just don't look like it, which isn't even worthy of response. And one guy pointed out that there's three living flowers in Arlington Cemetery, which I didn't even bother to confirm, because even if he was right, they're three fucking flowers, and not anything anyone could sustain themselves on. For all intents and purposes, the entire world of Fallout 3 is broken. Because Bethesda didn't take the time to make their world make any kind of sense at nearly every level. The Capital Wasteland, as it is presented to us, is utterly incapable of supporting life. From what I've seen in the comments, most people who defend this game have trouble coming to terms with this fact. And in response, I've seen outright denial or shifting of the goalposts, which basically results in them falling back to a few other arguments. Megaton gets its food from hunters and traders. Except, this isn't fully supported either. The hunters are a random encounter in the wasteland, and as far as I know, they don't actually go to Megaton at all. Similarly to John assuming that mole rats are food for Megaton because they're close by, the people who make this argument assume that the hunters supply Megaton simply because they exist. I've encountered them numerous times, and as best as I can remember, not once did they mention Megaton. Also, it should go without saying, but if the animals literally can't exist because plants don't exist, then there would be nothing for the hunters to hunt as a result. The only reason there's actually any animals in the Capital Wasteland is because it's a game that doesn't rely on consistent rules or world building to function. Which, by the way, is another argument I've seen. There's animals in the world, so clearly they eat something. This is nothing more than a cop-out defense from someone who can't actually prove their points, because they refuse to accept they've been checkmated. If you cannot prove your point, you have no ground to stand on and your argument is dismissed. Next up are the traders, which all come from Canterbury Commons. If the traders are going to supply the rest of the wasteland with food, surely they must have a food source of their own, right? Well, Canterbury certainly isn't growing any crops. They do have a few Brahmin in a pen off to the side. This is a potential food source, but it's still a bit iffy, because the people of Canterbury use Brahmin as pack animals for their traders. Even if these Brahmin were a food source, Canterbury cannot support the whole of the Capital Wasteland on their own. A response I've received to this point is that Canterbury is totally growing food. We just can't see it because it's not modeled into the game. That which can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. If your source is, trust me bro, it's legit, you do not have anything to support your argument. Another argument is that trade must be coming into the Capital Wasteland from outside of it, which is nothing more than another baseless claim with no evidence. Onward and upward to the next point. Hardly any settlements in Fallout 3 is herding animals, and none are growing crops. Arafu has three Brahmin, which seem to exist solely to be a point of contention with the family in Blood Ties. Republic of Dave has two Brahmin. Temple of the Union has a single Brahmin, which is used as a pack animal. Paradise Falls has one Brahmin. Tenpenny Tower has... nothing. Big Town has... nothing. Lamplight has... cave mold, 
which doesn't strike me as sustainable for growing children. Andale are cannibals, which rely on other people existing to be their food. But because there is no sustainable food in the wasteland, everyone is dead, and as a result, the people of Andale have no food. Rivet City is the big, go-to defense for the food point. Typically, most people will claim that they eat Mirelurk. Problem is, we receive conflicting information on this. Characters in the game will outright tell us that Mirelurks are actually really good to eat. However, there's a terminal log in Rivet City that points out that every so often, someone tries to eat a fish that washes up on shore and dies as a result. So fish are deadly, but Mirelurk are fine? But then Broken Steel shows us that Mirelurks actually die when in purified water. They need radioactive water to survive, so... which is it? I suppose it might be possible that Mirelurk both absolutely require irradiated water in order to survive, and provide meat that isn't deadly to those who eat it. But it could also just be a massive contradiction on Bethesda's part. It wouldn't be the first time, and I wouldn't put anything past them at this point. Even if they were a viable food source, the problem then becomes the fact they're extremely dangerous and hard to kill, due to their hard shells, with their faces being specifically highlighted as a weak point. The counter to this is that Rivet City is a warship and should be full of ammo. It's sad that this needs to be explained, but ammo is a finite resource. Bullets and power cells do not grow on trees. They don't spawn out of the ether on a ship because it was used for war. These things need to be manufactured or scavenged, and there's only so much scavenging you can do until you run out. The people of the Capital Wasteland seem to subsist solely off of scavenging, which likely isn't going to be sustainable for 200 years. Finally, is Rivet City's Hydroponics Lab, which the game has a lot of mixed messaging about. So if you go into the lab, you see some fresh fruits and vegetables on a table. This is the only example of them in the entire game, with two small exceptions. One of them is in a bathroom in Arlington Library, and the other is in Pinkerton's lab, and these two exceptions seem a bit... random. The fact that the only real place the fresh food items can be found are in the labs implies this is experimental and not something sustainable. And the only lines I could find from the scientists in Rivet City about the fresh fruits and vegetables is that they're worth more than you know and that they're fragile. If they truly could produce fresh fruit and vegetables, this should be a revolutionary change upon the Wasteland, and be a major interest for just about everyone in the Capital Wasteland. However, Bannon's terminal logs state that they export these food items, which doesn't make sense considering we never actually see these food items anywhere else. They're not sold anywhere, no one is talking about them, and everyone seems perfectly content to eat squirrel stew in 200-year-old steak. Because the game fails to account for these food items existing, being exported and sold, while at the same time claiming they are, I cannot take it as a food source. The game says one thing and shows another. Someone argued this with me extensively, and threw a temper tantrum in the comments that I wouldn't accept this as being enough proof for the hydroponics lab being a food source when the game very clearly fails to show it actually being used as a food source. Now if all that wasn't bad enough, I've got a card up my sleeve that makes all of this exponentially worse. The Enclave. The guys who are all about their genetic purity. The people who wanted to exterminate all of the contaminated and mutated people and creatures of the wasteland have no proper fresh food source as well. In Raven Rock, in their kitchen, is 200-year-old irradiated food. I guess they just took a page out of Mara's book before she even wrote it. And they just scavenge all their food from pre-war grocery stores, too. This is beyond fucking retarded. What the fuck are you doing, Bethesda? I really have to stress this point, because it really is a big deal. As if all my evidence wasn't strong enough already, this is the smoking gun that proves me right beyond a shadow of a doubt. Bethesda didn't care, or didn't think about it with any level of depth or common sense. 
They thought about it far enough to include a kitchen for the Enclave, include food for them, but made the dire mistake of making their food the same 200-year-old irradiated fucking garbage that everyone else eats. The final type of response I received in the comments is, It's a video game. Who cares? To which my response is, Thank you for proving you're incapable of the discussion and have nothing intelligent to add. The, it's a movie about space wizards intended for children argument doesn't work with me. This is just a cheap and dismissive argument by morons who think that because a work of fiction has some fantastical elements, that it's all inherently childish and stupid and doesn't have to be consistent as a result. The thing is, I'm not even asking for a whole lot here. I'm not asking for total realism. Fact is, despite these large worlds, but those are the games that are relatively small in scale. Their towns aren't built in realistic proportions, and that's fine. If Bethesda were to do a Game of Thrones game in their style, King's Landing would probably be about the size of Balmora from Morrowind at most. Not only would it be nearly impossible to portray these things to such a realistic scale, but players would probably get incredibly lost in massive sprawling cities. As such, I'm not even asking for totally realistic food sources either. It's just something to show that there is, in fact, a place for people to get their food from that makes sense with the world. Literally. Just extend a small area of Megaton, have five Brahmin in a pen, have a couple crops growing. The food in Good Springs in New Vegas isn't totally realistic either, but it gets the job done of showing that some level of thought was put into creating this world. This whole entire original section was much smaller than this in the original video, a fraction of the size it is now. People complain about the length of my videos, but this is what happens when you don't explain things clearly enough. People act as though I'm not being concise, simply because my videos are long. But the reality is that I am trying to be as concise as possible. That is, I'm trying to convey as much information as possible, as clearly as possible, while using as few words as possible. Problem is, when you have a lot of information to convey, even being concise results in an incredibly long video. The whole of human history can't be accurately portrayed in a 20-minute video. Would that mean going in-depth on the subject is too long? Not to mention, it's easy for someone to make a claim, such as, Megaton needs mole rats. But as you can see from my response, fully debunking it takes so much longer. If my responses were, no you, to everything, I wouldn't be presenting any kind of argument. If I were to cut parts of the video out, because some people believe that it's too long, based on their own personal arbitrary definition for how long a video should be, then a lot of information, context, points, and arguments would be lost as a result. Now while I believe I've exhausted every possible defense of this particular point, I realize I won't always be able to do so. In fact, I tend to miss a lot of things because it's nearly impossible to get everything. And I also realize that, despite how much depth I've gone in on this particular argument, there will always be the kind of people who come in and make retarded claims like three flowers in the cemetery is proof that there's plant life growing in the capital wasteland. As if that in any way, shape, or form makes up for the fact that the entire rest of the Capital Wasteland was lacking plant life in such a significant manner that life cannot exist in the Capital Wasteland. Anyways, moving along... As for water, well, when the bomb hit but didn't detonate, it made a crater, one deep enough that the town has access to groundwater. Sure, it's radioactive, but so is all water. That's kind of the point of the main plot. So I've already explained how Megaton is already bad, through its backstory. Now let me explain why it's even worse. So the idea that Megaton hit groundwater is completely based on speculation. Again, it's just something John is inventing to defend the game. As explained earlier, this is what happens when you try to defend something at any cost, rather than looking at the objective facts. 
It leads you into spouting baseless and unsupported bullshit in order to score defense points for the game. Now I'm going to bring back a line he said earlier. Now I love Megaton, and that's partly because it has great visual design, because it's easier to get attached to a place if it's visually distinct. For example, I'm pretty sure I know where everybody lives in Megaton. So he knows where everyone lives in Megaton, right? Would that include Walter, living at the water processing plant? The place that supposedly purifies the water for the town? I mean, I know he knows about this, because he refers to the leaky pipes later on in his video. So why is he referring to the puddle being the water source? There's three problems here. Firstly, the water processing plant is the town's water source, providing semi-purified water. Walter references this as the town's water source. This literally isn't even up for debate. Secondly, the leaking pipes would imply the water at the bottom of the crater is runoff due to that. Finally, in his own clips, he shows his character drinking water that is less toxic than the water of Megaton. Meaning, if toxic water were an issue, and they're still using it as a water source, then it would have made sense to settle elsewhere around less toxic water. John really shot himself in the foot here. Keep in mind, all of this sprung from the criticism of the town being built around the crater. He then references the Shandification video, and makes an excuse for Megaton's food source. Then he runs straight into explaining the water source, when that was never an issue raised. Speaking of that, some people really bloody hate the bomb by the way, because it's odd to build a town around a bomb. It never bothered me though, because I always thought there was a fairly sensible reason for it. You see, there's an old video from about five years ago that discusses Fallout 3 in New Vegas called The Shandification of Fallout, which basically discusses how games work better if their basic logistics have been thought through, and it's obvious how basic human needs are being met. So in the case of Megaton, the city has food because the one upside of the apocalypse is that wildlife is massive now, and there are plenty of mole rats right by the side of the town. As for water, well, when the bomb hit but didn't detonate, it made a crater, one deep enough that the town has access to groundwater. What it seems like he's trying to do here is justify the crater by tying it into the Shandification video, as if proving Bethesda did think of the logistics of how the world works by showing that their water source is the crater itself, when this is factually untrue in more ways than one, the ways I've already described. Now I'll reference his Reddit post again. He mentions that we're supposed to read Megaton as the bomb creating the crater, which I've proven is wrong, and he essentially uses the movie about Space Wizards argument. It's Fallout, so I guess that means there are no rules and logical internal consistency is optional. He says they stretch reality to provide interesting settings and ideas. This is true but he's using this to defend one of the most nonsensical things in the entire series. Just because the bomb hasn't gone off yet, doesn't mean it won't. I wouldn't even mind if the bomb was properly justified, but it's not. Knowing the backstory behind Megaton is actually worse than nothing at all. This brings me back to how I said the Megaton crater gets worse. So first off, many pre-industrial towns and cities were typically built on hills rather than in valleys, or other lowlands, due to the sheer advantage of height. You have a better vantage point to see incoming attackers, as opposed to building in lowlands or on flatland. You also have gravity working on your side for those using ranged weapons. Now I realize archery isn't in Fallout, but it is a good example here, as you would have gravity working against the enemy trying to shoot up at a fortified location, and would be working with you shooting down towards them. Keep in mind, in a dire situation, anything could be used as a projectile too. So if the town were under siege by raiders, it's totally an effective tactic to throw rocks and chunks of concrete and scrap metal to injure or kill their attackers. Lowlands were really only ever good for farming if the ground was fertile or near a water source. But there's also the fact that low areas can flood if torrential rains hit the capital wasteland, then most of Megaton would flood very quickly, and the whole town gets fucked over. Considering it's all made of roughly nailed together scrap, 
you gotta wonder how well those supports will hold when submerged and the dirt they're resting on turns muddy. Now I realize it doesn't rain in-game, but that's an issue on Bethesda's part. We were clearly shown rain in Fallout 4, and this was something they again did in both Morrowind and Oblivion. I have no idea why they excluded rain from Fallout 3, but it's really stupid, since DC typically gets a lot of rain. Maybe it was a technical limitation of some kind, but I still don't understand how Fallout 3 could be limited in that regard, when Bethesda's previous game on the same system had rain too. Anyways, I'm getting a bit off track here. The point is, if flooding occurred for some reason, which absolutely can fucking happen in Washington DC, then Megaton would be fucked. It's basically a giant basin with no drainage, so it's going to fill up with water. If Megaton had been built on a hill instead, then this would at least be less of an issue. If they were to get heavy rain, it would naturally drain outwards, away from the city, and in order to deal with flood-like conditions, they would need the water level to rise higher than the hill they've settled on, which would be an absurd amount of water. You also have to factor in other aspects to the flow of water too. In a town like Megaton, all of the garbage and dust and dirt and scraps of food and other such things are going to flow downwards into the center of town. Megaton has two washrooms in it. If their sewage pipes were to leak for some reason, guess where it's going? Yep, straight down into the center of town, which is what John claims the water source is. And stuff like this that not only allows disease to fester, but also attracts vermin like rats or cockroaches. If the town were instead built on a hill, then all that garbage and filth would drain away from the city naturally with the rain. Megaton is just a complete disaster on every level. The game literally begins with your dad talking about the waters of life and going on to tell you how terrible life is outside the vault, and then the very first town you get to after you leave uses a puddle in a radioactive crater as its water supply. I mean, I've already explained why this isn't true, so I don't need to cover it again. But this really does go to show how far he's stretching to defend this game when he's outright blatantly ignoring the water processing plant as if it doesn't exist. This is incredibly dishonest, and also really weird, because in trying to defend the game, he's actually making it look worse. Bethesda accounted for the water source, but he's saying it's a puddle on the ground. It helps make you realise how bad things are on the wasteland, and how important Project Purity is when that gets introduced. Thematically, it actually works really well. Except, it didn't. Here's the problem. The supposed water crisis comes across as an afterthought more than anything. Besides the water beggars, Liam Neeson and Dr. Lee, hardly anyone in the wasteland seems to care about the water issue. If there's such a dire shortage of water, then shouldn't it be the prime concern for literally every single person and every settlement's day-to-day -day survival? Megaton is barely getting by with its purifier. As far as I can tell, none of the other towns, besides Rivet City, have any kind of proper water source. Where does Tenpenny Tower get their water from? Or Arafu? Republic of Dave? Canterbury? This is why many people have a hard time taking Fallout 3 seriously and have so much criticism for it. We're supposed to care about a water crisis that hardly anyone in the game world ever acknowledges, while the game world itself is filled with dumb goofy bullshit, like Superhuman Gambit, Republic of Dave, and the Nuka Cola bitch. Republic of Dave is preoccupied with their dumb voting system for a town with only six people in it over ensuring they have the necessary resources to continue existing. The two costume dipshits can waste each and every day insulting each other in the streets and having their dumb showdowns. The Nuka Cola bitch spends 24-7 in her moron shack full of dumb collectible bullshit, and the only other person in girder shade is spending his time simping after her. Can someone please explain to me how all these dipshits manage to survive day to day during a water crisis that is impacting literally the entire wasteland besides Oasis? The tree miners might be morons who have branches in their clothes, but at least they kinda sorta get a pass here? Like they don't actually have any crops growing, but I'm willing to buy they've got access to something they can eat, because they at least have living plants. 
If a game tells me there's a dire problem, then fails to properly portray that problem, that is a serious issue. Even Skyrim's non-existent civil war, despite its lack of engagement, was something that NPCs were constantly talking about. You could ask various Jarls for their stances on it, as well as members of their courts. On top of this, Skyrim actually had ordinary people concerned about the dragons. Oblivion had people concerned about the Oblivion Crisis, along with literally almost any other recent in-game event. In Fallout 3, there's a token effort at best to portray the dire water crisis, as if acknowledging it was nothing more than a formality, rather than the entire point of the main story. The water beggars are a band-aid to a bullet wound. But of course, we can't discuss the bomb without looking at Power of the Atom, a quest which gets brought up frequently in any discussion about how terrible Fallout 3 is. Power of the Atom, as a reminder, is a quest about dealing with the unexploded bomb at the core of Megaton. The Sheriff wants it to sound for good, and Mr. Burke, acting on behalf of Mr. Tenpenny, wants it blown up, wiping Megaton off the map. Many people just like this as it's one of those uniquely computer gamey moral choices, where the bad option is such supervillain level evil that it becomes slightly ridiculous. As a result, I've seen it be asked many times, why would any character to have any reason to blow up the bomb. This is literally the only reason the bomb exists. It seems pretty obvious that Bethesda thought it would be cool to have a town you can nuke, so they contrived a reason for a town to be built around a bomb, and they contrived a reason for it to be nuked. I'm not sure I've seen it asked why any player character would want to nuke the town. The rewards are pretty obvious. The issue, as far as I've seen, has been more focused on the narrative and the absurdity of it. You step out of the vault, and the closest town is one you can nuke. The game gives multiple conflicting reasons for why the town should be nuked. Bert claims that the town itself, and its people, are tainted or dirty, or something to that effect. Essentially, he looks down on them, for some reason, that isn't exactly clear, and is never elaborated on. He just thinks they need to be eradicated because he's an evil bad guy, I guess. Ted Penny himself contradicts part of this. He doesn't seem to care too deeply about it, but he does say it's unfortunate that they had to die, and he suggested that Burke attempts to convince them to leave. More than that, though, is Ted Penny's claim that Megaton was an eyesore on the horizon. So there's two major problems with that. First of all, it's the fucking post-nuclear apocalypse world. Literally everything in sight is a ruin. How is Megaton any worse to look at, especially when it's so far away? Which brings me to the next problem. Megaton isn't even fucking visible from Tenpenny Tower. It's completely obscured by an overpass. Additionally, on the radio, 3Dog will mention that Tenpenny had been looking to secure the spot that Megaton is in for years. First of all, again, the entire wasteland is free real estate. Why would this particular location be of such importance? Secondly, if he really did want it, why not form some kind of alliance, or find a way to take it over, or... something? Anything? Because, thirdly... How the fuck does nuking the town secure that location for you? It's only going to make it uninhabitable for centuries to come. Now maybe Burke and Ted Penny are just a couple of psychos who just wanted to destroy the town for shits and giggles. But that's not really a compelling narrative. Why do we want to blow it up? Because it would be funny! Fallout has been about conflicts and struggles in the wasteland, and the series' strength, especially highlighted in New Vegas, is that these conflicts have great amounts of nuance. If blowing up a town was a thing Bethesda really wanted to do, why not form an interesting narrative around it? Maybe it's the last resort in a vicious conflict between two factions you can join, or something. As it stands, the quest is literally, Hey kid, wanna nuke a town for no reason? There is no deep moral question. It's literally the epitome of style over substance. Rule of cool. Well, if you examine the mechanics of the quest, it makes a bit more sense. The good solution normally pays 100 caps, 500 with a fairly hard speech check, 
for a low level character, whereas the evil option pays 500 caps by default, up to 1000 with a skill check, or the much easier Black Widow perk option. Both options have a reward of player housing too, but you might well have a preference for the 10 penny suite, as it is much cleaner and does come with a balcony with a very nice view. There's also a couple of other tweaks that make the quest interesting to do. See, if you side with Megaton, Burke sends a team of assassins to kill you, though they don't actually get sent directly, instead they get added to a deck of random events that can spawn in the wasteland, so you may not necessarily see it in any given playthrough. Oh, we're talking about quest rewards? I like how he says this, as if people are too stupid to understand what the rewards were. Well, if you examine the mechanics of the quest... I suppose rewards alone are fine if we're talking about strictly playing a mercenary character with no moral code, or maybe even just playing the game casually and not caring about choice at all. But again, the main issue comes down to a narrative reason. Besides reward, what is my motivation to eliminate Megaton and everyone in it? Because the other games in the series tried to give motivation for why you might pick one side or the other. More importantly, what are the long-term ramifications of destroying Megaton? How will my choice to spare or destroy it impact the wasteland, besides the surface-level changes of a location being removed from the game, and about two dozen NPCs dying? Oh yeah, that's right, there's literally nothing in the game to cover that in the slightest. It's one and done! Three Dog assumes you're responsible with no real evidence, Liam Neeson is mildly disappointed in you, and that's the end of it. Now if Megaton were responsible for the production of some vital resource, say food or medicine, for example, this alone would create tons of potential for quests to exist, but would also have a severely negative impact on the wasteland. Megaton gets destroyed, so now the primary supply of medicine, for example, has been eliminated from the world. Now all the groups that relied on those supplies are in desperate need of them. Maybe they have tighter rationing of supplies, leading to more suffering. Maybe smaller groups end up having to fight each other for their supplies, essentially becoming bandits or raiders in the process. All in an effort to survive. Now the destruction of Megaton has a knock-on effect on the rest of the wasteland. One that impacts the lives of many, many people outside of the town, and thus giving a reason for NPCs in the wider world to care about its destruction and loss. As it stands in the game, the destruction of Megaton is viewed through the lens of simple loss of lives of the people who live there, and nothing more. The only way to avoid that is to seduce him and convince him not to destroy the town. In addition, you can play along, get the device to blow up the bomb, and then turn it straight over to the sheriff, as double-crossing a side that you've already chosen, and potentially even taken money up front from, is frequently an option in Fallout 3. Side quests rather nicely very rarely locked you into a side. This forces a confrontation which can lead to the sheriff's death, but that lets you acquire a very useful early game Chinese assault rifle, and you can complete the quest anyway, as it can be turned into his son, or the confrontation can lead to Burke's death, getting you the first silenced weapon of the game, and that also stops Burke ever deploying Hitman against you. So there are some interesting options there, but in short, the evil option awards much more money, which makes it a bit more interesting. Lucas Sims' death is absurdly contrived, and one of the most idiotic sequences in the entire game. Which is saying a lot, as this game is full of contrived and idiotic sequences. It really goes to show how little attention Bethesda paid to the details of the world they're making. So Lucas Sims arrests Burke, yet Megaton doesn't have a jail, so where is he taking him? But never mind that, the real issue is that Sims takes no precautions at all here. He doesn't restrain Burke, he doesn't check him for weapons, he doesn't even make Burke walk ahead of him. He puts his weapon away, turns his back on the man accused of trying to blow up the entire fucking town with a nuke, and as a result, he gets shot and killed immediately, and he dies like a bitch. To add insult to injury, not a single person in all of Megaton tries to stop him after this. They all just let him walk out as if nothing even happened. If the player had killed Lucas Sims, the entire town would turn hostile and try to kill you. It really demonstrates the level of care and craftsmanship that goes into Fallout 3's world design. Which is to say, none at all. 
Though I do agree with people who say there is basically no reason to detonate the bomb other than role-playing as an evil person. I do, however, find that in itself an odd complaint, because one of the most frequently raised issues about Fallout 3 is it's not a proper Fallout game because it's not a role-playing game because there aren't enough choices with consequences. But right here, you get the option to blow up a major settlement, permanently killing multiple named characters, including quest givers, a companion, shops, a very hard locked armory, a unique bobblehead, player housing, and also the only characters in the game who have information that leads to GNR in the main plot. And you can choose to kill all of them. And if you do, you just have to live with it and find the main plot by yourself. So John is very clearly conflating what consequences means here. He does that a lot. Again, when people reference the lack of consequences as being an issue in Fallout 3, they're often referring to the long-term ramifications of your actions. Fallout 1 and 2 told us in the ending what happened to just about every major location we visited and the results of our actions. Necropolis, The Den, Modoc, New Reno, Vault City, Gecko, and so forth. This showed us that our actions have long-term consequences how you decided to handle conflicts could radically change the wasteland for many, many people. What John is referring to here is strictly mechanical consequences, and while those are important too, the problem is that most of its list is entirely a moot point. You don't lose Moira as a merchant, she survives and moves to Underworld. Most of the named characters in Megaton are worthless as far as gameplay goes, they mostly just act as set dressing, so losing them isn't a consequence for the player. As for the quest givers, there's only one single named quest that requires Megaton to exist, and that's Power of the Atom, the quest in which you have the option to destroy it. He might have had a point with quest givers if there were quests that could potentially become available after Power of the Atom, but that's not the case. All of the named quests you can get in Megaton can be found elsewhere, such as Blood Ties, starting as you approach Arafu if you did not receive it from Lucy West. The Armory, Unique Bobblehead, The Companion, and the information to find Liam Neeson can all be done pretty easily before nuking Megaton. I know this because that's what I did every single time I played the game after my first playthrough. I get enough negative karma to hire Jericho, I'd slaughter everyone in Megaton, loot the armory and the shops, grab the bobblehead, then blow up the town. The only possible way to miss out on these things is if you don't do any exploring in Megaton before permanently wiping it off the map, which would be the fault of the player at that point, as it's pretty obvious what setting off a nuke would do. It really shouldn't have to be said, but if you plan on nuking a town, you should take full advantage of everything that town has to offer before you nuke it. It's also disingenuous to list losing out on player housing as a consequence here, because you can only ever own one of them anyways, and both are rewards for completing this quest. Literally, the game changes the objective to continue the search for your father, and now you have no quest marker. You blow up the one person in the world with information, and now you have no information. Not even New Vegas was that happy to let you suffer the consequences of bad decisions with its early game main plot missions. If you kill Beagle, he has a journal on his body giving you the exact information he'd tell you. Kill Manny? The information is right there on his terminal. But not Fallout 3 though. If you blow up your only lead, now you're on your own. And isn't that exactly the sort of freedom and choice and consequence that people say they want from a Fallout game? Isn't do what you want but be ready to live with the consequences exactly the philosophy that made Fallout 1 so loved in the first place? Total false equivalence. I suppose it's a fault of New Vegas for not including a nukeable town, so the possibility of destroying your only lead is an option. If we were to truly compare equal scenarios, the Moriarty would need some kind of key or password to access the info on Liam Neeson if we were to kill him, similar to Beagle and Manny. Oh wait, it's right there. Huh, imagine that. And while John is right that you can nuke Megaton and lose your lead, he's leaving out key details about the situation. You see, Mr. Burke, the man who wants you to nuke Megaton, just so happens to be in the exact same room that the info to find Liam Neeson is in. Quite literally, you would have to be so mindlessly excited about nuking the town 
that you dropped everything and immediately went to Tenpenny Tower to blow it up without doing literally anything else. Remember earlier how John said it was great world design, how you're directed towards Megaton? This is very much a similar case. They put the man who wants to blow up the town in the same room as the information you need for the main quest, so they could drastically reduce the chance of players missing this information entirely. If Burke was camped outside of town, or hanging around the front gate, or wander around town like everyone else, or even approached you like that weirdo in Skingrad, there's a higher chance of players missing the vital information they need for the main quest. Plus, I think the bomb's interesting thematically as well, as weapons of mass destruction come up repeatedly in Fallout 3. In case you missed them, which is fairly easy to do as they're well hidden at the north of the map, in Fort Constantine you can find the launch codes for an intercontinental ballistic missile, which you can attempt to launch, though it does fail. In a nearby satellite array, you can trigger an orbital weapons platform to drop a nuclear payload on the wasteland, and that one does actually trigger. And there's something interesting about these weapons as well. By the safe with the launch codes in it, there's a random wastelander who got the safe open before you arrived. He just got shot by a robot before he could use it. And the satellite weapon is being worked on by some random ghoul who's trying to get it operational. Meanwhile, Bert wants to blow up Megaton because Tenpenny voiced a slight preference for it. Three nuclear super weapons, all three almost falling into the hands of some random wastelander. Now we'll discuss tone in detail later, but for now, let's say Fallout 3 is often grim. The Wasteland hasn't recovered from nuclear devastation. The pockets of civilization are fragile and insecure. In Arafu, they're about ready to give up. In Big Town, the people are initially pretty much completely despondent. This is a game that dwells on the horror of nuclear apocalypse. And accordingly, at a basic level, I think there's something fundamentally horrifying about the very presence of these operational nuclear weapons. America is in ruins, but there's still a few more nukes ready to go off yet. Fallout 3's grim world is haunted by its nuclear past, whether that's in the form of radiation that infects every water source in the wasteland, old Voltec experiments into the fourth devolutionary virus that's now running rampant, or the surviving weapons that can threaten what little progress has been made, a theme powerful enough that New Vegas would revisit it in Lonesome Road. So something appearing repeatedly doesn't necessarily make it a theme. And while it is interesting that Fallout 3 has these weapons of mass destruction lying around, that could easily be utilized by some random wastelander, they are irrelevant to the series' themes. Fallout has always been about rebuilding during the post-apocalypse. It's about people trying to survive in the current world, not lingering on what came before it, nor the destruction of what's being rebuilt. In fact, I'd argue that being a post-apocalypse setting, it makes sense to show signs of what caused the apocalypse, and particularly in this case, it makes sense that not every missile got fired, and that there were some bombs that were duds, or just didn't detonate for one reason or another. Details like these are the expectation for a post-apocalypse setting. Fallout 3 does show us this aspect, but it fails to show signs of rebuilding. Most major locations are entirely isolated, and the reasoning for existing in the state we see them in is piss poor. Megaton is complete nonsense, as we've already covered. Lamplight is full of children, with absolutely no source for new children being explained at all. Tenpenny Tower is a bunch of dipshits LARPing as the wealthy elite, in a world where achieving such riches seems impossible, and few of them even have any kind of reason for it. New Vegas shows a world that is rebuilding, through the three main factions and the smaller factions throughout the game, and Lonesome Road isn't about destroying all progress that has been made, which I'll dive deeper into shortly. If Fallout 3 has a thesis, it's perhaps a warning against clinging to the past, repeating old mistakes, replaying old conflicts. It's a thing that New Vegas would pick up too, probably best summarised by the expression Old World Blues. To quote that DLC, it refers to those so obsessed with the past that they can't see the present, much less the future, for what it is. And that's an idea that keeps coming up in the main antagonist of Fallout 3. President Eden wants to wipe the slate clean of anything post-war, no matter how many casualties it would cause. Braun wants to recreate the old world, even if it means living the rest of his life in a simulation. The Overseer is so scared of any change that he'd rather gun down his own people than allow dissent. And there, right there, in the middle of the very first town, is the most literal representation imaginable of being haunted by the past. An atom bomb. We must have been playing two different games, because Fallout 3 and its DLCs 
Don't warn against clinging to the past, repeating old mistakes, or replaying old conflicts in any way, except for maybe Point Lookout. This seems like a bit of overreaching to pull something deeper out of this that simply isn't there. The Enclave of Fallout 2 was a representation of how bad pre-war America was. We've seen this previously in the series, in the intro of Fallout 1, where soldiers execute a man in the street in Canada and laugh about it. The main questline of Fallout 3 is about getting a water purifier working, and the Enclave feels like they were thrown in because Bethesda needed a villain faction in their game. Eden is just a carbon copy of the Enclave of Fallout 2, with none of the nuance. And they don't even expand upon the faction in any meaningful way. He just wants to purge everything he deems impure, and there's nothing to indicate that this is clinging to the past. It's just the Enclave retreading ground that's covered already. Even attempting a similar method of exterminating the impure by using a modified version of the FEV. Furthermore, neither Braun nor the Overseer fit into this idea either. Braun is a psychotic cartoon character whose entire personality is torturing people for shits and giggles. His entire simulation appears to have been built entirely around this singular goal. Going another level deeper on this, it makes total sense for a virtual reality vault to base their worlds on what they knew of their world at the time, not the post-nuclear wasteland that we know. Why would a simulation in this setting not be an idyllic slice of the pre-war world? As for the Overseer, he's not resisting change purely for the sake of it, or holding on to the past, he genuinely considers the outside world to be a threat. He's got evidence of this, as the Enclave have already tried entering the vault. Not to mention, he's aware of rad roaches and giant ants, which means he's aware of the mutations that could occur. He has no idea just how bad it could potentially get out there. Even the idea of Old World Blues is far more specific than John is giving it credit for, by reducing it to clinging to the past. Looking back at Lonesome Road, from Ulysses' point of view, all of the major players in the Mojave are trying to restore some version of pre-war society and not making anything new. The Roman Empire through Legion, America through the NCR, and House is trying to restore the greatness of the Las Vegas Strip through taking in tribals, dressing them up, and trying to make them civilized to create an illusion of the old world. Lonesome Road is about Ulysses using nukes to destroy these imitations of pre-war societies that have already failed. There's no future in the bear or bull. The bear is diseased, barely clings to life. And the bull, when the legion reaches the sea, it will turn on itself and die. Killing one will end both. And you made me see how one could do it. Your ignorance, carelessness, can be used with a purpose. I'll start with the West. Let that burn. Then, if the East falters after, I'll bring the divide there as well. Burn away the flags. Begin again. No. Not the Mojave, the West. All that's been built since America died. Same symbols as before the war. Now a flag carried by a tribe of children. You walked the West, didn't stay. You know the reason. The bear grows without structure, follows a symbol without knowing its history. After this, only one flag will remain over the Mojave. Let that one fly, or destroy itself. These governments of the two-headed bear, the Legion, they carry old world ideas into an age that no longer needs them, where they cannot live. But Mojave's proof that no homeland is sacred until the larger symbols are destroyed. Whatever is built, the bear, bull, even Vegas will tear it apart, convert it either with purpose or by accident. 
He doesn't see what they're doing as any kind of progress. He sees them as dead ends. In which case, if that's his point of view, then how does it tie into the idea of these remaining weapons threatening what little progress has been made? To compare this to Fallout 3, the NCR, the Legion, and House all emulate something from the past, despite what they're emulating has already failed to survive. Whereas the examples John gives represent something entirely different from this idea, Eden seeking to exterminate the impure, or something entirely irrelevant, Braun torturing people for his own entertainment and the Overseer genuinely afraid of the dangers of the outside world. If that wasn't enough, John even misses his own point he was making here right at the end. And there, right there, in the middle of the very first town, is the most literal representation imaginable of being haunted by the past. An atom bomb. Being haunted by the past is far different than clinging to it. I feel like that's a really obvious thing to say, but I guess I have to say it. The whole idea of Old World Blues was about people refusing to let go of the past. So in what way is a reminder of the Old World related to those so obsessed with the past that they can't see the present, much less the future, for what it is. Simple answer. It isn't. Sorry, that was quite a big digression for one quest. Let's talk about the rest of Megaton. So you get there and you need information. The Sheriff points you to Moriarty, who does have the information, but needs to be persuaded to part with it. And once again, you've got plenty of options. You can use a speech check on Moriarty, you can pay him some money, you can sweet talk his staff with a couple of speech or perk checks, use a fairly hard science check to hack his computer, or an easier lockpick check to break into a cover to get the computer password, or if you can't do that, agree to do a short unmarked quest for him to recover money from a junkie who skipped town, which you can also deal with through speech checks, carefully selecting the right dialogue or violence, all of which yield different amounts of money, which you can use to pay Moriarty for the information. But remember, Fallout 3 isn't a proper Fallout game because there aren't enough skill checks, choices, or alternative solutions. I mean, there demonstrably are, I just told you them. So this is a bit of a dishonest argument for him to make here. He highlights some rather simple choices in an early quest, and tries to use this to debunk the entire criticism that the game lacks skill checks and alternative solutions. Problem is, this is an issue that exists throughout the entire game, and highlighting a random quest that does have these options doesn't make up for the rest that lack them. To fully delve into this criticism of the game lacking choice, as well as why John's defenses of it are cherry-picked examples and not representative of the entire game, and why the criticism against Fallout 3 is actually accurate, we would need to go through every single quest in the game, which I'll do later in the video. As this is a point John repeatedly brings up, and I can't really go through the entire list every single time. Again, a quest or two having some options, all leading to the same destination, isn't really what people are referring to. Sure, there's some aspect of the path you take being a bit important. Killing Silver, for example, is an evil thing to do. However, regardless of how you handle this choice, the results are always the same in the end. There are no significant consequences. Now some might respond by saying this is a rather simple quest, early on, so I shouldn't expect any kind of long-term ramifications for our actions. However, I would like to point out that we're not in the tutorial anymore. This is the actual game world now, and the time for hand-holding is over. Sure, it's still a simple quest, but if all the choices are going to lead to the same outcome, then these choices shouldn't be propped up as a defense for a lack of choice. The entire reason this game is criticized for a lack of choice is because most choices are completely meaningless, like this one is. If you're in a dungeon, and there's four distinct doors in front of you, each implying you'll have to deal with something different, then you go through the door, and they all lead to the same room, that's not a choice. That's an illusion of choice. It's like how Bioshlock Shitfinite constantly gives you choices throughout the game, but all of them are entirely meaningless and don't actually lead to anything, or how choices in Telltale games very rarely lead to any significant changes. In fact, it's a bit shocking I haven't seen Telltale criticized far more for this issue, since it's a constant throughout their games. Here's some quick examples. Early on in the first episode of Season 1, 
You have the choice to save Duck or Sean. Regardless of what you choose, Duck always survives and Sean always dies. Now this does affect how much Kenny likes or dislikes you, however even that has little to no significant impact on the major events of the game. Later on, you have the choice to save Doug or Carly, and again, there's no significant impact. Both characters die at the exact same point in the game later on anyways, if they're saved. And they don't do anything significant or meaningful between their first potential death and the point where the game kills them off anyways. In Season 2, you have the choice to prevent another person from killing Nick, however, if he survives, he goes on to be completely irrelevant to the entire next episode. He barely has any extra lines of dialogue. Then, in the following episode to that, he just turns up dead, having been zombified off-screen. The only real difference saving him had was his model being loaded into a few scenes he otherwise wouldn't have been in. This is the case with pretty much every single choice in Telltale's games. Season 1 culminates in a confrontation with The Stranger, another survivor of the apocalypse who lost his entire family and blames Lee for many of his issues. See, earlier on you find an abandoned car with your group, which looks like it was recently used as it's full of supplies. You can choose to either take the supplies for yourself, or not. But it's another meaningless choice, as members of your group will steal from the car regardless, and based on information I've given so far, I'm sure you can already see where this is going. The Stranger blames Lee, and criticizes the choices he made, and by extension, the player's choices, and wants to kill him. Consistently throughout the entire game, you're given limited choices that don't change anything significant, then at the very end of the game, you're blamed for events that are entirely out of your control, because the game never gave you the choices that would change how things turn out, and regardless of what you choose, all major plot points happen regardless. This is what I meant earlier when I referred to the illusion of choice. John brings up choices in the vault intro, but they don't change anything of any significance. In similar fashion to Nick in Season 2 of Walking Dead, running past a guard, saving Butch's mom, or killing any of the other vault dwellers only changes who does and doesn't spawn in during trouble on the home front. The only death that actually matters is the Overseer's, because the man who replaces him isn't willing to come to a peaceful ending for trouble on the home front. This also applies in equal parts to dealing with Moriarty and Silver. Yes, you could steal the caps from her, or kill her for them, or convince her to give them up, but the ultimate conclusion has no significant difference. If she lives, she doesn't go on to do anything else. She stays in that little house, forever, doing nothing. If she's killed, you lose some karma, but that's the extent of the consequence. She doesn't have a family to mourn her, nor a lover who seeks revenge or anything of the sort. Absolutely nothing changes one way or the other, regardless of how you deal with Silver or even Moriarty. So in effect, your choice is meaningless. A good example of this in another game is Morrowind and Fargoth's Ring. In the beginning of the game, the player comes across a somewhat helpful Ring of Healing that is soon revealed to belong to a wood elf named Fargoth. You can just keep the ring for yourself or give it back to him. However, if you return the ring, you learn he is friends with the local shopkeeper, and you get a discount on all items. The ring is not going to carry you through the whole game, and that pawn shop certainly won't ever have endgame gear, but the consequences actually exist. There is no single ending. You make a choice, it has consequences depending on what that choice is. Now let's return to the idea that the game world of Fallout 3 isn't properly fleshed out, because it's not in the slightest. But, if we were to add some flesh to this game, then how you handle Silver should have a variety of outcomes. Maybe killing her would reduce your reputation with Megaton, and maybe even Moriarty as a result. He could be annoyed at you for acting like a bounty hunter, when all he wanted was the money, and how him sending out a killer could potentially impact his own reputation. Maybe Silver had family in Megaton, or elsewhere in the world, who hate you now. These consequences do not have major game-changing ramifications on the player, but the consequences would still exist. That would be a bit more than nothing at all. I could come up with more, 
but I just don't see the point in wasting time trying to expand on this encounter just for the sake of example. Point is, as it stands now, Silver is nothing more than a rando NPC that exists solely for this mini-quest, and nothing you do regarding her or getting the password or info has any kind of significant impact on the world. Hell, even outright killing Moriarty doesn't really do anything. Gob still complains about him as if he never died. Nova will apparently stop being a prostitute, and Gob's name will be painted over Moriarty's sign on the outside. Literally the most low-effort way of acknowledging the fact that Moriarty died. It's likely done this way too, because Megaton does get nuked. Why put in the effort to make any significant change within the town that could potentially get destroyed? And yet I keep hearing over and over that this is Fallout 3's weakness. And the vast majority of Fallout 3's quests are like this, though I'd like to skip forward to one particular quest, because one of the videos I watched that critiqued Fallout 3 was by a channel called Indigo Gaming, and they specifically called out trying to enter Little Lamplight as the peak of Bethesda's design choices, which, to quote the video, is antithetical to the very core of Fallout games. Now this I find confusing, because here's how that section goes. You can immediately access Little Lamplight if you pass a fairly tough speech check, or if you've taken the fairly obscure and charisma-gated Child at Heart perk. Alternatively, you have to complete the Rescue from Paradise quest, which is a really interesting quest. What the video highlights, however, is that you can't use violence to blast your way into Little Lamplight. In short, that old chestnut that people regularly hold against Fallout 3, you can't murder children. So this is already a bit of a misrepresentation of the situation and Indigo Gaming's video. The issue is less that you can't murder children, and more the fact that violence isn't allowed. I could see why some people would easily confuse the two, as you are dealing with children, but the key difference here is that it's a design choice by Bethesda. They decided to put the town full of unkillable children in the middle of the main story, so you're now forced to deal with them regardless of whether you want to or not. In a game supposedly about choice, your choices are limited as a direct result of Bethesda's design choices. They wanted a dumb gimmicky town full of children that makes no sense, so by god are you going to have to deal with it. Bethesda could have designed this area in any multitude of ways, and they decided to design it in such a way that it inherently limits the choice of the player. What bugs me the most about this particular section is this line. In short, that old chestnut that people regularly hold against Fallout 3, you can't murder children. Like, dude, you realize you can't kill children in New Vegas too, right? And Skyrim? This is less a Fallout 3 problem, and more of a problem with all of Bethesda's post-Oblivion games. Now, I agree, it's unrealistic that if you shoot children, they don't die. But it's also unrealistic that you can inject yourself with a stim pack to instantly heal off injuries or get better at computer hacking even if you've never practiced hacking a computer just because that's where you assigned skill points after leveling up. But both of those things have been in the franchise since Fallout 1. This is a total false equivalence argument. Stim packs healing you and skill points are game mechanics, not functions of the world. Being unable to kill children in these games is something people find annoying because it takes their freedom away. It's the exact same reason people find essential NPCs annoying. John is also framing this as an issue of realism when that isn't the argument at all. The thing is, no game will ever be 100% realistic. Every game has to draw a line somewhere, even if it's just on grounds of technical limitations. Honestly, it's unrealistic that any game ever has any form of physical barrier, as given long enough, I could logically dig under it, or hit it with a sledgehammer for long enough that it breaks, even if it took days of in-game time. But not every game can have Red Faction Guerrilla mechanics included, so we accept compromises. Again, this is less about realism, and more about player freedom and choice. Being able to kill everyone is so much more choice than not being able to kill anyone. As such, being able to kill some NPCs and not others represents player freedom and choice being removed on some level. Now because the subject of choice is going to get a bit muddled here, I suppose I should make a distinction between gameplay choices and narrative choices. Because there is a pretty significant difference, and John seems to like to confuse what choice means fairly often. Gameplay choice is something that you, the player, can decide to do at any time, completely unprompted. You can kill Lucas Sims. You can kill Doc Mitchell. You can kill Caius Cassades. 
You can choose to plunder a dungeon because it's an open world game. Narrative choice is directly related to quests and stories going on in the game. You have a choice who to make Sheriff of Prim. You have a choice of nuking Megaton or not. You have a choice in how to handle the issue of the Gecko Power Plant contaminating the water of Vault City. Keep those last two in mind, I'm not done with them yet. As an additional side note, there is no proper explanation for why there's still kids in Lamplight. There's a lore for why there were kids there 200 years ago. There's a field trip, but that was 200 years ago. And there's absolutely zero reason given for why there's still kids 200 years later. Of course, the only reason child murder actually ever gets brought up at all is because Fallout 1 lets you do it. False. It's a bit narrow-minded to just assume the only reason this ever gets brought up is because of Fallout 1. I found it to be an issue in my first ever playthrough of Fallout 3, and at that point, I had never played the original games. You do know what they say about assuming, right? Skyrim has similar criticisms about having unkillable children, despite the series never having them beforehand. Is it really that difficult to figure out if it is more plausible the people are irritated at losing the ability to kill children, more so than Skyrim, because another game did it first? Or if people are irritated that the inability to kill children became extremely relevant during a quest where the player is forced to help children who mindlessly berate them. Fallout 3 actually lets you enslave children for money, including literally locking tight bomb collars around their necks. That's not in Fallout 1, but of course Fallout 3's critics would never acknowledge that. Oh boy, I really wasn't looking forward to dealing with this part again. The sheer arrogance and condescending tone he has here really makes him seem petty and immature. Let me give a little pro tip to everyone out there who wants to make any kind of video like this in the future. If you're going to say something in such a combative and condescending tone, make sure what you're saying is actually correct and accurate, because if not, it just makes you look really fucking bad. Being condescending is only appropriate when you're correct. Being condescending when you're wrong is just embarrassing. So let's explain why John should be embarrassed over this particular line. First of all, this isn't a dick measuring contest between the games. This isn't about Fallout 1 or Fallout 3 having some features that the other doesn't. Again, What's more important to the discussion is player freedom, though it's clear by John's attitude that he's got a narrative and he's going to stick to it. Secondly, he picks this random evil act out of the air and props it up as though it's supposed to be some kind of big deal, as though it's CONCRETE PROOF that Fallout 3 is full of choices, and those small-minded critics of Fallout 3 have to ignore that it exists, so they could claim it has little choice. The problem with this whole choice discussion is that it's very easy for John to pick out a few examples here and there, some of which may not even particularly address criticisms levied, and use it as a bludgeon against the critics and condescendingly talk down to them as if they're dirty troglodytes who can't appreciate the choice Bethesda put into their game. Because refuting the claim requires going through basically every choice in the game as a result to prove these few examples don't change much of anything. Comparing the choice and consequence in Fallout 3 to Fallout 2 is like comparing the amount of water in a small pond to a large lake. Yeah, it's there, but one is clearly superior. To add on to that, New Vegas is a sea and Fallout 4 is a puddle of dog piss. Point is, anyone who says there is no choice in Fallout 3 is either being hyperbolic when referring to a general lack of choice or they're a brain-dead fucking idiot who shouldn't be taken seriously. Did you maybe stop to consider that this is actually an obscure choice that many players would have missed, rather than it being some kind of dirty, malicious, nefarious, malevolent ploy to discredit Fallout 3's choices? To just so blatantly assume that critics of Fallout 3 are being disingenuous over this dumb option existing when most probably missed it only makes you look bad here to anyone who is actually paying attention. I mean, the very fact that I'm a critic of Fallout 3 and I'm acknowledging this choice proves your little comment wrong. I didn't even know this choice existed before I had seen your video for the first time, 
and it changes nothing about my views or criticisms of Fallout 3. Because ultimately this is one choice, and it doesn't impact anything. The only consequence is a loss of 200 karma. It's a little more than a near meaningless evil thing you can do. Why does this absolutely require acknowledgement? Why should I, as a critic of Fallout 3, stop for a moment during the production of my video and specifically include a segment to acknowledge that this choice exists? Why is this the hill you've decided to die on in defense of Fallout 3? Just like my Bioshock Shipfinite and Telltale Games examples earlier, what difference does this choice make? What impact does it have on the world? A single, completely irrelevant character is moved from one location to another. In fact, it seems a lot of characters, who are the victims of such circumstances, tend to either be characters who had a purpose, then become irrelevant once they fulfilled that purpose, or they're entirely irrelevant characters. Like Garza, the man during the main quest, who has a heart attack as you're escaping Project Purity. A character who has no relevance to anything whatsoever, besides being dangled in front of the player randomly, as if we're supposed to just care about this fucking Randy nobody. And I think that really highlights the issue quite nicely. Bethesda wants these tense moments and horrible choices, but they don't want the player to face any significant consequences, which is why some characters, like Harkness, are essential NPCs until you complete their quests. Because Bethesda doesn't want you to miss out on their quests. New Vegas gave the freedom to the player to decide. That's why there used to be the joke years ago that killing an NPC in New Vegas would fail 20 quests, because people went around killing everything early on, only to find out that they really could kill everything in sight. Even nuking a town, the literal worst option you have in the entire fucking game, besides poisoning the water, only nets you some slight disappointment from Liam Neeson, and Three Dog baselessly speculating that you did it for no other reason than the fact that you're hanging out at Tenpenny Tower, as well as a karma loss if you aren't already at the lowest possible karma level, which you should be fairly close to if you kill everyone and loot everything in Megaton first. In this specific case, it's likely down to two factors somewhat unique to child murder. First, a child murder-inclusive Fallout 3 would likely be refused classification in some territories, very likely including Australia and Germany. And secondly, it would massively increase the risk of earning the ire of some reactionary groups, whether news or parents groups, and increase the chance of boycotts, the game being pulled from the shelves of major retailers, all sorts of stuff that Bethesda reasonably wouldn't want. Fallout 1, people perhaps forget, was a small game made by a small team and wasn't considered during its production to be a major title at Interplay. The same year they published 11 other games, including some big intellectual property, like Star Trek, Starfleet Academy. An interview with some of Fallout's original creators in 2017 pretty much confirmed that they were left alone to do their own thing, which made it much easier for them to play with fire, because if it had blown up in their faces, it wouldn't have led to the failure of an IP that had just been purchased for about 6 million US dollars before you even started making the game. Which, well, no one has actually ever stated how much Fallout 3 cost to make, based on games from a similar period that we do have the budgets for, like Bioshock, Crisis, and Crackdown, we can estimate that it's at least 20 million US dollars, probably much more due to the open world nature of Fallout 3. Once you put that much money on the line, yes, Bethesda made the call to be cautious and not include child murder. This is what we call misdirection. Now, he's been doing it the whole time with this argument about killable children, but this is just a point where we can really nail it down. He is spending a great deal of time explaining why the game wouldn't have killable children, and he is correct with most of what he's saying here. Problem is, as mentioned earlier, that this wasn't about children being unkillable. It was about Bethesda forcing the player to comply with the children of Little Lamplight. There are certainly complaints about children being unkillable, and I certainly don't like it either. But Bethesda is entirely justified in making them unkillable for the sake of avoiding any kind of backlash from reactionary groups full of weirdos. It's something we, unfortunately, have to accept if these games are going to exist. Now this is something I think Bethesda has understood for a long time. Morrowind didn't have children, and neither did Oblivion. In Morrowind, there were no NPCs that couldn't be killed. Oblivion did have immortal NPCs, but you could still damage them and knock them out. Maybe that's coincidence, or maybe it's because they found a way to add children without those weirdos getting mad. 
Fallout 3 just straight up makes children immune to all damage. So if Bethesda was going to go this far to make children not just unkillable, but also undamageable, then why would they decide to make the town full of children a requirement for the main quest, which inherently limits your choice? Again, you cite Indigo Gaming's video, in which his issue is that the option of violence simply does not exist. Not that you cannot kill children. These are two very different complaints. And seriously, if the issue of killable children were really that big of a deal, the New Vegas and Skyrim would have received this criticism in droves too. Plus in this case, I'm not really sure what the point of the objection is. The child you want to kill is sitting behind a barricade that's already been established you can't climb, so what good does shooting them do? Do you think the town is more likely to let you in after you've murdered their mayor? I think this is absolute proof that John simply does not understand the criticisms leveled at this game, or even the basic mechanics of criticism towards something. Let me ask everyone watching this video. If there's a criticism towards an aspect of a game, what do you imagine the solution would be? In this particular case, Lamplight. I guarantee that no one who has criticized the lack of killable children in regards to Lamplight has simply wanted a switch flipped to allow them to kill children. And I unfortunately have to say this because that's exactly what John is implying here. You can't get in if you kill the mayor. So why would you want to have the option to kill him? Well, let me walk you through it slowly. If we were to make a version of Fallout 3 where children are killable, logic naturally dictates that we would have to come up with some kind of alternate method of accessing Lamplight Caverns to account for any players who killed McCready. And even more than that, Bethesda didn't have to make the game this way. They decided to put the town full of immortal children here. The whole issue is a byproduct of their dumb decision to not just add this dumb gimmicky bullshit, but to add it right here in the middle of the main quest. It's a somewhat petty complaint, especially as the associated quest you're sent to complete is actually a really excellent example of a good Fallout quest. It is not a petty complaint. Never before in Fallout have we been absolutely required to earn the trust of a group in order to progress the main quest. New Vegas didn't do this either. Not even Fallout 4 did this, as the Minutemen are just fine with you no matter what you do, because nothing you do in that game matters. The problem is worsened by the fact there is no reason for the player to even like this faction. From beginning to end, Little Lamplight treats you like shit and offers no good reason to help them beyond the requirement to continue the main quest. The associated quest is irrelevant to this specific discussion. We're not talking about Rescue from Paradise, we're talking about entering Little Lamplight as part of the main quest line. You see, first you've got to gain entry to the settlement of Paradise Falls, for which there are plenty of options, including the faint hint of a reputation system. You see, in another quest, Head of State, there's a conflict between slavers and slaves. If you sided with the slavers, Paradise Falls actually remembers that, and you get let in automatically. The morality system has a use here as well, very evil characters are allowed in immediately. Alternatively, there's a hard speech check, but it has to come with a substantial bribe. A group of slavers aren't going to let you in for nothing, no matter how charismatic you are. Alternatively, you can agree to do some work for them, enslaving one of four targets they highlight for you. Now, if you're a morally good character with low charisma, this poses an interesting question. Is it right to enslave one person in an attempt to free multiple child slaves? And if so, who'd you pick? Three are civilians, one a doctor in fact, but the fourth one initially seems like an obvious choice, Arkansas, who shoots at you as you enter minefield. But things still get a little bit uncomfortable once you get the collar around his neck. Don't kill me, please. I'm going. You see, the Fallout 3 official game guide confirms that he only shot at you because he thought you were a slaver. He's actually a vigilante who lays traps for slavers, and you just enslaved him, and they're gonna do horrible things to him now. I'm tempted not to sell him. Just so we can torment him. Use him for target practice or something. <laughs> so first of all, the official game guide is outside information and completely irrelevant. This really shouldn't have to be said, but outside material does not make up for information not present in the game. When watching a movie or playing a game, you shouldn't need additional fucking reading material for anything to make sense. 
This isn't even a novelization to explain away plot holes, like with the shitty Disney Star Wars movies. It's literally just a game guide that tells you how to complete quests and where interesting locations are. If Bethesda did not put in the effort to explain Arkansas's backstory into the game, that is the fault of the game, and no amount of outside information can fix that. Secondly, that hard moral choice for good characters with low charisma and speech kind of falls flat when you realize you could just save scum until you get the result you want, or you can come back later after you've gained a few levels. Once you do get inside though, it's a slave market, so naturally you can just buy the kids. For 2,000 caps, which is a lot of money in Fallout 3, as there's less cash sloshing around than in New Vegas. Alternatively, if you just fancy doing a breakout, there are a few science and repair checks that follow, plus some amusing ways to distract the guard, like paying one of the prostitutes to uh, keep him busy. But the really interesting stuff happens once you're actually ready to break the kids out and let them make a quiet run for the drainage pipe that they can squeeze through. You see, two of the children are happy to go straight away, Another, Penny, refuses to go until her friend Rory is rescued from Solitary, except the quest is effectively already complete. Those first two kids can fairly easily be convinced to abandon Penny, and with them rescued you can access the lamplight. Job done. There is literally no in-game benefit to also rescuing Penny. But it gets more murky yet, because Rory's an adult and you can't sneak him out the same way as the kids, he needs to escape through town, and attempting to get through will turn the whole town against both you and him, plus he almost never survives it regardless. Now you can set him free and tell him he's on his own, he'll get himself shot dead in seconds and Penny will leave, so you've basically led a man to his death in order to rescue a child. Is a child's freedom worth a man's life and do you have the right to make that decision? So the big moral quandary here seems to revolve around Rory. Now there's a part to this that John is quite conveniently leaving out of his argument here because it would undercut it somewhat, and that's the fact that Penny could still be convinced to leave without him. So much for leading a man to his death to save a child, eh? The way John presents it makes it sound as though it's necessary to free Rory in order to get Penny to leave. It gets worse yet, however. If you do free Rory, you can actually guarantee his freedom quite easily. Just tell him he's on his own, and immediately wait for one in-game hour using the rest function. Dude literally just teleports out. Kinda ruins that moral question just a bit, doesn't it? More so if you decide to wipe out the slavers before opening the box, because oftentimes, he just randomly dies anyways because of reasons, I guess. The situation is further contrived because the game won't allow you to buy Rory either. The problem is the fact that this character isn't actually a character. He's the epitome of a lazy plot device with literally no actual use or function. He exists solely to be a roadblock for freeing Penny and nothing more. Bethesda put basically no effort into this character, which is why he dies so easily, because they don't have anything for him to do. He doesn't actually do anything if he survives, and as a result, there's no reason to actually care about saving him or making sure he survives, which makes matters worse, as the whole point of freeing him should be for him to survive. If she cares about him so much that she won't leave without him, it kind of defeats the purpose if he just dies immediately, doesn't it? Honestly, the game basically treats him like a joke. He will thank you for freeing him, and says he owes you, then runs away and dies immediately. If he does survive, he just goes to Moriarty's, and he has one single line of dialogue, and hilariously, if Megaton is destroyed, he'll just teleport inside anyways. I expect this kind of low-effort garbage from a poorly made mod, not the actual developers of the game. This ties back into what I was saying earlier, too. This is exactly the same shit as Garza. Bethesda makes these characters so shallow that a goddamn plate has more depth than they do, and as a result, these characters don't have the impact they should, considering the level of importance the game is giving them. Oh no, this fucking useless Randy died, how tragic. You know, it really goes a long way to making the world feel shallow when it's built out of these throwaway characters. Or of course you could just gun down the entire town to make sure he gets free, but then is mass murder okay if the targets are slavers? I'm sorry, but you can't make this into a morally grey issue. We're not talking about a character who made a stupid decision as a result of a series of bad decisions, but at heart is a decent person. We're talking about the scum of the earth who run the entire slave trade in the capital wasteland. 
Eliminating these people will only result in a net positive, the wasteland becoming a safer place overall. There is no downside to it. If killing one scumfuck slaver is fine, why would killing all of them be bad? This isn't like the foot soldiers of the NCR and the Enclave like in New Vegas and Fallout 2 respectively. None of them show an inkling of remorse or regret, or a desire to change, and none of them try to surrender if you do attempt to wipe out Paradise Falls. Hell, even Caesar's Legion, which is known for its lack of proper development among the New Vegas factions, had the excuse of its members being raised and assimilated into Caesar's ideology from birth. What you don't even seem to realize is that your line of logic here can be applied elsewhere. Is mass murder okay if the targets are raiders? Is mass murder okay if the targets are super mutants? Is mass murder okay if the targets are the Enclave? Well shit, I guess the entire game gets a gold star for grey morality, because you can constantly engage in mass murder of various hostile and evil groups. And I guess every game with tons of killing all get a gold star too. I should remind you at this point that Fallout 3 is frequently criticised for poor story and writing when it has quests like that. This is what we call cherry picking. He picks out one quest with somewhat decent choice, and he oversells the fuck out of it to sound better and more complex than it is. As if this quest alone single-handedly debunks the criticism that Fallout 3 has poor writing. A drop of water in an ocean of piss changes nothing. Thing is, I can pull far many more cards in my favor for this point than you can. Agatha's Song is a quest about getting an item from a dungeon. The story is, her aunt lived in a vault, and Agatha just assumes they all died for some reason, even though she has no way of knowing this. Riley's Rangers is a quest about doing a dungeon to rescue a bunch of randies who got cornered by super mutants. Strictly Business is a quest about enslaving people. The Nuka-Cola Challenge is a quest about collecting balls of pop for a ridiculous cartoon character who is randomly obsessed with Nuka-Cola because reasons. Power of the Atom is about a guy who wants you to nuke a town for pretty much no reason. Superhuman Gambit is a gimmicky quest about two dipshit cosplayers. Granted, there is something of a moral choice here. Big Trouble in Big Town is about people who got kidnapped by mutants, and you have to rescue them from the mutants, then teach them to defend themselves from the mutants. Or not. It is one of the game's better quests, but it's more of a winner by default, rather than having any actual merit. Besides being one of the extremely few examples of actual skill checks in the game. Head of State asks if you want to help slavers do the big evil, and enslave escaped slaves, or you can instead help the slaves by killing the slavers, so they can live in an extremely dangerous area for basically no reason. What an amazingly deep moral choice. Either enslave people or kill slavers. Those is a quest about killing ants and deciding the fate of the kid. Two bad endings, one not so great ending, and one good ending. Conveniently, it also seems John has forgotten that poor story refers to the game's story not side quests. So looking at the entire main quest, which only has like two actual moral choices and the rest is just doing chores for other people. First quest is to find Dad. To do this you have to get the information from Moriarty, the only man in the entire world who knows where he went. There's a few options to do it and that's it. Second quest is to find Dad. To do this you have to talk to Three Dog. He asks you to do a dungeon for a quest item for him, or you can pass a speech check. Third quest is to find Dad. To do this, you talk to an obnoxious cunt who tells you to go to a dungeon, which is still somehow full of enemies that didn't cause any trouble for him. Fourth quest is to find Dad. To do this, you actually get a moral choice to make. Either torture innocent people or put them out of their misery. Again, another really hard moral choice with tons of depth. Fifth quest is to do chores for Dad so he can commit Sudoku for no reason. Then you do a dungeon. Sixth quest is to look at a terminal. Seventh quest is to get an item from a dungeon. Eighth quest is to talk to a computer in a dungeon. Ninth quest is to follow the murder bot while he murderizes everything in sight. And only at the very end do you have the choice to poison the water. Now the writing for the main story is absolute garbage too, but we'll get to that a bit later when John does. Point is, Rescue from Paradise being somewhat decent, 
does not negate the entire rest of the game. As far as any kind of moral quandary goes, which I remind everyone, John over-exaggerated its complexity and depth, Rescue from Paradise is probably one of the best quests in the game, and again, that's really not saying a whole lot. Oasis had something decent going on, but it ruined the moral decision by implying one option to be the best. Again, something I'll go into more detail on later when it comes up. Replicated Man is kinda alright as far as moral choice goes, though it's still a bit basic. Do you want to enslave this man or set him free? In fact, Fallout 3 has a lot of really interesting morally grey quests, but we'll get to them later. But for now, honestly, does that quest full of alternative solutions, dark themes, and grey moral questions sound antithetical to the very core of Fallout games? Now this is the big one. This is what I'd consider to be one of the absolute worst parts of his video, which is saying a lot because his video is full of disingenuous arguments, logical fallacies, misinformation, and twisting of the facts to suit himself. All of that is pretty shitty on its own. But now he's reached the point where he's outright misrepresenting another YouTuber in order to make him look stupid, because he criticized the game. As a quick recap, John started this entire segment by referring to Indigo Gaming's video on the Fallout series. And yet I keep hearing over and over that this is Fallout 3's weakness. And the vast majority of Fallout 3's quests are like this, though I'd like to skip forward to one particular quest, because one of the videos I watched that critiqued Fallout 3 was by a channel called Indigo Gaming, and they specifically called out trying to enter Little Lamplight as the peak of Bethesda's design choices, which, to quote the video, is antithetical to the very core of Fallout games. Now let's see what Indigo actually said. Bethesda had been moving toward tighter and more linear stories that continually pulled you toward your next objective. The stricter narrative and forced scenario design proved antithetical to the very core of Fallout games. Peaking in one of the more notorious mainline quests, which leads you through a fort manned by children. Hold it right there, mister! Don't take another step, or we'll blow your fucking head off! The only options were to convince them through having a high speech skill, having a particular perk, or performing the quest they demand you to do. You are mystically stripped of any intimidation or combat capabilities while in Little Lamplight, breaking immersion and disappointing fans of the original games, where one could threaten, kill, or attack anything in the wasteland without limitation, but not without consequence. So after John references Indigo's video, he goes on to list the same ways you can enter Lamplight as Indigo did. He then goes on a tangent about why Bethesda made the choice for children to be unkillable. Then he says he doesn't understand the point of the objection to unkillable children, demonstrating a fundamental misunderstanding of not only the criticisms against these games, but why the originals and New Vegas were so loved in the first place. And from there he goes on a tangent about an entirely different quest, listing its moderate amount of choice off, and again, overselling Rescue from Paradise to seem as though it's deeper than it is, he reincorporates Indigo's quote verbatim, as if he just disproved what Indigo said. It's a really sly and dirty move. John took Indigo Gaming's quote and applied it to an entirely different part of the game than what he referenced, and additionally, removed the context of what he said exactly and why he was saying it. Indigo was 100% correct here, and John couldn't refute that point about Lamplight itself, so in order to debunk this criticism against Fallout 3, he had to use a different part of the game. This is where I think it's important to consider the motivation behind videos like this, because it is incredibly dishonest to pull shit like this, and it gives me the impression that John was simply more interested in defending the game, rather than honestly looking at criticism and seeing what was valid and what wasn't. Let's actually compare that to Fallout 1, and a somewhat similar quest also about breaking someone out of captivity, rescuing Tandy. The Fallout 1 quest all happens in a single stage, where you can kill all of the Khans, offer to buy her, use a speech check to secure her release, challenge the leader to a one-on-one -on -one unarmed duel, kill just the nearest guards to her and either lockpick the cell or use explosives to blow off the door, or there's a ludicrously unlikely joke solution involving Luck 9 and some other very specific conditions. Rescue from Paradise does not seem all that different to me. Plenty of the same options are available. Buying them, removing the guard from the immediate area to allow the prisoners to sneak out, just taking out the entire 
entire camp. Sure, there's some cool stuff in Fallout 1's quest, like using explosives to blow off the door, but I prefer some of the stuff in Fallout 3's iteration too. You can't just use a speech check to get the kids free, because it would be unrealistic that an experienced leader of slavers could be talked into handing over slaves for no charge. Plus, Fallout 3's version has the interesting dilemma of when you cut your losses and start leaving slaves behind, because getting all of them out alive is almost impossible. To me, it's a great little quest, and complaining that it's not fallouty y because you can't kill a child to skip it is downright weird. It's actually quite easy, as I already explained. And if you're lacking skills somewhere, you can go earn a level or two, then come back. It's also not weird at all to want to skip it. Firstly, it allows player freedom and immersion. Secondly, it is absolutely normal the players might want to skip certain quests for whatever reason they might have especially a quest where you're stripped of violent options. And again, describing it as killing a child to skip a quest is a mischaracterization of the complaint. Furthermore, unlike Lamplight, Fallout 1 never forces you to help Shady Sands and rescue Tandy. Fallout 1 doesn't force you to help anyone along the main quest line. On top of this, Tandy's rescue actually has an effect on the ending slides. The point being, Lamplight isn't followed -y because of some false notion that Rescue from Paradise lacks options to break the slaves out. Rather, it's that unlike the Tandy quest, you must address it to progress, and are forced to address it in a specific way. It's also worth remembering that killing children in the older Fallout games was a terrible idea. It made everyone hate you more, generated bounty hunters to hunt you down, and provided no benefit whatsoever. The only reason you'd ever do it was if you were roleplaying as an evil character. And yet the same people who complain you can't do this in Fallout 3 are often the ones who are complaining about how stupid the choices are in Power of the Atom because blowing up Megaton is evil for its own sake, makes everyone hate you, and generates bounty hunters to come after you. It's actually pretty impressive that someone could say so much that just isn't true. First of all, John doesn't have any actual data on who is making what complaints. He can't back up such a generalized claim that people who want child killing also complain about Power of the Atom, because even if you can find some people who do, they're not representative of critics overall. Secondly, even if they were the same people, these are not contradictory positions in any way, shape, or form. Remember what I was saying earlier, about narrative choice and gameplay choice? John is absolutely conflating the two here. As explained earlier, nuking Megaton is a narrative choice. It's not something you decide to do purely on your own. It's something you're not only encouraged to do, but are in fact, paid for. As such, it needs better narrative reasoning than, because reasons, lol. Killing children is something the player would choose to do purely of their own free will. Let's do a quick rework of the Megaton nuke. Let's strip the quest out entirely, and let's say you still have the option to set the nuke off from a safe distance away. Now, doing so would be purely the choice of the player. I have an example of this too. In Fallout 2, you're tasked with shutting down the Gecko power plant, because it's contaminating Vault City's water supply. Now you have the option of causing the plant to melt down, but no one tells you to do this. It's something you can figure out for yourself and choose to do entirely on your own. Now I'm not saying that every massively evil choice must be total player freedom. The issue with Power of the Atom in that regard is that it doesn't go far enough one way or the other. Bethesda wanted a nukeable town because of the rule of cool, but instead of letting the player discover this on their own, they decide to put it into a quest so it's basically impossible to miss. But then, the problem with that, is how shallow the entire quest is. You commit this atrocious act for quite literally no narrative reason. Finally, John is wrong about the consequences as well. Nuking Megaton does not make everyone hate you. Liam Neeson is mildly disappointed, and Three Dog speculates it was you and shit talks you. No one else gives a fuck. It also doesn't cause bounty hunters to come after you. The resulting karma loss has the possibility of doing so, but that's a function of the karma system, and not the quest itself. If it was due to the quest, they would pursue you regardless of your karma levels. But if you nuke Megaton with maximum karma, or if you neutralize it after the fact, which is extremely easy to do, then the bounty hunters do not come after you. 
Anyway, we'll discuss some more quests later, but let's get back to Megaton. Yeah, so let's get back to Megaton, because I'm not done taking the bat to it. I want to talk a bit more about that. You see, Megaton is a brilliant Fallout town because if you go exploring, there's so much there, which is very much in the tradition of classic Fallout, where any town is likely to have one main quest, but exploring and speaking to everybody leads to many more. Megaton is particularly worthy of praise, however, because some of the stuff hidden away there is very subtle and easy to miss. So, sure, everyone will find power of the atom in following in his footsteps, but a woman who does absolutely nothing to draw attention to herself in the bar will give you a letter to deliver to her brother if you speak to her, kicking off blood ties. Yes, this is something that all of these games do. Megaton isn't particularly worthy of praise for that. This is another thing that really bugs me about these in defense of type videos. The people making them have to take basic things and really stretch to make them sound far more important or better than they actually are. In this case, why is Megaton particularly worthy of praise for doing something the other games did as well? Shouldn't this be the baseline for creating towns and quests in these games? Average, completely unassuming NPCs could have quests available, because they're normal people, who potentially have issues that need solving. Bethesda did this with their Elder Scrolls games too, so why does Megaton deserve any kind of special praise for something that the other games did? This isn't special or unique. Not to mention, you could get blood ties without talking to Lucy West. Or if you go into the doctor's back office, you can find a holotape about an escaped synth that kicks off the replicated man early. And the replicated man is a particularly fascinating quest because it has no quest markers. The game simply prompts you to learn about the escaped synth, and it's up to you to figure out who would be the most likely people to show an interest in a runaway android seeking a medical procedure, whether that's doctors, engineers, or those sympathetic to his cause. So first of all, this isn't starting the replicated man early. It's literally the design of the quest to start in this fashion. There are holotapes all over the place in the game that relate to this quest, and picking up any one of them will start it. Secondly, the reason there are no quest markers is likely due to the fact there are simply so many NPCs you can talk to in order to gain information. For example, numerous doctors can be talked to for this quest, so the game can't really point to a dozen different NPCs all at once. I mean, it can but it's totally unnecessary when you could talk to almost any doctor in the game. Third, the whole investigation aspect falls a bit flat once you realize there's three of these holotapes and megaton alone, and that's all you really need for that part of the quest. Finally, there's supposedly a big manhunt going on, thanks to the slavers of Paradise Falls knowing about this synth, thanks to the information on their holotapes, but this isn't actually shown anywhere in the game, with characters in the world. If they were truly searching for him, there should be groups of slavers or freelance bounty hunters out and about looking for him, but there are none. Just another aspect of Bethesda saying things are happening in their game world, but not showing them. And then there's the tiny quest helping Walter fix some leaking pipes. Yeah, literally a waste of time chore. Why the fuck are you bringing up this as a positive? I don't play RPGs or games in general to do pointless menial tasks. What's worse is that Fallout 4 took this idea and turned it into a full-on named quest. We're discovering from an authority figure in town that Leo Stahl has a drug problem and I'm helping him or exploiting it to your advantage. The reason I'm listing these, by the way, is because this is Fallout 3's first town. You step out of the training area and two minutes later you're here and you immediately have access to four major named quests if you can find them, all of which send you off in different directions if you want to follow them, plus the Wasteland Survival Guide and three smaller unmarked quests. Just for comparison, Fallout 1's first town, Shady Sands, again accessed straight after leaving the vault, has one major quest, Stop the Rad Scorpions, two associated sub-quests related to acquiring poison sacks from the Rad Scorpions in order to make an antidote, and other than that, there are just two sub-quests, one to recruit Ian, either via speech or payment, and improving their agriculture, which has a single solution, a science check. When you put the two side by side, it just makes me utterly baffled that people complain Fallout 3 was too linear or a break from classic Fallout, because it just doesn't seem to match up with the facts. Now he's cherry picking again. Notice how he singles out Fallout 1 here and completely ignores Fallout 2 in New Vegas? Yeah, that's by design, because they contradict his point. So apparently this needs to be explained, but Fallout 1 was a small game made by a small team and as a result it was a bit limited in what it could accomplish. It should go without saying 
the sequel should seek to improve upon the foundation that the original built, which is exactly what Fallout 2 and New Vegas both did. Fallout 3 in many ways is a regression. John is also kind of inventing stuff out of thin air to defend the game. The amount of quests available in the first town was never a criticism against this game, and this does not in any way change how linear the main story is, nor does the amount of available quests in the first town disprove the idea that Fallout 3 is a break from classic Fallout. It initially sounds good as a defense for the game, but if you think about it a little bit, you see that it doesn't actually disprove any criticism, nor is it strictly a positive about the game. Additionally, none of the major quests you can get from Megaton rely on its continued existence, as already mentioned, and its unmarked quests are extremely short and trivial. Megaton should be a major hub town, but it can't have the level of importance it should because Bethesda was too lazy to write a version of Megaton that didn't get destroyed. That's part of why the town as a whole is so shallow and why there are no quests that really require the town to exist. Because the developers made that uncomfortable realization that including such a choice would result in the players missing out on content, something Bethesda has generally tried to avoid after Morrowind, because god fucking forbid your game has replayability. New Vegas, on the other hand, was fine with making you eat the consequences of your actions, either reload a save or persist in the doomed timeline you've created. Anyway, that's enough on Megaton. How long have we been going on? Oh, blimey, right. Let's move on. So, the game now directs us east, down to the DC ruins, to find our way to the GNR. Now, one thing many people seem to hate is Fallout 3's metro tunnels. You'll be delighted to hear I'm not about to try and convince you they're great. Ultimately, the lack of distinctive features and Fallout 3's relatively small pool of enemy types that spawn in the tunnels makes them hard to distinguish from each other and more confusing to navigate than they should be. However, I do think they serve an important purpose. Specifically, they represent the least bad solution to a problem that New Vegas would go on to have. So speaking of New Vegas, do any of you have any particularly strong feelings about the city ruins around the eastern outskirts of New Vegas? Probably not. They're just sort of... there. There's a few landmarks there, the Mole Rat Ranch, for example. Nothing special. It's just an area you pass through. Because it's so easy to pass through, it honestly makes the wider Vegas area feel a bit... small. The Metro Tunnels, meanwhile, are part of one of Fallout 3's cleverest conjuring tricks. You see, the actual area that you can explore within the DC ruins is pretty limited, but by choosing to have it as isolated islands, it feels huge and can hide little areas away. In fact, I'd wager decent money that even if you've played plenty of Fallout 3, you might never have been to the Tacoma area, as it's hidden away along a line that can only be accessed from a station tucked away behind a heavily irradiated crater. But if you do find your way there, there's a shop with some unique items, and also there's an artillery cannon, which you can use to bombard a super mutant behemoth. And it's just hidden away as a little easter egg, a reward for exploring. That sort of hidden area wouldn't be possible if the city was just opened ruined blocks like in New Vegas. And it's why I think the metro tunnels actually have an important purpose. I'm not going to try to convince you they're great, but here's all the reasons they're great. This seems to be another false equivalence. Both DC and the outer Vegas ruins were a victim of time constraints, but the difference is the time spent on both areas as well as the overall games. Bethesda originally wanted DC to be fully explorable. The reason we have these islands of content is due to them realizing they didn't have the time to fully complete the area. However, they still clearly put a lot of development time into these areas. For the city to be little more than one massive dungeon with only a couple quests inside of it, and a few points of interest. Obsidian, on the other hand, left the outer ruins of Vegas as little more than burned out shells of buildings, something that's fairly quick to do. However, their focus on actual content really shows. New Vegas has about 70 side quests, as opposed to Fallout 3's pathetic 18. New Vegas has a big main story, with faction choice and decent choice in most of those quests as opposed to Fallout 3's overly linear main story, with just two major choices. Also, I've never heard anyone say they play the game for the Easter eggs. Yeah, they're neat, but they're not substantive content. Personally, I would have preferred a DC that is even more stripped back if it meant the game having more quests, but I suppose I also would have preferred the game to be good as well. 
They also form part of another thing that I think Fallout 3 does well, arguably better than New Vegas, and that's variety of landscape. Much of New Vegas takes place in pretty much one biome, rocky orange scrubland with cliffs dotted around to create natural barriers. It doesn't matter if you're on the south near Nipturn, west near Good Springs, north of Vegas, or east by Nelson. The landscape is broadly identical, with the exceptions of the canyon that the Colorado runs through, which isn't really used for anything, and the tiny area in the mountains that leads up to Jacobstown. So, this may be a bit of a shocker, but New Vegas is actually based on a real place in the real world. There is special care taking to make the Mojave look similar to the real thing. Some of the developers even visited the real-world town of Good Springs. The Capital Wasteland doesn't quite get the same excuse. It's loosely based on a real place, and due to the fact it's not a literal desert, Bethesda could have made it much more varied, but they didn't. Most of the Capital Wasteland looks very similar as well. All you've got really is the city and... well, everything else, which largely looks the same. Thing is, I don't necessarily think a game absolutely needs distinct biomes, at least if it's based on the real world. Even removing New Vegas from the equation, I think it actually makes total sense that a game world would be one biome if your game takes place in a real world setting that actually looks that way. So we emerge from the tunnels and run straight into a confrontation between two of the most important groups in the game, the Super Mutants and the Brotherhood of Steel. And that means now is an excellent time to discuss some of the big players in the story. Let's start off with the mutants, and I want to start by pointing out that Fallout 3 does a phenomenal job introducing the mutants. You see, down in the metro tunnels, there's a good chance you'll run into your first one. So far, you've just been fighting ghouls and raiders, basically humanoid creatures of a normal size. And then you come around the corner in a smoky tunnel, and there's a silhouette in the distance, blocking your path at the end of the tunnel of a huge figure. It's a hell of an entrance! Well, actually... There's a good chance most players' first encounters with the Super Mutants will be across from the river from the metro entrance they're directed to from Megaton. They're not there initially, but they seem to spawn in once you're across from them. If it weren't for that, however, I would initially agree. Seeing a hulking shadow at the end of the tunnel is a cool fucking entrance. Except that it's ruined by the way this game handles the Super Mutants, which we'll get to shortly. It's lovely and it's followed up by letting you fight them in big numbers around GNR with some assistance from the Brotherhood. And after that, you're on your own. The next time you run into the Super Mutants will be when you emerge from the museum station and you see the mole for the first time, converted into a battlefield with Super Mutants patrolling the trenches and fortified positions. It's just a great escalation of threats. Fighting them. Just... fighting them. I'm really glad Bethesda brought in this unique group for them to function as nothing more than generic enemies. Real creative fucking move there, Bethesda. Anyway, let's talk about the mutants overall, because I have seen them mentioned as a disappointment, and this seems to be because people don't see the mutants as interesting and complicated, next to how they were in Fallout 1. And Fallout 2. In fact, they are probably far deeper in Fallout 2, which makes their fall here that much more frustrating. Just because you've never played it, the original mutants were created as part of a plan referred to as the Unity. Humans will be converted to mutants because humans were unsuited to surviving in the wasteland, partly because they were just physically frail and vulnerable to radiation, and partly because they were constantly bickering amongst themselves. A single group of hardy mutants might have a better chance. It's a really great story for the mutants, because the Master has a point. We do repeatedly in Fallout 1 see different groups of humans fighting each other and struggling to survive in the wastelands. The mutants of Fallout 1 also aren't brutes. They have a plan, they have leaders, they have human allies who are helping them, they set patrols, they can maintain a military base in working order, they challenge intruders, they follow orders. In short, they're a society that has structure and a goal, and while it's different, a case can be made that they're not the bad guys. And accordingly, the Master can't be talked out of his plan by telling him it's wrong. The only thing that talks him down is providing proof that his mutant army is sterile, and thus his unity, if ever accomplished, would be a dead end that inevitably dies out in the long term. By comparison, many were disappointed by the mutants in Fallout 3, who initially seem almost more like orcs. They hang up gore bags, they yell short, poorly formed sentences, they run at you screaming with a board with a nail in it. They don't seem like a society, they just seem like animals. Yes, all of this is pretty accurate. Good job. 
As a random side note, I've been criticized before for not highlighting parts that I agree with, and this is exactly why. If there's something I agree with, I can't really expand on it now, can I? However, in this particular case, it was important to acknowledge. And I think that interpretation is wrong, and that there's actually some really interesting stuff going on just below the surface with the mutants of Fallout 3. You see, I think the mutants actually have a very tragic story. What we see in Fallout 3 is Richard Gray's worst nightmare, and it's entirely consistent with Fallout 1. Now that's a bold statement. Also, why switch to calling him Richard Gray? That's like casually referring to Caesar as Edward Sallow. It just comes across as someone flexing that they know the lore, which I find a bit funny as he just claimed Fallout 3 super mutants are entirely consistent with Fallout 1. You see, the idea of Super Mutants being big, dumb brutes wasn't a Fallout 3 invention, it's absolutely in Fallout 1, most famously in the case of Harry, but Richard Gray's diary makes it very clear that most mutants are very stupid. In fact, to quote Richard Gray, The few wanderers that have found their way here have been a disappointment to me. They can't seem to mutate correctly. The best I've been able to create are some big and dumb mutants. Most can recall nothing from before I initiated them into the wondrous unity. But it's not as obvious in Fallout 1, because most of the mutants don't speak at all, they just shoot you on sight. But given Harry's entire team is characterised as stupid, it seems reasonable to suggest that actually, the vast majority of Fallout 1 mutants are roughly of Harry's intelligence. So why do the Fallout 1 mutants have a functioning society, but the Fallout 3 mutants don't? Mostly it's down to leadership. Fallout 1's mutants are led by Richard Gray, and by the extremely small number of mutants who maintain their intelligence, like the Lieutenant. The Fallout 3 mutants have a small number of intelligent super mutants as well, in the form of Forks and Uncle Leo, but rather than becoming leaders, they were locked away or driven out. It's Fallout 1 society flipped on its head, and it's tragic. It's not tragic, it's fucking stupid. John is trying really hard here to twist the situation to defend this game, and he's leaving out a key detail, because his argument here is completely invalidated by it. John tries to make it sound like the dumb super mutants are the typical result of FEV exposure, and what we have in Fallout 3 is a result of a feedback loop of stupidity. However, it is explicitly explained what the difference is in the original game. Tainted humans. The Master and Lieutenant both have differing theories. One believes radiation interferes with the mutation, and the other believes a tank of FEV burst when the bombs dropped making it airborne and affecting everyone in an extremely minor way, and as a result, having a slight resistance to it. This is why a major part of the Master's plan is cracking vaults, because they represent the solution to his problem, untainted humans being dipped, resulting in superior super mutants. Now with all that in mind, let's look at Fallout 3. Where do the super mutants come from? A vault. And what were vaults meant to do? Protect pre-war people from the nukes. Now maybe the Master was wrong about vault dwellers. Maybe him and Lieutenant were pure luck of the draw, and stupid super mutants really are the norm. Well, in Fallout 1 there's an extra ending if you decide to join the Master, which confirms his theory, as the ending says you become one of his best men. So why did Vault 87's residents all turn dumb? Well, information from outside the game clarifies that it's a different strain of FEV than what's at Mariposa. Likely because Bethesda's hack writers didn't know better and their fuck-up had to be corrected after the fact. The lack of leadership argument is weak regardless, because the Master is a product of the FEV as well. There's no good reason within the game that the Vault 87 super mutant should be in the state we see them in as they all would have been pure humans as well, which means they should have been smart super mutants. Beyond Fallout 1, Fallout 2 and New Vegas confirm that there are plenty of smart mutants beyond the Master and Lieutenant. Jacobstown and Broken Hills both have loads of mutants that are not only friendly to the player character, but are fully capable of having regular conversations with the player. In fact, we should have seen an entirely different super mutant society as a result of not having a master of their own. Maybe one in which the highly intelligent super mutants form the elite, and the dumb super mutants are used for the grunt work and combat. But no, instead we get orcs that want to kill everything on sight. 
creatures that were envisioned as the next step for humanity instead embrace anti-intellectualism and drive out the few people who might actually be able to save them, regressing over time to a state where they start hanging up gore bags. And yet there's a lot more to the super mutants than even that, because they're actually grappling with the exact same problem that the Master couldn't bear to contemplate in Fallout 1, how to reproduce and survive. The situation with the Master is far more complex than John is giving it credit for. It's not an issue he couldn't bear to contemplate, it was the guilt of his actions that weighed heavily on him. He tells you this directly. The Master doesn't kill himself because his mutants can't reproduce. It's because of the lives ruined and the people killed, all in service of a futile goal. But it cannot be. This would mean that... All my work... ...has been for... Nothing. Everything that I've tried to... A, a failure! It can't be... Can be... be. be. I don't think that I can continue. continue to have done the things I have done in the name of progress and healing. It was madness. I can see that now. Madness. Madness? There is no hope. Leave now. Leave while you still have hope. What John's describing here isn't even all that deep. They shunned intelligence and got dumber as a result. Now they're out of FEV. That's a little more than a bare-bones excuse for them to act this way and for them to be out and about in the world. It's nothing more than the absolute bare minimum to try and force them to make sense for being in the game. Because they did need some official story reason, rather than just nothing at all. Don't believe me? Fallout 4's inclusion of super mutants is even more contrived. I'm probably gonna fucking shoot myself if I have to talk extensively about Fallout 4 any further, but let me just say, the super mutants in that game are all apparently made by the Institute, who waste energy they don't have to teleport scores of them to the surface, which actively endanger their own surface missions as a result. And somehow, the super mutants there have super mutant dogs, even though there's no mention of any creation method for them, and on top of all that, the super mutants in that game are equally as stupid and violent as the ones in Fallout 3, for just no reason, and they have no goals. Just like Richard Gray, they create new mutants by dipping humans in the green stuff, as you can overhear in Vault 87, forced evolutionary vats which aren't seen in game but are mentioned on several terminals, and they're empty. This is Richard Gray's nightmare, a mutant population unable to reproduce, dwindling away, an evolutionary dead end. You do realize that saying these things are the master's nightmare doesn't automatically make them deep, nor does it invalidate criticism, right? You aren't even addressing the criticism itself. Like all of this is just background information at absolute best. There is no actual narrative here. There are no payoffs. It's just orcs in an eternal blood rage but they've been reskinned to be Fallout themed, like just about everything else in this game. Is it really that hard to understand why fans of the original games would find this frustrating? You have this deep and complex group in the original game, expanded upon and given more depth in the second, and reduced to screeching generic enemies in the third game, all with the depth of a mud puddle. If they were going to fundamentally change what Super Mutants were, why not just make something entirely new instead of completely bastardizing them. As Mr. Caption said in his videos, we haven't ever seen creatures that act this way in Fallout before. It's already something new, but they applied it to an existing group and made them worse as a direct result. Seriously, just take the Fallout 3 Super Mutants and imagine they had a visual design entirely unrelated to Super Mutants and they're called something else instead, but they all act the same. Is anything lost as a direct result? Well, no. If anything, it would preserve the super mutants as we know them from the original games, and we'd have this entirely new type of creature. It would be like if Elder Scrolls 6 came out, and Argonians were just randomly used as generic enemies, and there's only two in the entire game that are friendly. 
That's what the Vault 87 mutants are, but it's worse than that, because the mutants are trying to fix it, but without the benefit of the few intelligent super mutants that do exist that might have been able to help them. You see, to survive, they need two things. More humans and more FEV. Humans aren't hard to get hold of, and that explains the large number of human captives you'll find everywhere, but the FEV is a little bit more tricky. Now, if you visit the Vault Tech headquarters in DC, there are mutants inside it attacking the robots. Why would they want to access Vault Tech? Because they need to find more vaults. Because they're looking for more FEV, because they think FEV comes from vaults. Except the whole thing's a rather tragic doomed mission, because we know for a fact there is no FEV in the other vaults. The mutants have spent years combing the DC ruins and the waste for more vaults, and even if they ever found one, they wouldn't get what they needed. They are, quite simply, facing an extinction level event, and what happens in Fallout 3 is irrelevant. Natural wastage would finish them off eventually anyway, but they persevere, clinging to the hope that if they just smash a bit harder, they can survive. In some ways, it's one of the saddest stories in Fallout 3. Man, it's really too bad we didn't get that story in any significant way. Again, all of this is background detail at best. You could play through the entire game and not learn any of this at all, because doing so requires you to actually sneak around and listen to every conversation these guys have, and there's a good chance that these specific conversations won't play. Even if there are interesting ideas here, that doesn't mean the execution is any good, and that's the problem. The idea that these super mutants are the Master's worst nightmare doesn't mean a whole lot when the game itself does nothing in any way, shape, or form to really address it, or put any kind of focus on it, assuming that really was the intention, which I have no reason to believe it is. I mean, it's a lose-lose situation for Bethesda here regardless. Either this was a lazy bullshit excuse by the developers to shove super mutants into this game, or they had this deep idea to do the inverse of the Master's Army, resulting in a tragic end, but did absolutely fucking nothing with it, and all elements of it are relegated to dialogue between creatures that are permanently hostile, so in order to even get this information, you have to sneak around and wait for them to spew the necessary dialogue for this to be something you can actually learn, and even when you do learn it, it means nothing. There's nothing you can do with this information. It's irrelevant to the player. It's just like in Fallout 4, how they have the set piece to give Kellogg's backstory after you've already killed him, so there's basically nothing to gain from seeing it. What's even worse is that there's actually next to no lines from the super mutants about the green stuff. In fact, there's only two lines that I could find talking about the green stuff at all. An idle chatter line that simply says, no green stuff here, and a conversation line between super mutants where one says, have you found the green stuff? I haven't found any. Ever. Maybe it's a lie. Maybe we're wasting our time. We could be out killing. In fact, it seems as though a lot of the information about what the super mutants are doing comes from the same game guide referenced earlier. Again, this is information that should be in the game by default. You shouldn't need third-party material to understand the game, and since much of this information comes from outside the game itself, it can be entirely disregarded. We're talking about the game, not a book that tries to make the game make more sense. And if it doesn't come from the game guide, then most of what John just described is total inference at absolute best. There's nothing in the game that specifies they're looking for vaults, and just because he found super mutants in Vault Tech headquarters, that doesn't mean they're searching for vaults specifically, especially since they can be found all over the place. Germantown Police Station isn't a vault, the Statesman Hotel isn't a vault, the Jefferson Memorial isn't a vault, the Capitol Building isn't a vault. The idea that they're looking for vaults specifically is another invention of John's. In fact, I think there's actually another interesting echo in the Super Mutant story that fits too well to be a mere coincidence. You see, the mutants in Fallout 3 came from a vault, Vault 87, where, based on the accounts of other Wastelanders, they previously had mostly stayed, with mutant activity in the DC ruins massively escalating only in recent years. And the only reason they left was because a crucial bit of pre-war Vault Tech kit that the Vault depended on stopped working for them. As a result, 
They left their vault and headed east, looking for other vaults or information that might lead them there, with a focus on locating vault tech data that could lead them to another vault, because they desperately need to access a particular liquid for their survival. All sound a tiny bit familiar by any chance. Yeah, the mutants are on their own fallout quest, locating their own water chip, their own waters of life. It's just that their waters of life happen to be green. Oh, give me a break. This is nothing but pure speculation and inference at absolute best. As I just described, the game goes nowhere near that deep, and there's nothing substantial to back this idea up. Describing things as vaguely as a bit of pre-war vault tech kit and a particular liquid makes it extremely clear that this is a massive stretch coupled with loads of speculation to fit a narrative. In the same manner, I can argue that the Prim Powder Ganger conflict is an analogy for the Shady Sands Cont conflict because a small promising town out in the country is held back by a group of raiders. I can go even further by pointing out a particular government official gets kidnapped by the raiders and the player can rescue them. Here's what we've actually got. Fault 87 had FEV. They started turning people into super mutants. Some of them got free and took control of the vault and turned everyone else. They then became an issue for the Capital Wasteland for the next 200 years, kidnapping people and turning them into more super mutants. At some point in recent history, they were running low on FEV and started searching for more. And also, these mutants are incredibly stupid and aggressive because reasons. That's it. That's all there is to them. Even the idea that they head east is a tenuous connection at best. Another example of, it sounds good, and it's somewhat accurate, so throw it into the script. Just to point out, the DC ruins are southeast of Vault 87, and there's nothing west of Vault 87. Oh, and what happens when an outside power discovers the location of their vault? Why, the lone wanderer heads straight there and murders everyone inside it. In Fallout 3, you are the mutant's bad ending. In short, the super mutants are a lot more interesting than big, dumb baddies. Yet more false framing of the situation. The Lone Wanderer doesn't go straight to Vault 87 because they've learned the super mutants are there. They go for the Gek. The Master sends his super mutants to Vault 13 immediately to conquer it, to take its pure humans and convert them to his master race. This also nicely highlights the double standard John uses when it's convenient to him. Earlier, when it was convenient to his argument, he explained how you can just run away from the first guard in Vault 101, that killing them isn't necessary in any way. However, that line of reasoning becomes incredibly inconvenient now that he's trying to show how Vault 87 is something of a parallel to Vault 13. So rather than acknowledging that you can get the Gek without killing any super mutants, he talks as though it's an absolute fact that the Lone Wanderer just outright fucking exterminates them. Ultimately, there is one problem with this whole argument that trumps everything else. As I've already said, this is all background information that does not address the point as a whole. John has provided a lot of backstory about the super mutants, some of which derived entirely from speculation. Even if we assume the Super Mutants do have this tragic backstory that mirrors the plot of Fallout 1, how exactly does this address the criticism of them being orcs? You can't interact with them, save a whole two characters. Unless you count eavesdropping, there's no dialogue with them. Their only town is a dungeon. Functionally, the Super Mutants are nothing but generic enemies for the player to kill. No amount of lore or headcanon changes that. Fallout 1, 2, and New Vegas all have characters that grant a lot of insight into the super mutants. Fallout 2 in particular had the town of Broken Hills, which showed off the very human element to the mutants, as well as their integration with the rest of society. Even ignoring the lore of Fallout 2, we had loads of quests, dialogue, and even the first mutant follower in the series. With all this in mind, how is it not clear that the super mutants of Fallout 3 are a total step down? So let's move on to the other side of that coin. The one faction I've most often seen raised as a problem with Fallout 3, 
the Brotherhood of Steel. Now to some people the Brotherhood are a big problem and it seems to boil down to one big issue. The Brotherhood now acts in a more overtly benevolent and open fashion that feels strangely at odds with how the Brotherhood used to act in classic Fallout. Now I'd like to address these points directly, because I'm not really sure they stand up to any scrutiny. Firstly, the Brotherhood has not changed, because this isn't the Brotherhood. And I don't just mean because this is an independent cell acting alone in a hostile environment nearly 3,000 miles from Brotherhood Command, though that is true. I mean that they literally aren't the Brotherhood anymore, and the game explicitly says this. Ah yes, the group that calls themselves the Brotherhood of Steel, follows their command structure and naming conventions, wears the armor they're most well associated with, and is literally a chapter of the Brotherhood, aren't actually the Brotherhood. It makes total sense. I mean that they literally aren't the Brotherhood anymore, and the game explicitly says this. Lions directly refused orders, and so the West Coast cut us off. No communications, no reinforcements. That's not really proof that this isn't the Brotherhood, though. Sure, they're cut off from the main group, but as explained, they still follow the same command structure and doctrine for the most part. And in case that was too subtle, they even added in the Outcasts, a faction that left specifically because Lions wasn't following standard Brotherhood operating procedure. This isn't some lazy retcon, this is a small group that in one particular time, in one particular set of circumstances, made the choice to be something slightly different, and they've had to accept the loss of their friends and being ostracised from their own order to pay for that change. Yeah, and this is totally ass backwards. The Brotherhood and the Outcasts in this game operate on opposite sides from what they should be. Lion's Brotherhood should be the Outcasts, because the main faction has literally disowned them, and the outcasts, as they are in-game, should be the true Brotherhood faction, and maybe given some more depth. I think fans of the original games would have far less issue if simply the names were reversed, that Lion's Outcast Brotherhood are more open, and don't act like the Brotherhood typically does. Because to any fan of the original games, it comes across as really fucking weird for the Brotherhood to be this altruistic group who want to purge the evils of the world and not be the xenophobic technophiles they've been portrayed as previously. Also, this is much the same issue as the super mutants. If you're going to go so far as to fundamentally change a group or faction, why not just make something new instead of ruining something by trampling over the previous games? So let's actually examine how much has changed in Lion's Brotherhood, because I think that's massively overstated. You see, older Fallout fans will probably expect the Fallout 3 Brotherhood to lock themselves in a secure location which they refuse to allow you access to, but that's exactly what they do. Right, as opposed to just camping out in the open with no defenses. Why would any major group not hold some kind of secure location if it was an option? Also, you were just saying that this isn't the Brotherhood, but now you're trying to claim they still do all the things the Brotherhood do? Are you trying to prove this by making the most tenuous and superficial comparison you possibly could? So which is it? Is this the Brotherhood or isn't it? As for the whole not letting outsiders in part, I'm not sure you're aware, but it's like standard procedure for military groups to not allow access to civilians, and especially in the post-apocalypse, it makes sense for just about any group to find a secure location and generally not allow randos in. No, seriously. How is the fact they've locked themselves in a secure location and disallow access in both Fallout 1 and 3 even an argument? What, are you going to say they're similar for using power armor next? What about doors? The Brotherhood in Fallout 1 used doors, and the Brotherhood in Fallout 3 used doors too! Checkmate critics! There really isn't all that much difference between them after all! It's pretty clear that John is once again stretching these details to a pretty extreme degree to defend this garbage. Just like in Fallout 1, they occasionally send out kill teams to hit super mutant positions if it's advantageous to them. You really are stretching for every little positive you can get, aren't you? No one ever said that the Brotherhood is completely different in every way ever. I made the joke about them using doors in both games, but at this point I'm afraid he might actually make that argument. Though being slightly more open than previous situations of the Brotherhood, they still treat outsiders with suspicion and disdain. Is this the idiot who blew our ambush? I'm just kind of at a loss for words here. What the fuck is your argument? Your proof for the Brotherhood treating outsiders with suspicion and disdain. 
is to play a clip of a character being annoyed that you ruined their ambush? That's not even remotely close to what suspicion and disdain towards an outsider looks like. Literally anyone in that setting would be pissed about you ruining their ambush. It's something that had the narrative potential to get one or all of them killed if things didn't go their way. And we see one of their soldiers dead in an alleyway after the ruined ambush. They're clearly in a life or death situation. But to put another nail in this coffin, if they really were so distrustful of you and hated you so much, then why the fuck would they just allow you to follow them to GNR if you had the potential to ruin more of their combat engagements? The super mutants have overrun our brothers at the Galaxy News radio building, and we're headed there to back them up. You can tag along if you want, but keep your head down and try not to do anything stupid. The real brotherhood would have told you to fuck off and go play in radioactive waste, not serve as a glorified escort team to your destination. A new recruit? Just a stray we picked up. The one that blundered into the uglies over on 42nd. Welcome! Knight Finley at your service. What can I do for you? Pleased to meet you. Welcome to the Galaxy News Radio Outpost. I'm Sergeant Wilkes, and I'm in charge here. What brings you into the D.C. area? Sure, good luck to you. Welcome, friend. My brothers may be gruff, but they will lay down their lives for you. Oh yeah, I can really feel that disdain. But that's not all, folks. I have proof that John's claim isn't even accurate, because this version of the Brotherhood specifically recruits outsiders. Initiate Redden is referred to as such by Sarah Lyons herself, and even then, she's not a unique case. We've got too many local conscripts as it is. Most are undertrained and too damn trigger-happy for their own good. Our very own Initiate Redden is a sterling example. And there's also just a weird little coincidence that in both Fallout 3 and New Vegas, you access the Brotherhood bunker for the first time when a female companion who already knew them asked to be let in via an intercom. Okay, so Dr. Lee is not a companion. She's a little more than part of a really lame escort quest. Additionally, John is once again leaving out information that is inconvenient to his argument. You can access the Brotherhood bunker in New Vegas without the help of Veronica. But really, that's all superficial stuff. Then why the fuck are you bringing it up? Let's look at the core conflict that's always existed at the heart of the Brotherhood. Is isolationism good or not? In Fallout 3, Lyons has already decided the answer is no. He's opened up his Brotherhood to the outside. But that's not a change. That's pretty much been the standard arc for the Brotherhood in every game. In Fallout 1, the Brotherhood are initially locked away in their bunker, but at the end of the game, you can persuade the Brotherhood that the mutant threat is severe enough that they should come out and assist an outsider with dealing with it. And that's not a one-off. The canon ending to Fallout 1 goes as follows. The Brotherhood of Steel helps the other human outposts drive the mutant armies away with minimal loss of life on both sides of the conflict. The advanced technology of the Brotherhood is slowly reintroduced into New California with little disruption or chaos. The Brotherhood wisely remains out of the power structure and becomes a major research and development house. Reintroducing technology and acting as an R&D house. In fact, their arc is pretty clear. They start off as isolationist hoarders, learn that's a dead end, and thus become more open to engaging with the world, albeit from a safe distance. In fact, Fallout 3's Brotherhood fits that end pretty much perfectly. They have their citadel, but they're also trying to help the world around them, while simultaneously keeping it at arm's length. And bear in mind, Fallout 3 takes place over a century after the events of Fallout 1 convinced a high elder of Lost Hills that engaging with outsiders in the outside world was sometimes necessary. Is it really so ridiculous that a century later, some Brotherhood leaders might come to the exact same conclusion? Notice what John did there? He not only made an inference and stated it as though it's fact, but he's also once again leaving out key information that directly goes against the point he's trying to make. Now John did quote the canon ending for the Brotherhood from Fallout 1 in full, but nothing there says they opened up to the world or changed their core beliefs or anything of the sort. In fact, this ending supports the opposite. The fact that they stay out of the power structure seems to imply they're still keeping to themselves. A group this dedicated to their entire belief system isn't just going to give it up overnight. And furthermore, what John is referring to here is the default ending for the Brotherhood. 
They don't make any kind of change whether or not you convince them to help you, an outsider, face the super mutant threat. They get this ending even if you never deal with them. It is incredibly dishonest to just portray this as though they specifically changed their ways because you convinced them to help you when that isn't actually the case. In the first game, there is no learning that isolationism is a dead end either. That's at absolute best just an assumption on John's part, and at worst, a total fabrication, because it sounds good for his arguments. I'm not done yet, though. It seems as though John has entirely forgotten about Fallout 2 yet again, because it's super inconvenient to his arguments. In Fallout 2, the Brotherhood are still trying to hoard technology, and they're still hiding themselves in bunkers. I also want to point out John's self-contradictory arguments here quickly, because it's absolutely worth mentioning. He starts off this entire segment by saying the Brotherhood hasn't changed, since this isn't the Brotherhood. But then he says not much has actually changed, and eventually comes around to saying this is the standard arc for the Brotherhood, and tries to paint it that this is how the Brotherhood should be. The one faction I've most often seen raised as a problem with Fallout 3, the Brotherhood of Steel. Now to some people, the Brotherhood are a big problem, and it seems to boil down to one big issue. The Brotherhood now acts in a more overtly benevolent and open fashion that feels strangely at odds with how the Brotherhood used to act in classic Fallout. The Brotherhood has not changed, because this isn't the Brotherhood. Though let's actually examine how much has changed in Lyons' Brotherhood, because I think that's massively overstated. In Fallout 3, Lyons has already decided the answer is no. He's opened up his Brotherhood to the outside. But that's not a change, that's pretty much been the standard arc for the Brotherhood in every game. Again, which is it? Is this the Brotherhood, or isn't it? John is arguing out of both sides of his mouth here, and it comes across as really bizarre when you boil it down. People complain that the Brotherhood had changed, but it's fine, because this isn't the Brotherhood. Now here's how not much has actually changed, and this is absolutely where the Brotherhood should be. I mean, hell, even Bethesda, the ones who created this clusterfuck of stupidity in the first place, seem to agree that this is too far of a stretch for the actual Brotherhood, as they literally wrote the Outcast faction and the fact that this Brotherhood has been cut off into the game itself. The Brotherhood was founded on a core set of beliefs, and one of the main aspects of that is that advanced technology shouldn't be shared with the dirty simpleton outsiders because stupid and ignorant people being in charge of immensely powerful technology and weapons was what led to the destruction of the world. That's my little trial run. Come on, Lion's Pride needs me and you know it. You don't yeah, need to yeah, worry. We'll We're see. the best outfit in the now whole knock that Brotherhood off. of Steel. You're wasting ammo. We... The Brotherhood has a codex that basically contains all their history, beliefs, and how they operate. Here's a quote from this codex that is actually said in Fallout 3 itself. Well, yes, sir. If I may speak my will, you do, sort of. We do not have many guests in the Citadel. And when we do, they're usually visiting brothers. Outsiders are not to be trusted, so says the Codex. Shield yourself from those not bound to you by steel, for they are the blind. Aid them when you can, but lose not sight of yourself. Yet here's the Brotherhood in Fallout 3, trying to be saviors of the world, sending out squads of soldiers to die. Like how they're defending Galaxy News Radio, for just no reason. Well, there is a reason, explained away in a single line of dialogue. It's tactically and strategically important, apparently because it's a defensible location. Nothing else, it's just really easy to defend, I guess. Or how they defend the Washington Monument for absolutely no reason as well. Like, they're just surrounded by enemies here to defend Three Dogs broadcasting equipment. Or their involvement in Project Purity. Wanting to defeat the Enclave is one thing, but why does the Brotherhood help caravans travel through the wasteland? Also, the fact they just openly recruit people and went over their way to try and protect as many people as possible, and even try to recruit them as well. For greater example that Bethesda is just doing whatever the fuck they want with the lore and factions, specifically with the super mutants in the Brotherhood, just look at Fallout 76. In all fairness to John, 76 wasn't even announced yet when he made this video, but I'm still presenting this as evidence. In Fallout 76, 
Super mutants already exist in large numbers in West Virginia a mere 25 years after the war. But on top of that, the Brotherhood was needlessly shoved into this game too, and Bethesda explained their lore reasoning in a tweet. The Brotherhood of Steel just used a satellite to communicate across the country, even though we're talking about the original Brotherhood. So original to the point that the founding members are still in control. And this is extremely antithetical to their beliefs. Fact of the matter is that Bethesda is just going to do whatever the fuck they want and come up with excuses for it later. And Bethesda is just going to move the pieces on the board to whatever is convenient to them at the time. The entire reason Fallout's lore has gone to complete shit since Bethesda took ownership is due to their inability to innovate within the Fallout series, coupled with next to zero adherence to pre-existing lore. Rather than make a single new major faction in Fallout 3, they fell back on two super mutants, but now they're orcs. They fell back on the Enclave, but now they're just an evil brotherhood. They fell back on the Brotherhood, but now they're just Power Rangers. All these factions could have been completely new groups of people, giving Bethesda way more wiggle room in their development. What we are given instead are these completely mangled factions with some Fallout flavoring to remind us we are still playing a Fallout game. Because there is little beyond the Fallout code of paint that indicates what series this game should be a part of. Let's look at another example. In New Vegas, the Brotherhood decided we meet a militant isolationist who lost a war that they started because they were so desperate to control technology, and who happily strapped bomb collars onto outsiders stupid enough to try and break into their bunker. And our Brotherhood companion Veronica stresses that they'll die out, and their High Elder agrees, but refuses to change anyway. If the Brotherhood in New Vegas stick to the old ways, they are destroyed by newer powers. One of the only ways for the Brotherhood to survive the end of New Vegas is for them to open up, start showing an interest in the outside world, engaging with other groups, and allying with the NCR. In fact, a constant idea in Fallout is that a closed-off Brotherhood cell must open up or risk dying out. Lion's Brother didn't even go that far with their experiments. They guarded strategically important locations, took out groups of super mutants that threatened them, and guarded small water caravans. Compared with allying with the NCR and sending troops to assist them in a war they knew basically nothing about, it's fairly modest. But somehow, when Fallout 3 has its Brotherhood open up a bit, it's a problem. But every other instance of the Brotherhood eventually learning they have to open up a bit is absolutely fine. To say opening up is a constant theme is a bit fucking absurd, considering they didn't really open up that much in either Fallout 1 or Fallout 2. And again, even Fallout 3 agrees with this notion that the main Brotherhood out west has entirely cut them off, specifically due to these changes, and because Lions disobeyed direct orders, both of which are actually a pretty big deal. John is downplaying how much they're doing, too. They're not simply holding strategic locations, they're sending their men out to die for what the Brotherhood would typically consider to be unimportant garbage. And it's because of this that they're forced to recruit dipshit rando wastelanders to fill out their ranks. It's not so much a problem that Fallout 3's Brotherhood is opening up, and more in the way they're doing it that's the issue. They come across as little more than Power Rangers, trying to defend the world from all evils, rather than a group that actually has any kind of goals. You see, disliking Fallout 3 is a game with some crazy rules, like it's totally okay to criticise Fallout 3 for doing something that Fallout New Vegas did, and then just politely pretend New Vegas is invisible for a minute. For fuck's sake, do you not know what the word context means? To prove my point as best as I can, I will now criticise Fallout 3 for something New Vegas does, but I won't criticise New Vegas for it. And after I do so, I want those of you watching this video to pause for as long as you like, so you can try to figure it out on your own, before I explain why this is a totally valid position to hold. I'm not even asking for people to comment on the video to artificially drive engagement. Just consider it for yourselves. It makes no sense that there is no rain in Fallout 3, but it is fine in New Vegas. If you want to take part in this little challenge, Pause now. Alright, so the thing is, many pieces of entertainment media are going to share certain elements as one another. 
but that doesn't mean they're going to be totally equal to each other. To give a very quick example, in the Star Wars movies, both Luke Skywalker and Rey Palpatine both use the Jedi mind trick. Yet, most people are fine with the first one, while the second one receives a lot of criticism. While using John's logic, it's totally okay to criticize the Disney trilogy for something the original trilogy did, and then just politely pretend the OT is invisible for a minute. However, if you look at the deeper context behind it, you learn why it's an issue. In the OT, Luke went through training to use the Force. He wasn't a master on day one, and when he finally does use the Jedi mind trick, it's in the final film of the trilogy. In the Disney trilogy, Rey figures out all on her own how to use the Jedi mind trick just a few hours after learning the Force is a real thing that exists. It isn't as simple as, both things did X, but one got criticized for it, because the deeper context surrounding these events are what matters. Now back to my rain criticism. Why is this an issue for Fallout 3 and not New Vegas? Well, the answer to that is that the Las Vegas area in the real world hardly gets any rain on a yearly basis, as opposed to Washington DC, which receives plenty of rain yearly. Due to the extremely low amount of rain Vegas gets, it wouldn't have made any sense for Obsidian to program in not only a rain weather system, but for it to only appear like 1% of the time. It would have been a waste of time and resources. Fallout 3, on the other hand, came just two years after Oblivion, which did have rain, which didn't get carried over to Fallout 3 for some reason. So let's pull this back to the Brotherhood now. What is the context between the versions of this group we see? In Fallout 2, last we saw the Brotherhood prior to Fallout 3, there were still isolationists who hid in bunkers and sought out advanced technology. In Fallout 3, they've just completely flipped, and now they're altruistic saviors of the people because... reasons, I guess? Elder Lions just kinda decided he wanted to protect the Rando Wastelanders. They're just opened up because that's what Bethesda wanted, and they're in this game because Bethesda wanted a recognizable faction, regardless of how little sense it made. There's no progression to this point, they're just there. Finally, the Brotherhood in New Vegas starts off isolated, but you can gain their trust and you can help them work towards siding with the NCR. It's a progression, and it's a step they take to not be exterminated. The Brotherhood opening up in Fallout 3 is a little more than Bethesda's word of God simply saying that this is the way it is now, instead of actually developing to that point naturally. From the point of view of someone playing these games, in the proper sequence, the Brotherhood goes from xenophobic technophiles in Fallout 1 to a group that is smaller and suffered some losses, but still has their goals and general beliefs in mind and trying to obtain advanced technology to gain more power in Fallout 2, to a group that sends their troops out to die all willy-nilly because protecting Rando Wastelanders is more important than their entire core belief system and it's also on the completely other side of the country for just no reason in Fallout 3. The problem isn't that the Brotherhood has changed. Character development and a faction developing and changing for the better are good story writing elements. The problem is how poorly and unjustified this change is made and handled. I reiterate what I said earlier, Bethesda only did this contrived bullshit to force the Brotherhood into their game because it's a recognizable faction, and they twisted it to suit their purposes, instead of utilizing the actual Brotherhood for something interesting, or making something new to fit this new non-Brotherhood role they forced them into. It's like shoving a square peg into a round hole. They recognize this fact, but tried to cover for it with the outcasts, and Lion's Brotherhood being cut off from the West. But your lore reasoning needs to be a bit more well thought out and written than we decided to help people one day. Bethesda's tweet about the Brotherhood being in Fallout 76 actually makes more sense from the perspective of Bethesda's awful lore writing now, because they seem to think any excuse is just good enough, and people will actually defend it. Just write a throwaway line to say it's canon, and not a retcon or terrible writing. 
This is the shit that frustrates people so much about how Bethesda is treating the series. It's the blatant and very obvious lack of care for the lore and what came before it. They want some fucking good guy Force of the Wasteland Power Rangers going around saving everyone, but they shove that concept into an existing group whose ideology doesn't match with that and doesn't even give them a good reason for changing or being different. It's even more egregious to make the Brotherhood local heroes in a series characterized by the amount of nuance that exists between factions. The only group that ever came close to crossing the line of lacking nuance was the Enclave of Fallout 2, and even then the player can interact with its extremely human rank-and-file members. Instead of trying to make something new and interesting, they take something that exists because it's recognizable and twist it to suit their purpose. It's also very worth noting that both the Brotherhood and Super Mutants have been in every Fallout game, which makes the world feel small in terms of groups living within it. If we see the Brotherhood and Super Mutants in California, and in Washington DC, and in Boston, and in West Virginia, then it seems like these are the only groups we're ever really going to be dealing with. Fallout in Florida? The Brotherhood and Super Mutants will be there. Fallout in Canada? The Brotherhood and Super Mutants will be there. Fallout in Australia? The Brotherhood and Super Mutants will fucking be there. Fallout on the Moon? Or on Mars? The fucking Brotherhood and the fucking Super Mutants will fucking be there. It makes the world boring as a result, which isn't helped by the fact that every time Bethesda touches these groups, they fuck them up more and more. Bethesda bastardized both these groups and the FEV in Fallout 3, they bastardized them further in Fallout 4, and they bastardized them even further in Fallout 76. Again, I realize Fallout 76 wasn't out at the time John made this video, but I'm using it as evidence anyways. Bethesda doesn't give a fuck about the lore of the series, or else they wouldn't have had the Brotherhood on the East Coast 25 fucking years after the war. It's an insane breaking of the lore to an absurd degree. I'll give you another very famous example. In one of the internet's best known Fallout 3 critiques, Fallout 3 is garbage, H Bomber Guy discusses the ending to Fallout 3's base game. And I should add this was put out in 2016, so New Vegas had been out for seven years. He spent some time discussing how the final confrontation in Fallout 3 against Colonel Autumn is a very weak ending, and while I'll discuss the ending in a bit more detail later, I broadly agree. It is one of Fallout 3's weaker moments, but I just want to directly quote a couple of points that are made about Colonel Autumn. He just sort of turns up halfway through. He's just a guy standing there saying, well, I guess it's time for us to fight now. And in the space of three lines of dialogue, you can talk him down and he just walks out. I mean, I don't even know what to say to that. Actually, wait, I do. At least Autumn actually showed up earlier in the game. At least we've seen him before. At least he's actually done something against me and against my family. At least some effort was made to show, not tell. Linnaeus is literally some guy who we've never met before the final confrontation. All we know is some vague stories about how mean he is, but Ulysses even specifically mentions it might not be the same guy under the mask, and Lucius' backstory for him doesn't match up with the one Caesar gives, and his face under the mask doesn't match up with Caesar's story either, so basically Linnaeus is just some guy who may or may not have done some bad stuff in the past, but some of it was probably someone else who was just wearing the same hat. So there's a lot to cover in this particular section, but the first thing I want to point out is how childishly reductive John is being here. It's just vague stories about how mean he is, and it might be someone wearing the same hat! Isn't the point of your video to convince people that Fallout 3 is better than they think? You're not earning yourself any points towards that goal when you act like this. It just comes off as petty, bitter, and childish. However, there's something bigger I want to point out here, and that's how he's taking H-Bomb's quote out of context, similar to what he did with Indigo Gaming earlier. You see, H-Bomb's entire argument leading up to this point is based on how well the villains were handled in Fallout 1 and 2. He talks at length about the depth and nuance to the Master, and briefly references Frank Horrigan in Fallout 2. Then he goes on to discuss how shallow Autumn is. But eventually, the enemies thin out, pairing away, until you're alone in a hallway. And at the end is one person. 
The entire game is preparing you for the moment where you and the master, who's been in charge of the entire mutant problem that threatens the world with domination this whole time, stand in a room together and talk. This final hallway tenses me up every time. It's a confrontation with a comprehensive belief system that so far has been doing really well for itself, and you have to stop it or mankind is probably done. You've gone from fighting scorpions to get an antidote so someone will sell you a rope and slap fights with casino owners over their business practices to sitting next to the arbiter of the world's doom and trying to explain what is wrong with their plan, and it happens seamlessly. So what shall it be? Do you join the unity, or do you die here? Everything has been pushing you towards the moment when you have to tell the man who thinks he has the solution to the problems you've been facing that he's wrong. These are the crowning moments of Fallout. They're the culmination of their story, their themes, their ideas, and all of your character's choices too. Do you just want to fight them? Are you unprepared, making the fight unavoidable and difficult? Do you try to talk to them and maybe, just maybe, change their mind? The conversation with the Master is nuts. He wants to know where your vault is and has a compelling reason you should tell him. It's a chance to assure the mutants can be strong enough to survive the wastes where mankind has and will not. As long as there are differences, we will tear ourselves apart fighting each other. Because there are no obvious speech options popping up with percentiles, there's no way of telling what the best way of attempting to talk him down might be, except for your own judgement. You have to engage him as a reasonable person. The best thing is, it's impossible for him to be talked down on moral grounds. He doesn't care about mankind's survival or killing people, because for him, the mutants are the future of mankind and the ends justify the means. The only way to talk him down is to explain why the plan wouldn't work. This isn't just a speech check. To do this, you have to ask everyone about the mutants, about what makes them what they are. Eventually, you can find through Vri that the mutants are sterile, and she gives you the evidence that proves this is the case. The master rejects this as a forgery anyway. You have to get him to ask his own mutants if any of them have gotten pregnant before he realizes the truth. The final speech he gives is sad, amazing, and deeply humanizing for such a monstrous character. Video game characters rarely have good voice actors, and the master has two, playing about four different voices. Jim Cummings and Kath Susie both make great performances that contribute to one of the best moments in video game character history. Outwitting the master feels like you've genuinely contended with an apocalyptic ideology and beaten it with intelligence and reason, not simply the strength of your gun or some cookie-cutter heroic speech. Fallout 2 does a lot as well. Frank Horrigan is a similar culmination of that game's themes, but if I talk about it now I'll be here for another hour, so I'm just gonna skip ahead, okay? It's good. It's good. Play Fallout 2. Play it. Please. The part where you have a short talk to the man in the room, who embodies all the problems you've faced, is the best part of those two Fallout games by far to me. They tie everything together. Fallout 3 pits you against Colonel Autumn. You again. Autumn has been a dick to you personally, but he doesn't represent any major flaw in the world of Fallout 3. He isn't the culmination of the problems you've seen. He just sort of turns up halfway through. He's just the guy standing there saying, well, I guess it's time for us to fight now. And in the space of three lines of conversation, if you pass a speech check, you can talk him out of fighting, and he just fucking walks out. Colonel Autumn doesn't really stand for anything. He doesn't want anything. He doesn't represent any core concept you've had to face over the course of the game. He's a wet fart on the face of Fallout storytelling. The ending, this final room, could have made everything about the game come together and make sense. It would be difficult, but it could have happened, and at least put a nice bow on things. But instead, it's exactly the ending you would fucking expect from the rest of Fallout 3, and yet that somehow still feels disappointing. Worse than that, this game had two chances to get this right. There were two men in rooms. When you meet President Eden, you're in a similar scenario. Eden wants to convince you to enact his genocide, but unlike with the Master or the Lieutenant or anyone, there's no explanation, no underlying motive, it's just, I am bad guy, we need to kill mutants, genocide good. Super mutants and ghouls must be purged, we need to clear the way for humanity to rebuild the wastes. The Master had a comprehensive explanation for why the human race needed to be converted into mutants now. Bethesda can't come up with a single compelling explanation for why this is actually a good idea beyond the platitude of, we need to undo mutants, do you get it? I'm a racist. There's no philosophical struggle. 
It's impossible to even attempt to reason out why this philosophy is right or wrong in a rational manner because it's so fucking stupid that it defies rationality. You can't show him that the mutants aren't the real problem, that the real problem is something even the Enclave are a part of, the all-too-human need to continue to make unending war and death. How do you talk him down, then? Well, you get a please-kill-yourself speech option, and then you say, uh, you know, don't be bad, it's bad, aren't you tired of being bad? And then he says, okay. Yes, I suppose it is. Very well. I'll put an end to the Enclave. And he does! This should be a joke! Like, wow, President Eden was poorly fucking programmed, or the Enclave are fucking idiots all the way up to the top. But because there's no real discussion or struggle or philosophical point to be made by any of the factions or characters in this game, it becomes strikingly clear that this really was the best Bethesda could do. And that's just sad. And what was it John was responding to? But I just want to directly quote a couple of points that are made about Colonel Autumn. He just sort of turns up halfway through. He's just a guy standing there saying, well, I guess it's time for us to fight now. And in the space of three lines of dialogue, you can talk him down and he just walks out. I mean, I don't even know what to say to that. Actually, wait, I do. At least Autumn actually showed up earlier in the game. At least we've seen him before. At least he's actually done something against me and against my family. At least some effort was made to show, not tell. Linnaeus is literally some guy who we've never met before the final confrontation. All we know is some vague stories about how mean he is. So he took a quote entirely out of context and brought Lanius into it because I guess he looked at the surface level aspects and just saw it as some guy. We'll get more into that shortly. More than that, however, is the fact he doesn't actually address the criticism H-Bomb made against the game. This is what we call whataboutism, where something is criticized and rather than responding to the actual criticism, the person defending it goes, Hey, look at this thing over here! It's bad, too! H-Bomb's entire argument was about how Autumn is basically just a bad guy for the sake of being a bad guy. And John's response to it is to go, But Lanius is bad for this reason! Next, John references Show, Don't Tell, which isn't a rule written in stone that all writers must abide by, but instead a general piece of writing advice. But it doesn't really apply in this situation. There are some situations in fiction where it's either extremely difficult or impossible to show, and there's situations where it makes sense to just tell. But telling isn't inherently a bad thing when it comes to writing, as it's sometimes necessary. What John is referencing here is characters in the world explaining things to you. It's the primary method of conveying information, and it makes total sense. Show don't tell more often refers to things such as how characters are acting or feeling, or how certain events play out in the world. You can't just have your characters announce how they feel! That makes me feel angry! If the game were to show Lanius' backstory here, they'd need to interrupt the flow of the game and break immersion in order to show a cutscene, and even then, that wouldn't make sense, since the courier would have no way of actually seeing what Lanius has done in the past. However, by far the most important aspect of this, the little itty-bitty detail that John is leaving out that completely dismantles his entire point actually comes from the same line of dialogue. He uses evidence against Lanius that he's just some guy, and it might be someone different under the mask. Lanius, the butcher, monster, terror of the East. Not even his slaves have seen his face. Struck them blind so they can't. Wears a mask. Don't even know if it's the same man. He put Colorado to the sword. Broke the hangdogs by throwing their hounds upon the flames. So they might burn forever in the afterlife. The take Hoover Dam. Legion will need something as big as the old world itself. Another symbol, forged by history. Aeneas carries all the terrors of the East with him. He's the myth, 
the weapon the Legion needs. When he arrives, he'll fall on Hoover Dam like a hammer. Break the bear in two. Nineteen tribes could not do it. All the lights in Vegas cannot. His strength lies in his title, and it is his weakness. He will not fight a losing battle and destroy what he represents. Put the idea of loss in him. Convince him the bear will not be the 20th tribe beneath his heel. It will make him pause like nothing on earth. You do not need to convince him alone. Draw upon history. The past of other legates are not filled with victories. Remind Linnaeus of this. There are other legates, and the one before Linnaeus couldn't take Hoover Dam for Kaiser. That legate's mistake is he didn't die trying. His name was Joshua. Joshua Graham answered for his failure twice. Some say. The entire point behind Linus is to be a symbol for the Legion. The entire point of Linus's backstory being presented this way through Caesar telling it to you is because it is treated much like a myth and legend. People in the world refer to these stories about Linus, and it's actually a psychological tactic in warfare. It exists to bolster his intimidation factor and his reputation. If you're an NCR soldier, or really just anyone in the Legion's way, would you be more intimidated by a soldier or by the Monster of the East? This brutal, remorseless warlord who has conquered 19 tribes, who had all the men from his tribes executed for surrendering to Caesar, who has no hesitation in killing incompetent commanders within the Legion, making his own men perform decamadio. One refugee told us the Legion took over at underperforming squad of troops by beating its commander to death in full view of everyone. The Legate then ordered a tenth of his own force be killed by the other nine tenths. And you thought your boss was a pain. Intel said the Legate's coming. Lanius. They call him the Monster of the East. If he's half as bad as Graham was, we're in for a heck of a fight. With Caesar and a new legate here, the Legion's not going to fall for the same old bag of tricks. Oh, the usual reasons. People say he's enormous, carries a big sword, chops people's heads off. That's not what makes him a good commander, though. Folks say he came from a heck of a tough tribe. Took Caesar a long time to conquer. It was thanks to Lanius. But once Caesar broke him, he was born again. He'll go anywhere and do anything to win. Legion says he can smell weakness. Once he finds out where an army's vulnerable, he'll go to it like a dog for the throat. To call Aeneas ferocious would be an understatement. In battle, he seizes the enemy in his jaws and will not let go. He thinks nothing of suffering losses, so long as the enemy suffers more. Though unsubtle, he is not dim. He detects traps and sets his own. Be glad you will not have to face his judgment. If you are true to Kaisar. The Legion is civilization reborn. Our culture is based on virtues such as martial excellence, loyalty, and justice. But you'll learn all there is to know in due time. Legatus Linnaeus. Monster of the East will soon arrive to command Kaisar's troops in battle. The dam will fall, and the rest of the profligate West will soon follow. The goddess Linnaeus, Monster of the East. Quite a man, if man he be. Kaisar prides himself on selecting the right tool to overcome each new obstacle. In Linnaeus, he found his hammer. He's never been defeated in battle. Fourteen tribes have laid down arms at his boots. Another five rendered extinct. His latest campaign in the wilds of the Utah has concluded, and he is en route. When he arrives, your doom arrives with him. Psychology is actually a very large part of battle. Many historical battles, and even wars, have been won by the use of psychological tactics. And a notable one is the intimidation factor of certain people. 
real-world historical figures have been elevated to legendary status due to their actions and their reputation. There's a lot of myth and legend that surround many of them, and it's not always clear what is and isn't true. For example, since we're on the topic of Caesar's Legion by way of Linnaeus, let's talk about Julius Caesar and a particularly legendary story about the man. Julius Caesar was kidnapped by pirates. They demanded a ransom for him. Caesar laughed in their faces and demanded they increase the ransom because their initial demand wasn't enough for him. During his time in their captivity, he didn't cower from them. Instead, he treated them as if they were subordinates, demanding they not talk when he slept, writing speeches he'd recite to them. He participated in their exercises, basically acting as if he wasn't a prisoner, but their leader. The pirates apparently even grew to respect him and allowed him the freedom to do as he pleased on their ships and island. He also told them that once the ransom was paid, he'd hunt them down and crucify them, a promise he followed through on. He gathered a small fleet, went to their island, captured them, and took back his ransom money along with everything they owned. He initially ordered them to be crucified, but ended up showing some leniency, instead opting to have their throats slit. There are other examples of such stories about Julius Caesar, or even other legendary historical figures that are shrouded in myth and mystery, such as how about 1 in 200 men are direct descendants of Genghis Khan, or that Alexander the Great, who Iron Maiden wrote a badass song about, had never lost a battle, and people thought he was a literal gift from the gods, or even that he was a god himself, who cut the Gordian knot and would become the master of Asia, based on a prophecy that the person who would untie the knot would rule Asia, a prophecy he apparently fulfilled. Even the solution is disputed on whether he actually cut it or not. Or how about Vlad the Impaler, a nickname you don't earn lightly because he had his enemies as well as innocents impaled. It was his primary form of dealing with people he didn't like, and it is a crazy psychological thing to use against your enemies, because if you lose to him, you'll face the same horrible fate. So why this big detour into historical figures and their actions? Because it's a good example of how stories surrounding a person can make them larger than life. How myth and legend, and more importantly, reputation, is so important to these figures and forms both our basis of understanding of who they are and what they do, but also allows us to form our opinions on them. If you found yourself in Vlad the Impaler's castle, knowing all you've heard about him, would you be brave enough to insult him to his face and see if he'll act on it? If John is right about anything here, it might be the fact that Lanius is some guy, but what he's missing is that the man under the mask is less important than the mask itself. Lanius isn't a man. Lanius is the legend. This brutally violent man who commits atrocities, this unstoppable force, a powerhouse of a fighter, a man who could cleave you in two without breaking a sweat if he felt like it. It's meant to make his enemies fear facing him in battle, and it makes total sense as a thing for the Legion to do. I'm far from done here, however. John says, at least Autumn actually showed up earlier in the game. At least we've seen him before. At least he's actually done something against me and against my family. At least some effort was made to show, not tell. Linnaeus is literally some guy who we've never met before the final confrontation. All we know is some vague stories about how mean he is. Again, this isn't an issue or a bad thing, but John is trying to portray it as such. You do realize the same line of logic can be applied to plenty of other notable villains in games. You don't meet the Master before the final confrontation with him, so does that make it bad? Same with Dagothur from Morrowind, or Maria from Breath of Fire 3, or Mel Buframa from Legend of Dragoon. Plenty of games, and even some movies, do this. Gygas of Earthbound? Gwyn of Dark Souls? Senator Armstrong of Metal Gear Rising? Ganondorf of Wind Waker? Jubileus of Bayonetta? See, the thing these ten antagonists all have in common is that the rest of the game puts in the work to build them up, because you don't really meet them until the end of the game, or close to it. But you know enough about them by the time you reach their encounters, 
and particularly in the case of the Master, Dagothur and Legate Lanius, there's a lot to learn from speaking to them directly, too. The amount of times an antagonist shows up in the story does not directly correlate to how well done they are or not. Autumn could have had 10,000 encounters with the player, but that doesn't in any way change how lazily or poorly written he is, and it doesn't inherently make him a better villain. Autumn only shows up at three points in the game as it is, and all of them are pretty terrible. Wants to take over Project Purity, wants to kidnap you and get the Purifier password, and once at the end of the game, and when you break them down, it really goes a long way to show just how poor the writing is here. So naturally, let's go through it in detail, and Autumn as a character. So for the most part, the game largely treats Autumn as little more than a mustache twirling villain. It's actually quite pathetic. Seeing how shallow this character really is, I'm surprised he doesn't have a line where he says, I love being evil, or something to that effect. So he shows up at Project Purity and tries to take control, takes everyone as prisoners, and for some reason, his soldiers try to kill you rather than take you hostage as well. He also murders a civilian to make a point. This is all to quickly establish that he's an evil bad guy. Liam Neeson kills himself in an attempt to kill Autumn, but as it turns out, Autumn has a magic radiation immunity serum he injects himself with. This is to explain away how he survives, but it ends up being a big issue because of how contrived it is. This is also never explained or mentioned ever either. This is all inferred from an animation that plays, and from the fact that Liam Neeson just dies. And this is one that Fallout 3 fans will just have to take on the chin. Because without it, Autumn surviving just straight up becomes a plot hole. So pick your poison, I guess. Next, we see him after we get the Gek, and he uses a magic stun grenade that works regardless of equipment you use, and if you run past the room, it'll teleport you back there, I guess. Autumn walks in, and I guess it's a shocking moment because, oh my god, I thought he died. So we wake up in Raven Rock, and Colonel Clank demands the code from you. Now keep in mind, the only reason we know him to be a villain at this point is due to crappy and contrived writing. Everything he did at Project Purity was actually a detriment to his goals, but was done for the sake of pushing him as a villain. I'll explain shortly. Now again, the game flags him as being an evil villain, but we don't actually know what he wants or what his goals are. So giving him the password should be a viable option, right? Well, no, he'll kill you immediately, for no reason. Remember, you haven't actually done anything against the Enclave at this point, aside from simply not letting them kill you. You pose no threat in their custody, and they could decide what to do with you later. But nah. If you refuse to give him the code, the President will want to see you. Autumn will begrudgingly let you go, only to betray the President a few minutes later and order your execution. Again, this seems to be a little more than a design decision to show how evil he is, rather than properly developing him as an antagonist. When you talk to Eden, he wants you to poison the water, because Autumn won't do it. Why he thinks you will, I have no idea. It's just more of that terrible Bethesda writing at play. He even blatantly explains that it will kill everyone who has some level of mutation, even though that's probably going to convince you to not do it especially since the Lone Wanderer would be impacted by this as well. There's literally no good reason for you to ever poison the water. It seems like Bethesda remembered that this was a game about choice, and one of the writers threw their arms up in the air and said, I don't know, give them the option to poison the water, I guess, even though it makes no goddamn sense. Finally, your last encounter with Autumn is at Project Purity, where you can talk him down or kill him. So similar to my rain criticism, I want you to stop for a moment and consider what Autumn's goals are, because they're never really explained. Don't look it up, just try to figure it out. Hell, go play the game all the way through if you want. I guarantee most players will miss it. I missed it for many, many years.
At least we've seen him before. At least he's actually done something against me and against my family. At least some effort was made to show, not tell. Linnaeus is literally some guy who we've never met before the final confrontation. All we know is some vague stories about how mean he is. All we know about Lanius is some vague stories about how mean he is. Right, what do we know about Autumn, then? Pause now if you want to think about it for a bit. Alright, so Autumn doesn't actually want to poison the water. In fact, he wants to help the people of the wasteland. He considers them to be American citizens still. Now he does want to build support for the Enclave, but then... What is the Enclave at this point? If Autumn has no desire to exterminate anything that isn't genetically pure, then he's already taking them in a new direction from Fallout 2. So, why not take them further? There might be growing pains, sure, but if he's going to attempt to rebuild America, then that means dealing with the people, re-establishing law and order. If anything, there's a good chance that Autumn's Enclave would settle into being an NCR-type faction, having states, senators, governors, protecting its citizens and expanding territory. But that isn't necessarily evil. That's what's really frustrating about Autumn as a villain. He seems to somewhat have the right goals in mind, but he's just acting like a total asshole villain because the script said we needed a bad guy, and we only know this because of a couple lines of dialogue that are extremely easy to miss. Right at the very end of the game, depending on how the speech checks turn out, he'll say, Once this facility is operational, the masses will flock to the Enclave for fresh water, protection, and a plan for the future. Fresh water, protection, and a plan for the future. Huh, that doesn't sound too evil. Maybe he's got something nefarious planned for the future. But we don't actually know this, because his plan for the future is never mentioned ever again. Because it doesn't fucking exist. Well, I mean, that's just one line. That doesn't really prove anything, does it? The American people are worth fighting for. The future must be secured. I won't let you stand in the way of that. Uh, oh, um... The American people are worth fighting for. Man, he sure does sound like a total asshole, doesn't he? Like, I really have to stress this point, but one of the biggest reasons the Enclave for the bad guys in Fallout 2 is because they are trying to kill everything that wasn't genetically pure like they were. And this is something Colonel Autumn directly opposes, to the point of disobeying the president. That's not true. That plan was abandoned months ago. He would never go behind my back. Oh wait, that actually makes us even fucking worse. What the fuck? So if Autumn was under the impression that the modified FEV plan was abandoned, then why did he betray the president at Raven Rock? I'm legitimately fucking confused. But I'm also trying to make sense of the writing of a talentless hack in a company that doesn't give a fuck. So I guess I'm the fool here. Really though, Autumn betrays Eden because Bethesda wanted a dungeon full of enemies. Of course. But there doesn't seem to be anything in the narrative for it, so he just does it. Because reasons. You know, it's pretty sad how often because reasons is the explanation for things happening in Fallout 3. Why nuke Megaton? Because reasons. Why are there children living in Lamplight? Because reasons. How did this computer terminal explode and instantly release lethal levels of radiation? Because reasons. Why did Autumn betray Eden? Because reasons. It feels like this entire game is just one big hand wave of all the shit they didn't bother to explain. Don't ask questions, just consume product and then get excited for next product. So we've literally only got a few lines of dialogue to prove what Autumn really wants, and again, all of this is at the very end of the game, and it's extremely easy to miss. But this has a greater impact upon the story. These pieces of dialogue recontextualizes everything he did earlier to make him look like the world's biggest retard. If his goal the entire time was simply getting the purifier to work and be in control of it in order to build support for the Enclave so he could in turn start rebuilding the country, then why the fuck would he come in guns blazing 
murdering civilians, and just demanding control. There's no attempt at diplomacy. It's just, give me the purifier or die. Why does he think that will help him achieve his goals in any way? Furthermore, this still doesn't explain his unnatural hatred for the player. To kill the lone wanderer if you give him the password, or to order your fucking execution in Raven Rock once you're set free. Well again, Bethesda didn't care about any of that shit. Everything is in service of the writer's very narrow ability. Bethesda wanted a bad guy, so they made Autumn the bad guy. No common sense or logic for what Autumn's goals actually were, he's just a bad guy. This is why as Autumn is telling us why he's doing all this, he's also talking like a Saturday morning cartoon villain. Once you're dead, we'll finish off this pathetic brotherhood and become the true saviors of the wasteland. What's worse is that they've had all of 20 years to take over Project Purity themselves. They only really need the Gek to make it operational, which they could have very easily gotten on their own. They clearly didn't need Liam Neeson or any of his notes, because he dies and they finish all the rest of the work on their own. So let's take a look at both of these antagonists again and compare them, because John essentially argued that Autumn is a better villain because he showed up a couple times and did things to you and your family, and Lanius is just some guy we don't know much about. Well, Lanius is a brutal warrior, loyal to Caesar. However, he still has a code of honor. He isn't just a mindless killer, and he can even respect those that fight with words. But he only shows up once, so I guess that makes him a poor antagonist. Autumn, on the other hand, is a shallow and poorly written bad guy who does bad things that are detrimental to his own goals, because Bethesda needed an antagonist, and we can only learn what he really wants in some extremely easy to miss dialogue right at the very end of the game. But he shows up a few times through the story, so I guess that means he isn't actually all that bad at all. And as for talking him down, at least in Fallout 3 it vaguely makes sense in context. Consider Autumn's position. He's already lost. There's a giant murder bot standing outside. Raven Rock is destroyed. His president is gone. If someone persuasive enough offered him a chance to walk away, why wouldn't he? I mean, sure, he's lost. But Eden won't necessarily be dead, and Raven Rock might not get destroyed. Isn't it funny that John goes out of his way to highlight choice when it's convenient to his arguments, but if a choice is inconvenient, he just politely pretends it's invisible for a minute. But Linnaeus? A man who according to his own slightly dubious backstory was so obsessed with fighting that when his tribe tried to surrender, he turned on them and kept fighting beyond the point of mutilation? A man who Caesar specifically says has no love for the Legion and is just a butcher who is personally loyal to Caesar alone? He is going to back down when faced with the argument that California is a bit big so it would stretch the Legion to hold it. Yeah, sorry, I'm not convinced he's the sort of guy who gets convinced it's better to play it safe than risk conquering too much. Then I'm afraid you completely missed the point of Lanius and what he truly is. The fact that you think Lanius turned on his tribe because he was so obsessed with fighting is proof that you either don't know what you're talking about or you don't understand it. And I've been told numerous times that this is your all-time favorite game. Lanius didn't turn on his tribe because he was obsessed with fighting, but because he saw their surrender as cowardice. Lanius is a proud and honorable warrior type character. This is supported by the stories about him and his own opinions. A plan by Volpes. Treachery is a weapon that one should never rely on. I can only hope that the Ometas died when their treachery was exposed. To have the plan succeed only would have sullied the Legion. It does not matter. Victory shall be ours. It shall be swift. And it will be honest. Purchased with blood. <laughs> I have seen little of true battle this day. And you were brave to come here to face me when all of NCR would not. I shall honor your last words and face you alone. No man will say I refused your challenge. I shall make a cape of your skin and your skull. It shall sit by my side, mute, watching as my armies march west. 
I shall honor your last words and face you alone as you request. No man will say I refused your challenge. After being captured, he was offered the helmet by Caesar to fight for him. Lanius agreed on the condition that he could kill the remaining members of his tribe, which Caesar agreed to if he spared the women and children. It wasn't fighting for the sake of fighting, it's always been an issue of honor and cowardice to Lanius. He's a brutal fighter, but he's not an idiot. Hell, the game even includes lines showing why he thinks taking the Mojave would be a detriment in the long term. Hmm. Long ago, when taking Denver, I had to face such a challenge. Many died over many years to claim the city as ours. It was the lines of food and water that nearly broke the Legion's strength, and the lack of tribals near that cursed city. When I felt in that struggle, I felt as I saw the map of the West. The West is a trap. The bear has already been caught in it, and it is dying. The East was a hard-fought campaign. Even now, Kaisar drew too much of the Legion's blood needed there for this. Hoover Dam is but a place. I will not have it be the gravestone of the Legion, whether quickly, or as you describe, slowly, by attrition. And notice once again how reductive John is being. California is a bit big. Except that actually is a pretty big fucking deal. You need sufficient manpower in order to hold territory. Can one man hold all of California? How about ten? A hundred? A thousand? It's not out of the question that such a thing would be an important consideration. Again, Lanius isn't stupid. He's seen what attrition can do. For someone who built his entire reputation on being undefeatable, it would be foolish for him to charge headlong into a situation that would result in a defeat long term. And to further prove the point that honor is what Lanius cares about, even if you do successfully talk him down, if you refer to it as him retreating, he will get pissed and attack anyways. Retreat? Retreat? I was a fool to listen to you. You know nothing of who I am. Your words have done nothing but delay the inevitable. Now, see what my hounds and my blade will bring to you. And I need to point it out once again, but John is also outright ignoring the information Ulysses gives about Lanius that doesn't support his argument. He cherry-picked the one comment that supports his point here, that it might not be the same man under the mask, but ignored literally everything else. His strength lies in his title, and it is his weakness. He will not fight a losing battle and destroy what he represents, but the idea of loss in him. Convince him the bear will not be the 20th tribe beneath his heel. It will make him pause like nothing on earth. Even mechanically, I think Autumn Surrender actually works better because Fallout 3's speech system utilized both charisma and speech skills. And that meant that you couldn't just shove skill points into speech, you actually had to be a charismatic individual as well. And even then, you could fail. But in New Vegas, my most common build is Charisma 1 Speech 100. A person so lacking in charisma that Doc Mitchell mutters I must be suffering from frontal lobe damage. And even then, I can talk down the Butcher of the East. You do realize there is a difference between being charismatic and knowing what you're talking about, right? Charisma is more of a natural charm and personality type thing, and speech is more how well you convey information and can make a point. It's how you use your words, which would make total sense for dealing with Lanius. He doesn't give a fuck about someone's personality or charm. Someone could have the charisma of a potato and still have the ability to talk their way through situations and present a convincing argument. Even then, you've been complaining about Lanius' writing. Now you're transitioning to a problem with the game's mechanics and framing it as a problem exclusive to Lanius. You know what, as we're already on the ending, let's briefly talk about the ending. Because it's honestly not great, but it's not as bad as some people say either. It's certainly no Mass Effect 3 level disaster. In fact, I see the idea they were going with, it's just the execution that doesn't quite work. You see, there's an early idea introduced in Fallout 3, right in the intro. It was here you were born. 
It is here you will die. And following straight after that, Fallout 3 uniquely begins with your birth, so it really wasn't that surprising that the game chose to end with your death. The problem wasn't the idea, it was the contrived circumstances, and some of the script around it that meant it didn't work. John had it right for a moment there. They had a neat idea, but fucked up the execution. However, this doesn't make the ending any less garbage. At the end of the day, an idea is worth fucking nothing. What matters every single time is the execution. If someone has an idea for the greatest, most in-depth game ever, the most well-written story full of absurd amounts of choice, extremely advanced AI, and so on and so forth, that's still just a concept in someone's head. And if the execution of that idea turned out to be Limbo of the Lost or Ride to Hell Retribution, then they don't get any points for having a good idea, because ultimately, I cannot play an idea. And this is where the ending starts getting messy, because Fallout 3 doesn't have a single ending, or even a single end point. You see, a lot of people didn't like the original ending, and they particularly didn't like the massive barely concealed plot holes created by the fact that the whole thing's built around the idea that somebody has to step into the irradiated chamber to give the capital wasteland clean water, when there are so many characters in the game better suited to doing it than you or Sarah, including three companions you might have with you who are 100% immune to radiation, Forks, Charon, and RL3. But if you ask them, they refuse. Even Fox, who earlier in the game volunteered to do something in a highly irradiated section of Vault 87 for you, and actively chastises you if you run ahead and do it yourself. Even Charon, whose character is he's literally been brainwashed to follow orders. Even RL3, who's a robot. He's your property. I don't need moral lessons from my toaster, you bastards. It's far worse than that. The entire situation is one of the most contrived pieces of writing I've ever seen. It's absurd. Half-Life Full-Life Consequences is legitimately more well-written than this garbage. So let's quickly go through the sequence of events that led us to this point. Autumn tried to take control of the purifier, but to prevent him from doing so, Liam Neeson made a computer explode that somehow flooded the chamber with radiation. Already that doesn't make sense. The Enclave needs to correct code, because putting in the wrong code apparently causes another explosion, and causes someone to die immediately. No, I'm not joking. This is Colonel Autumn. Are your men in play, soldier? Affirmative, sir. Standing by for code transmission. Your code is 704. Repeat. 704. Confirm and enter. Copy. 704. Stand by, sir. Entering code now. Negative, sir. The code's no good. I just lost another man. For some reason, the perfect radiation immunity serum that Autumn used earlier isn't available for his men to use. Part of that whole just not ever explaining it bit. So this is already contrived as all hell. A computer released radiation that it shouldn't have. That radiation that shouldn't have been there is also extremely lethal. To the point any radiation resistance or removal items at the player's disposal is worthless, and yet still not as lethal as Vault 87's entrance, and the radiation immunity that Autumn used to survive these very circumstances is never mentioned or shown anywhere else in the game. He doesn't even have it on him at Project Purity at the end of the game. So that's not an option, and now, at the very end of the game, a ticking clock element has been added, Pressure is somehow building that will destroy the purifier unless it's activated fucking immediately. Even though it's sat for 20 years without issue, and still hasn't been active in any meaningful way. The Enclave literally couldn't turn it on. So, where's the pressure coming from? And then, all your companions refuse. Yeah, Broken Steel doesn't actually fix this garbage in the slightest. Sending a companion in and surviving regardless of choice is like a drop in the bucket compared to all of the absurd contrived bullshit that forced the scenario to happen. Broken Steel's fix is a band-aid to a bullet wound. The next small segment I'm going to skip because I don't really have anything to respond to, except for the part where he brings up the ending being messy again, to which I say, 
The ending isn't messy due to having more than one ending or endpoint. It's messy due to Bethesda's execution. In short, the DLC adds in a different ending, which resolves some of the most blatant issues of the original, and adds the post-game roaming that some people angrily condemn Bethesda for not including in the first place, despite the fact there was no post-end game at all in Fallout 1 or New Vegas, but obviously no one minds that. So this criticism ties back into the one from earlier, where John said Fallout 3 is criticized for stuff New Vegas gets away with. In fact, much of this video seems to be based on this idea. Now remember my examples from earlier, about Rain and Fallout 3 New Vegas, and the Jedi mind trick in Star Wars? Same idea applies here. John is ignoring the wider context of the situation. He's also lumping two vaguely defined groups into one group in order to make critics of Fallout 3 appear hypocritical. See, Fallout 3 was the first Fallout game for many people, and it came after the massively successful Morrowind and Oblivion. Bethesda already had an established fan base, one that was familiar with their games continuing past the end of their main story. They were likely the ones complaining about the game having a hard end, which is the exact position I was in at the time, before I had played any other Fallout game or knew how they worked. Also, it was probably mostly established Bethesda fans complaining, because longtime Fallout fans were likely too busy complaining about the overall game being shit to care about the game having a hard end. And also, I just think it's unlikely they'd have many complaints regarding a hard end, because Fallout 1 had a hard end. It's not completely unreasonable. Like, I really love how you group in people who hated that Fallout 3 had no post-game roaming, with the people who were fine with New Vegas having a hard end, as if no one complained about New Vegas having no post-game roaming either. In fact, there are even mods that allow the game to continue after New Vegas ends. See, it's actually really easy to make your opponents look like utter fools if you group them in with the actions of vague, loosely defined groups of people with different opinions because most people listening to your video aren't going to look into it or aren't going to think too critically about it, so you can make just about any claim you want. It's also worth pointing out he claims the Broken Steel addresses the blatant issues present with Fallout 3's ending. However, Broken Steel only changes the fact that your character dies in the end. This quote from Tim Kaine, the creator of the entire Fallout series, explains the broader issues with the ending. Take note as to how well Broken Steel actually changes these massive problems. If I had to pick something I didn't like about Fallout 3, I would pick its ending. I hated the ending. There, I said it. I didn't like the sudden problem with the purifier, and I especially didn't like the lack of real, meaningful multiple endings beyond what I chose in the final few minutes. FEV or not, me or lions, and that was it? But the worst thing about the ending was that there was no mention of the fate of the places I had visited. In my head I had already imagined slides for Megaton, The Citadel, Rivet City, Underworld, GNR, The Enclave, or the mysterious Commonwealth, but I got pretty much nothing. Well said, Tim. He certainly has a greater imagination than I do, because I don't know what possible endings the Citadel or GNR or Underworld could ever have, because there seems to be extremely little choice regarding these locations. It's also worth noting that Tim does not list a lack of post-game roaming as one of his major problems with the game. On that note, I think it's worth looking into what actually changes in the post-game. At a glance, it's very difficult to tell you've entered the post-game, there is some content that shows the player that water is being distributed to the people of the wasteland, such as Griffin and Bigsley. But when we look at specific elements of the world in the post-game, there's a noticeable pattern. Megaton, Rivet City, and the Citadel generally don't have major changes beyond select people talking about water distribution. For contrast, the endings of Fallout 1 and 2 have major changes in leadership settlements being deserted, new alliances being formed, and more. Broken Steel seems to acknowledge the conflict has ended, but has anything really changed specific to the settlements I helped? This issue becomes even more jarring if you choose to poison the water. You're given a slideshow that shows corpses lining the landscape, and then you come out later to see almost nothing has changed. Anyway, where were we? Ah! GNR! Good! 
And one thing particularly worthy of note here, the behemoth fight. You see, this is something that I think Fallout 3 does spectacularly well. It has those big wow moments. Oddly, I often see this listed as a criticism, mostly phrased as how games are becoming more cinematic and thus more like films and thus more linear. And that can be true. In fact, there's one bit of Fallout 3 I won't be trying to defend that totally falls into that trap, the March of Liberty Prime. Okay, it's kind of fun to see a giant robot stomping around, but he completely overwhelms the gameplay, as you can basically just follow him. There's no need for you to actually get involved. Plus, he frequently bugs out and gets stuck. On three separate occasions when I was trying to record this footage, in fact. But mostly, I don't feel that criticism really applies to Fallout 3. It has big spectacle moments, but for me, they really just help to elevate certain quests. Oasis, for example, isn't actually a great quest. It's just a cave with some Mirelurks to kill. But the beauty of Oasis next to the rest of the wasteland and the beautiful visual design of Harold in particular, bent over, his arm rooted to the ground, the bulging single eye, the mouth pinned open by tree bark, that all makes it work. Whatever you think of Power of the Atom, standing on the balcony watching the Megaton explosion as the shockwave hits the tower, it's one of those iconic scenes in gaming you'd instantly recognise anywhere. Waking up in Tranquility Lane for the first time, with its black and white visuals and jaunty music. I'd say that's only one side of the criticism. Generally, I don't think Bethesda games are in any danger of becoming more cinematic. These complaints are most likely due to the whole style over substance, or spectacle over substance issue, which this game is clearly full of. Just think of everything I've covered over the past few hours. Whatever you think of Power of the Atom, standing on the balcony watching the Megaton explosion as the shockwave hits the tower, it's one of those iconic scenes in gaming you'd instantly recognize anywhere. Iconic, spectacular, and entirely lacking in any substance or meaning. Lamplight, a gimmicky town full of children that shouldn't exist. There's no reason for there to still be children there, and they've somehow managed to keep the super mutants out for 200 years, when they're a plague to everyone else in the wasteland. Colonel Autumn, a man with the IQ of a turnip who does bad things because he's a bad guy, even when those things are a detriment to his goals. The reveal of Eden being a computer, only for him to trust a rando wastelander in carrying out his plan to casually commit genocide when it makes no sense for the lone wanderer to do it. The super mutants, reskinned orcs with none of the lore, depth, or nuance of the originals, simply reduced to a generic enemy type that mindlessly screeches about killing and eating you. While there are nice things that are pretty to look at, and there's not much wrong with that, the fact that I can list all of these things shows Bethesda has completely misplaced their priorities. They're completely incapable of making narratively interesting NPCs and locations, much less sensical ones. And notice the common theme with everything he's talking about here? Blowing up Megaton is an iconic scene. Harold has a unique visual design. Tranquility Lane's black and white visuals. This is all surface level shit. Sure, the Megaton explosion looks neat, but there's no substance behind it. Harold looks cool, but his criticism of the quest was accurate. It was simplistic like most of Fallout 3's quests are, and additionally, there's not much to the moral choice, which I'll cover more later when we get to it. Point is, visuals alone don't make up for the story issues in a heavily story-focused game. Cool designs or visuals are superficial, and not that special when the story doesn't support it. You don't get points for style. If visuals alone are worth praising, then you might as well just watch a montage of impressive visual effects. Michael Bay's Transformer movies must all be gems if visuals alone are that big of a deal. Man, the story sure is shit, but look at them visual effects. I find when people are at the point of praising the visuals like this, it's often because there's not much else to praise. Bioshock Shipfinant is a visually impressive game, but that doesn't mean much when the entire rest of the game is complete fucking garbage. Same deal here. Fallout 3 has some nice visuals. I absolutely fucking love the gothic architecture of the buildings. But at the end of the day, I don't play Fallout to look at some neat visuals. They're meaningless if the story and narrative aren't there to back them up. 
even little moments in Fallout 3 were made to feel a bit more special by the structuring of main quests around the best known landmarks like the mall, the capitol building, the Washington Monument. Fallout 3 even managed to add a little bit of showmanship to just arriving in a new town, making it a bit of an event. From Megaton's gates pulling open, the crane at Rivet City, Little Lamplight's barricade. New Vegas had a couple of these moments too, like the statues at the entrance to the NCR outpost or the barricade into the strip, but too many towns you just walked in. The crane makes Rivet City feel cool and special and entering it for the first time matters. McCarran in New Vegas is technically a lot more important. It's the headquarters of the biggest faction in the Mojave. It's home to multiple quest givers and named characters. And you enter it through a gate. It's got a sign over the top of it. There's just nothing exciting there. Just walls stretching away in both directions. Yes, areas in New Vegas were made to look a bit more realistic. It's a matter of practicality over something needlessly elaborate. Oftentimes, the more elaborate something is, the more moving parts it has, the more there is that could go wrong. McCarran's gate is just that, a gate. Simple, but practical. Megaton's gate is flashy and totally nonsensical. The 200-year-old jet engine shouldn't even be functional. But even if we were to ignore that, there's so much that could go wrong with it. What if they can't power it anymore? What if a bunch of raiders decide to shoot at it and destroy it? since it's on the fucking outside of town for some reason. I swear to god, every time I look at Megaton I just find more and more issues. In the post-apocalypse, where resources are scarce, why would a group spend the time and resources designing and building an overly elaborate gate? I'm not saying it's absolutely out of the question, but it makes sense that there would be more practical gates and entranceways. Hell, look at Fallout 1 and 2. They never had anything needlessly elaborate. Just like New Vegas, most towns you just kinda walked into, or had simple gates. Furthermore, it's already been made fairly clear that Obsidian has extremely different priorities than Bethesda. If we're to look at where the classic Fallout games excelled, that being their stories, quests, locations, characters, and so forth, it is fairly obvious which game did a better job succeeding the previous entries. After this, he goes on at length about the Museum of Technology, and I don't have too much to say about it, so I'm just going to skip to the next point he really makes. Now that's a great dungeon. Plenty of combat, but plenty of ways to avoid it as well, if you're sneaky and skilled enough to do so. But it also leads me to a question I never even thought about until I made this video. I know this is a bit of a tangent, but why doesn't New Vegas have any real dungeons? I mean, it feels like they were planning for New Vegas to have dungeons, because the Bison Steve introduces them, and for ease I'll define a dungeon as an enclosed area of reasonable length with an objective at the end and some combination of traps, puzzles or enemies in the way. But then, after the Bison Steve, there's basically no other dungeon in New Vegas, other than vaults 11, 22 and 34. I actually went over the entire map and there's almost nothing. Helios 1's interior is acceptable if very short, Repcon headquarters is good, but other than that, I don't think there are any. And this isn't really a problem with New Vegas, it's just something that confuses me a bit, because Fallout 3 is full of big, interesting dungeons, like the Capitol Building, Evergreen Mills, the Statesman Hotel, Our Lady of Hope Hospital, Germantown Police Headquarters, Fort Constantine, Dunwich, so many others. But by comparison, New Vegas' ruins tend to be extremely small and open, and thus very quick to get through. So it's weird that this needs to be said, but Fallout isn't a series about dungeon crawling. If anything, this just feels like a carryover from Elder Scrolls, where much of the core gameplay revolves around dungeons. Again, Obsidian focused more on what mattered to a Fallout game. Quests, characters, and narrative. A bunch of random dungeons just for the sake of them existing would have been a waste of their already limited time. During the development of any game, there's really only so much you can do. To take Morrowind as an example, they wanted to have the entire province of Morrowind in the game, but that turned out to be impossible due to development limitations, and as a result they limited it to the island of Ardenfell, and they made up a lore reason that actually makes a lot of sense for why you can't go to the mainland. Now let's look at both games again. Fallout 3 has 18 side quests, which for the sake of defining terms, are quests that aren't part of the main story and show up in the pit boy to be tracked, 
and a short and incredibly poorly written main story. But it has a shit ton of random dungeons that aren't related to any quest, so they just exist to possibly be plundered if you happen to find them. Hell, let's be very generous to Fallout 3, and even include its unmarked and repeatable quests, which just to remind everyone, are extremely short and simplistic for the most part, and the repeatable quests are literally just trading garbage items for caps or karma. That brings Fallout 3 up to 57 quests outside of the main story. New Vegas, on the other hand, has over 70 tracked side quests alone, most of which are leagues better than anything in Fallout 3. Many of these quests have branching paths, are relevant to the game's ending, and have multiple ways to solve them. New Vegas also has a main story, with a choice of three faction paths and a lone wolf route. And while it certainly does have less dungeons, John is leaving quite a few out for some reason. So let's go through the game and check for dungeons. I realize that I'm literally just listing locations, but this is the only option I've got to respond to the idea that there aren't many dungeons besides the equivalent of no you. So here they are. Brockflower Cave, the Sunset Sarsaparilla Plant, the Nellis Array Building, Black Mountain, even though it's outdoors, it does basically function in the same way, and same goes for Quarry Junction. Morningstar Cavern, Fire Root Cavern, Searchlight East Gold Mine, Searchlight North Gold Mine. Tachata Cup Mine is a Legion owned location, but it does serve as a dungeon if you're doing the quest to rescue the NCR soldiers that are kept prisoner there. Walking Box Cavern, Dead Wind Cavern, Good Springs Cave is small but still counts. Ant Mound, even though it has few enemies. Repcon Test Site, naturally, as well as Repcon Headquarters. Allied Technologies Offices is a bit small, but still counts. Vaults 3, 11, 22, and 34. Charleston Cave. Bloodborne Cave. And I'm sure there's others I missed. I didn't check every single map marker, but this seems enough to prove his claim that New Vegas only has a couple dungeons wrong. Let me give all of you another pro tip entirely free of charge. If you're going to make any kind of claim about something that can fairly easily be proven wrong, it's best not to make that claim. For example, if I were to claim that Fallout 4 only had one joinable faction, that's something that someone could very easily prove me wrong about. In this particular case, proving John's claim wrong requires going through a good portion of the map and checking locations to see if they're dungeons or not. A bit of an intimidating task when you see all those map markers. However, after only checking a fraction of them, I found plenty of dungeons. Some were small, and some were pretty damn big. I can only take this as dishonesty on John's part. I'm only going by his own words here. He claimed he went over the entire map and only found a couple of dungeons, the ones he listed. I didn't go over the entire map, and I found a whole lot more than he did. John also makes this comparison, yet he never evaluates the dungeons he brings up as being a big deal, likely because they offer very little beyond being locations to loot and shoot. Take the Capitol building, for example. One faction of generic enemies is fighting another faction of generic enemies, and one side has a behemoth. So, is having a big arena with a bunch of enemies really all it takes to impress you? And looking at dungeons, such as the Dunwich building, there's a lot of flavoring to them that can make them interesting, but the locations offer very little to the game's setting, beyond being out-of-place set pieces. Compare, if you like, the Sunset Sarsaparilla plant with Fallout 3's Nuka-Cola plant. The Nuka-Cola plant is a huge, multi-stage dungeon, while the Sarsaparilla bottling plant is a small building with a handful of enemies scattered around. Yeah, Obsidian's design for most locations seems to have been making them appear like real places, rather than pointlessly expansive dungeons. The Sarsaparilla plant actually seems realistic to its function. The Nuka-Cola plant feels like a dungeon in a video game. Tell me, what is the point of the Nuka-Cola plant exactly? 
It's a little more than a hole in the ground, with enemies guarding loot, and it could play a small part in arguably one of the worst quests in the game. The handling of dungeons in Fallout 1 and 2 was far more pragmatic. They were locations significant to the world, quests, and characters. They never had any major locations be a dungeon purely for the sake of it. That's not even necessarily a criticism of Fallout 3 either. Dungeons are fine. But when I look at how little questing content there is to this game, it seems to me as though Bethesda focused on the wrong aspects, as those dungeons don't really make up for the lack of quests. But then again, more quests in Fallout 3 would likely result in more Power of the Atom and Nuka-Cola Challenge tier quests. I raised this on Twitter once, and someone suggested it might be as a result of New Vegas' short development time. Mapping out and developing large complex dungeons might not have been practical. It's an interesting potential theory, but after thinking about this for way too long, I realised something that I think might actually explain it. You see, there's definitely no ideological or thematic reason for there to be no dungeons in New Vegas, because Old World Blues is full of dungeons with really cool, unique Old World Blues rewards, and that's when the solution hit me. New Vegas can't have huge sprawling dungeons, because it doesn't have enough stuff to reward you with at the end. So before anything else, this is nothing more than pure speculation, and as such, it could be dismissed outright for that alone. However, let's actually respond to this anyways. So it's no secret that New Vegas was made in just 18 months, and as a result of such a short development cycle, many aspects of the game suffered, a good example being how the Legion is undercooked, and suffered from a lot of cut content. So rather than taking this explanation given to him on Twitter, which, as literally all these aforementioned details imply, it is extremely likely to be true. He just invents this weird theory that the game didn't have enough loot. I'm not even sure what the point of this segment is for. I thought this video was called Fallout 3 is better than you think, not New Vegas is worse than you think. Think about it, spending significant time and ammo getting to the end of an area would be extremely frustrating if there was nothing there at the end as a reward. It's the same reason that by the mid-game in Skyrim, I lose interest in going into every random cave, because leveled loot stops having any point once you can be certain it's going to be worse than whatever you've already crafted and enchanted. I'd say loot is a pretty shallow reason to be dungeon delving. I mean, it's not invalid or anything, but dungeons should typically involve quests or their own narrative. This isn't Elder Scrolls, where I'm going on hunts for ancient artifacts and plundering tombs. In the context of Fallout, dungeons have never really existed for this purpose. Going in for loot alone just seems a bit... pointless if there's no actual goal. What are you doing in this dungeon? To get loot. Why? To do the next dungeon. That's not progressing much, that's a loop. Just like Fallout 4's awful Radiant quests. Repcon test site, however, you're sent there with a goal as part of a quest. Any loot is a bonus. Regardless, all these Bethesda games always have that point where you just kind of stop doing dungeons. It's very much a quantity over quality issue. Bethesda makes decent dungeons, but there's so many that exist just to be a place full of baddies and loot, and not much else. Now Fallout 3 does very well in this regard, and it's one of the reasons why I think Fallout 3 nails open-ended exploration, because Fallout 3 has plenty of good stuff to reward you with, which provides a real benefit to your character, bobbleheads, skill books, and also schematics, because one version of almost every schematic can be found out in the wild. Fallout 3, therefore, had enough stuff that you could explore pretty much any random ruin and be fairly confident that you're going to find something genuinely useful there, a bare minimum, a handful of free skill points. And this is something I actually think the Bethesda Fallouts are best at, creating a big world that rewards exploring. You know what would be more rewarding? An interesting narrative or quest. Take Vault 11, for example. Only one quest leads here, a Brotherhood of Steel quest, so many players are likely to miss it. And if you aren't here on a quest? Well, you get to learn the story of what happened here. The truth behind these creepy election posters. I hate Nate. Or, don't vote for Glover, his family needs him. Or, trying to get people elected by making some harsh accusations like adulterer or communist sympathizer. And as you progress through the dungeon, you learn the horrifying truth of what happened here. 
Let's compare that to some of the dungeons John mentioned, such as the Capitol Building, full of Talon Mercs and Super Mutants. Or in other words, generic enemies plus a behemoth. No fucking clue how he got in there. You can't really pick sides. All there is to do is either kill everything, or wait for one side to win, then eliminate them and take the loot. Germantown Police Station, full of generic super mutants. Statesman Hotel, full of generic super mutants. Most of Fallout 3's dungeons are like this, and the ones that are fairly well designed are few and far between. Even those that do offer some sort of narrative, like the Dunwich Building, don't contribute anything to the overall narrative or world building in any meaningful way. In the case of Dunwich, it feels more like a half-assed Lovecraft reference that has absolutely nothing to do with the rest of the setting. Now, old Fallout managed to get around this by simply not having very many locations. There are 13 locations in Fallout 1 and 22 in Fallout 2. Everything else is just random encounters. Fallout 3 and 4, meanwhile, had far more locations, 163 in Fallout 3 and nearly double that in Fallout 4. And 3 kept them worth exploring with all the skill points, bobbleheads and schematics it liberally handed out, whereas 4 came up with the junk and crafting system that meant even small areas could be treasure troves as the game progressed, and your priorities shifted from adhesive to screws to aluminium to advanced components for top tier mods and power armour. New Vegas is, weirdly, perhaps the weakest game in this regard, because it has the large volume of locations from Fallout 3, slightly more in fact, 187 in the base game, but New Vegas genuinely struggles to make its smaller locations worth exploring, and the problem was, New Vegas took a lot of Fallout 3's rewards out. I don't know, if it's just the loot that makes an area worth exploring to you, that sounds like a you problem. Personally, exploring every random dungeon has just never been particularly interesting to me, even in my all-time favourite game, Morrowind. Bobbleheads were removed and replaced with the implant clinic, so effectively, all the bobbleheads could be purchased from one single location. This was likely to reduce how OP the bobbleheads were. They were free and gave an instant boost to the corresponding special or skill. Making them a paid service makes them a bit harder to get, especially if you're the kind of person who doesn't engage in the casino gambling. They're also limited based on endurance. You can only get so many before you hit a limit, making it harder to get that perfect character build with all tens and special. Schematics are gone, with most recipes instead immediately available but hidden behind skill checks, perks, or dialogue. And the number of skill books in New Vegas was vastly reduced as well. There are, I believe, 54 skill books in the New Vegas base game versus over 300 in Fallout 3. So John isn't making the argument he thinks he is here. Comparing the raw number of skill books in each game is entirely meaningless for his argument, as skill books are just generic items that can be placed in the world as the developers please. There is no difference between two big books of science you might find. It's the same ID in the editor. This means Obsidian simply added less skill books to the game space, but there's still an available option for dungeons if it was really that big of an issue for them. Also, Junk specifically mentions that recipes are now hidden in dialogue and skill checks, which makes it seem like there is some sort of problem with this choice. I can't tell if this is a genuine mistake on Junk's part or not, simply because he's been really disingenuous in earlier parts of his video. New Vegas' solution to this problem was uh, the star bottle caps which is a pretty disappointing reward given you can generate those at random from drinking sarsaparilla, which can be found everywhere and cheaply bought all over as well. How is the star bottle cap the solution? It seems to me like this was just a long-term and optional collection goal, and not specifically made to be a replacement for anything. This seems to be just another assumption. In fact, I went over every location in New Vegas and recorded the areas with no reward other than generic container loot and a star bottle cap. And they are Searchlight North Gold Mine, the Smith Mesa Prospecting Camp, Bradley Shack, the Emergency Service Railway, Coyote Mines, El Dorado Gas and Service, Mountain Shadows Campground, Blue Paradise Vacation Rentals, the Gypsum Train Yard, the Wrecked Highwoman, Harper Shack, and the Snyder Prospector Camp. So quite a few, and naturally all of those have to be either extremely short dungeons or single room areas, or the effort to reward ratio will be frustrating for the player. I genuinely don't understand what the issue is here. 
There's nothing actually wrong with these locations. They actually make sense given the world they're in. Not everywhere is going to be big, expansive dungeons. And even Fallout 3 has its fair share of small locations that didn't have much going on. Also, as I've already mentioned, loot isn't a primary motivation for going into dungeons in New Vegas. And dungeons aren't the focus either. Once again, New Vegas focused on dealing with characters and conflicts, not random useless dungeons that exist for no other reason than to be plundered for loot. Now for full disclosure, New Vegas did have one other award it could use. The number of weapons in New Vegas is much higher, and thus so is the number of unique variants that can be found. But even then, New Vegas didn't like leaving those in caves or ruins for a diligent explorer to find. Often, they request rewards bought for shops or otherwise held by named characters. Would you believe I actually did the maths on this? In New Vegas, there are 20 unique weapon variants found out in the wild, the ones on screen right now. But another 16 are held by named characters, available in shops or quest rewards. So now John is making points that go against his entire argument here. New Vegas has few dungeons due to a lack of loot, but look at all this loot that isn't in dungeons. Additionally, when you consider that some unique weapons don't even have a new model, or are just a reskin of an existing model, it seems like they could have done a bit more if a lack of loot were really an issue. Additionally, if they really made few dungeons due to a lack of loot, they could have always just left the bobbleheads in. All signs point to it being a deliberate choice. And that's completely ignoring the Gunrunner's Arsenal guns, all of which go straight into shops. Yeah, no fucking shit, Sherlock! It's called Gunrunner's Arsenal. It's simply meant to add more weapons to the game. Are you implying they should have just made a bunch of random dungeons to put these weapons into? In their DLC that was just meant to add weapons? What the fuck is even your point here? Fallout 3 is happy to scatter its rewards across the map, while New Vegas concentrates its rewards in towns and in the hands of important NPCs. Wow, that's actually a pretty good representation of the design philosophies behind these games. It might be a good hint as to why so many people prefer New Vegas. Obsidian put the rewards in towns, and in the hands of important characters. Or in other words, they focused more development time on characters, town locations, and quests. You know, the things that are pretty important to RPGs, as well as Fallout 1 and 2. Bethesda, on the other hand, didn't spend quite that much time on their stories and quests, Instead, focusing on putting a totally unnecessary amount of dungeons into the game that, as John has pointed out, primarily serve to give the player loot and not much else. Also, I know I'm repeating myself here, but I feel this is a really important point to make. This video is called Fallout 3 is Better Than You Think. It's a video made to explain the good points of Fallout 3. So why spend so much time ragging on New Vegas for supposedly not having enough dungeons? Because this doesn't actually prove that Fallout 3 is better in any way. Not much of New Vegas' praise consists of how well the dungeons are designed, because they definitely weren't the focus of the game. It seems rather redundant to go over your way to prove Fallout 3 had more dungeon-related content when people are already aware of this. Still. Let's move on to the next big important discussion, and this one's a big one. The story. And this one's about to start off well, by the way, because I'm about to positively compare part of Fallout 3's storytelling to New Vegas, so get your best angry comments ready. And there it is again. So rather than being more neutral in his tone towards the audience, it seems as though John is trying to antagonize a certain part of that audience, rather than trying to convince them of anything. But instead, let's just start off for a second with Fallout 1, because Fallout 1's overall story structure is great, and part of that is because it unfolds neatly as you progress. When you start out, you're not going on a big adventure. You live in a small community. That community has a localised problem in the form of the water chip. You're heading to a nearby vault you already know the location of to find a replacement. The scale is small, but as you progress, you learn more about the world, and you can learn quicker or slower depending on how much you choose to explore and ask around. The crucial point is, you might not even meet a super mutant until Necropolis. The Brotherhood, meanwhile, are only mentioned for the very first time in the hub. 
Fallout 3 follows a similarly elegant series of plot escalations. It starts off again as a small personal story of somebody trying to find their only surviving relative, who ends up getting introduced to the fact there are other conflicts happening in the wasteland as they hunt down clues. But it's not until you reach Rivet City that anyone explains anything about Project Purity. Nobody mentions the Enclave at all until they show up and start murdering people. I wouldn't call anything about Fallout 3 elegant. Sure, there's something of an escalating conflict, but it doesn't mean a whole lot when the entire story is shit. It's an imitation without the substance. There isn't really a plot related to the super mutants, they're just kinda there. They want the green stuff, literally only mentioned in an extremely easy to miss line that's set at complete random. You meet the Brotherhood, and they're generic, pure good guys. Then you learn about Project Purity, which doesn't seem nearly as important as it should, because, as I've already covered, the water issue is barely touched upon. Then, five minutes after work on Project Purity starts again, the Enclave shows up and takes over. Keep in mind, this is more than half the main story at this point, and most of it is doing menial tasks. Do a chore for Moriarty, or get the info from him some other way. Do a dungeon to talk to a guy who tells you to do a dungeon so he'll give you the info you want. After that you go to Rivet City, are told to go to a dungeon to get the information you need, which leads you to a set piece. Then you return to Rivet City, then return to Project Purity, flip some switches and change some fuses, and the big bads, who I've already explained are totally nonsensical, show up and take over. Literally, the rest of the main story is two dungeons, Vault 87 and Raven Rock, then the Robot Death March. Looking at the overall story and narrative, it feels extremely weak, even falling short in some aspects when compared to Fallout 4. Fallout 3's plot mindlessly borrows plot points from Fallout 1 and 2, such as the FEV and the Gek. Has the same problem as Oblivion, where you don't feel like the main character, and most egregiously, has a generic good guy versus evil plot in a series that has previously done a great job of humanizing its antagonists. The Enclave of Fallout 2, similar to 3, had extremely fanatic viewpoints, but the generic foot soldiers and civilians you can meet in Navarro and parts of the oil rig showed a side of the Enclave that reminded the player that these aren't generic henchmen. They're actual people who have been indoctrinated into Enclave ideals. In sharp contrast, Fallout 3 shaped them into some generic agents of chaos who seem solely motivated by... Well, it's not exactly clear. John isn't even right about no one talking about the Enclave before they show up in more ways than one. And one of those ways is one he specifically mentioned earlier because it helped his point. And once you get to Springvale, you see the eyebot in the distance. Yeah, the very first area that most players are going to encounter has an iBot playing Enclave propaganda on Infinite Loop, and the iBot itself only does an extremely basic path going up and down the street. Not even mentioning the rest of the iBots you find in the wasteland. Additionally, Nathan and Megaton, you know, the very first town in the entire fucking game, the town John knows the location of every NPC's home, will constantly talk about how great the Enclave is, it's literally his entire character to be a dumb cartoon that mindlessly praises the Enclave with no critical thought, to the point of being petty towards the rest of the world. God bless the USA and nowhere else. But it gets worse yet, because Three Dog, the character you encounter in the main fucking story, actually has dialogue lines talking about the Enclave. They can't, not against those kind of enemies. They just run away and hide, or they stay and die. They just ain't right. So that's where I enter the picture. I fight the good fight with GNR as my gun. The sound of truth goes out across the capital wasteland. Hell, someone's got to counter that bullshit on the Enclave station. Without this place, DC would be filled with that crap the Enclave keeps shoveling out of their radio station, festering with mutants. Someone's gotta tell the Wastelanders what time it is, and Three Dog is the one to do it. 
No one knows what Eden and his horsemen of the apocalypse are up to, but you can be sure it isn't in the common man's best interest. And it gets even worse yet, because even the Brotherhood members guarding him have lines about the Enclave too. This is the last free radio station in the entire DC area. The rest of the airwaves are clotted up with Enclave propaganda. I wouldn't believe a word they say anywhere else. Well, the only other station that comes through nice and clear on the radio is the Enclave station. All they spew is a bunch of nonsense and propaganda. Galaxy News Radio reports on what's really happening. To say no one mentions the Enclave before they show up is patently false. So Fallout 3's elegant escalation of events is to introduce you to a group that has no significant plot relevance besides being enemies who get in your way. A group that has abandoned its core principles to be generic good guys and hardly resemble what they once were as a result. And a group that is too stupid to survive that is led by incompetent idiots who are bad guys for the sake of being villains in a video game. Fallout 4 follows a similar principle. You start off on a small personal journey and then we introduce other factions and conflicts as they become directly relevant to you. New Vegas is, to my mind, the weakest Fallout game in this regard, and it's something I don't see mentioned much. How is it the weakest, exactly? The game introduces you to each of its major factions, and tensions escalate as the game progresses. The game introduces the idea of siding with factions through the conflict of the Powder Gangers with Good Springs. This escalates at Prim, which the Powder Gangers have taken over, and the NCR are monitoring the situation, giving us a quick introduction to them. Then in Neptune, we meet the Legion, and get a first-hand experience of how ruthless they are. Volpez asks you to spread word of what they've done, further showing us information about the Legion, and directing us to interact with the NCR more as a result. Further down the road, we reach Novak, and in order to get the information we need, we're sent to Repcon for Come Fly With Me. A quest that itself is a series of escalating conflicts which can be solved peacefully, which then leads us over to Boulder City in the conflict between the NCR and the Cons. And if you missed the peaceful ending for Come Fly With Me, there's another one here that's harder to miss that expands upon the idea of groups conflicting with one another. With Ghost Town Gunfight and Run Good Springs Run, you're forced to choose a side should you decide to complete the quest. There is no peaceful option. This teaches us that groups exist within the world that are in conflict with one another, that won't back down, and can't be convinced to turn around and go home. Boulder City Showdown expands upon this by showing us that peaceful options are available in some scenarios, and by having a fairly low speech check as a requirement, it further shows us that certain skills will be necessary to achieve the best endings we might want in any given scenario, while at the same time being low enough for a relatively early quest in the game. After talking to the cons, we learn about Benny at the Strip, and once there, we're directed to meet Mr. House, and after leaving the Lucky 38, we're approached by the NCR because we've become a person of interest to them and they'll even forgive any crimes you may have committed against them up until this point. Similarly, after confronting Benny, the Legion approaches you with a similar deal. The main story up until this point is consistently building upon its factions and expanding upon its ideas, especially when it comes to the NCR, which you have the most interaction with. We've met all the major players, and a few smaller yet important groups and it continues on from there, dealing with the Brotherhood, the Casino Families, the Boomers, and other minor groups relatively speaking, such as the Kings, Followers of the Apocalypse, and even Marcus and the Night King of Jacobstown, further teach us more about the world and the conflicts going on within it, with different characters giving their opinions on each of the main factions. To say New Vegas is the weakest in this regard, by extension saying that both Fallout 3 and Fallout 4 did better, is absolutely fucking absurd. It's like unironically saying a 1997 Prius 
is faster than the USS Enterprise. New Vegas is, to my mind, the weakest Fallout game in this regard, and it's something I don't see mentioned much. Maybe there's a reason you don't see this mentioned much, John. Because it's wrong. But let's just quickly go over the Ron Perlman introductions. Oh, I thought we were talking about how things escalate during the main story. I guess we're moving on. John makes the claim that New Vegas is the weakest in this regard, and he completely fails to substantiate it and just moves on. Likely because the only reason he can even make this argument is by specifically not substantiating it, because to do so would prove it wrong. You see, in Fallout 3, Ron lets you know there's been a nuclear war, some people survived it thanks to the vaults, and that's where you'll be starting out, which is pretty much the same intro as in Fallout 1. In New Vegas, before you get to play the game at all, Ron lets you know there was a big nuclear war, but that was ages ago, and now the NCR is the largest regional power in the southwest, but their resources are a bit strained, so they sent scouts east, and they found Hoover Dam in New Vegas, so they sent their army there to fix it, but there was this other army called Caesar's Legion. They also wanted the dam, so there was this massive battle, but that was a few years ago, and the NCR won, but it was close. So the NCR have the dam now, but the Legion is still nearby, and they're totally going to attack it again. Also, New Vegas is still all Las vegas -y, and there's this bloke called Mr. House. He runs things there, and he's got lots of robots working for him, and you're a courier, and you were delivering something to the Strip, but that's gone wrong, and then we go straight into another cutscene, where we meet Benny, and the Khan faction, and the Hint of a Conspiracy, and then we get to play the game. And I'm sorry, but we didn't need any of that information. That is just a massive exposition dump. That is pure telling, not showing. And I'm utterly baffled that managed to make it into the final game, because we don't need any of it. So again, sometimes telling is necessary in fiction. John keeps bringing up telling, not showing, as if it's this high crime of writing, when again, as mentioned earlier, it's a guideline, not a rule set in stone. Do you really not understand what an intro like this is even for? This is something plenty of games and movies do. It's meant to set the stage, so the audience has an understanding of where everyone is starting, essentially. Is it bad that Star Wars or Terminator have an intro text crawl or narration to explain the necessary information for those stories to start? The computer which controlled the machines, Skynet, sent two Terminators back through time. Their mission? to destroy the leader of the human resistance, John Connor. The first Terminator was programmed to strike at me in the year 1984, before John was born. The second was set to strike at John himself when he was still a child. As before, the resistance was able to send a lone warrior, a protector for John. It was just a question of which one of them would reach him first. In both movies, we get the information about the Empire and the Terminator, respectively, in the actual movie from the characters. But that doesn't mean the intro is worthless. It sets the stage, so we know what's going on. It also makes sense to do it in this way in New Vegas, as you're not starting in a vault, and your character would likely know this basic information. I've also got to point it out, but John starts speaking even more rapidly here, as a way to childishly exaggerate just how much information you're getting here. As if it's totally overwhelming. It just comes across as really dishonest when you're just learning a few basic facts. The NCR and the Legion fought a huge war, but that was a few years ago. The Legion is an army of slaves, and the NCR emulate pre-war America. House is a shady dude and Betty shoots you. It's entirely unnecessary, and comes across as a really bad faith argument. The NCR is expanding. The Legion is an army of slaves. They fought over the dam, and are going to fight again for it. A mysterious figure runs the city of New Vegas, and this dude shoots you in the head over a package you're delivering. The entire intro to New Vegas is under five minutes long, and the narrator is talking rather slowly, which is why John needs to exaggerate so hard here. The information we need to begin New Vegas is, you're a courier, Benny robbed you, he's got a distinctive look so we can ask after him, go find him. All the other information is irrelevant. The second town you find is held by the NCR. They could very easily have given you a quick NCR history lesson. Plus, imagine how much more impactful Nipton would have been walking down the street of crucifixes, seeing Romans emerging from the town hall if you hadn't already been specifically told there was an army of Roman-style slavers around. Except Trudy in Good Springs will give away what the Legion is anyways if you talk to her. Unless, of course, residents of the town are just supposed to completely ignore one of the main factions, that is. 
Besides, the other information isn't relevant at all. It's a primer for the main factions of the entire game, so you know what you're getting into. The player is given this information in the introduction, because unlike previous games, your character in New Vegas has a degree of experience in the Wasteland. This information is supposed to be common knowledge for most people, including you. More importantly than that, though, is how John just contradicted himself in a major way. Like, seriously, John, did you just not redraft at all? Are you even aware that you contradicted yourself? So earlier in the video, John complained about how Lanius' backstory is told to you. At least Autumn actually showed up earlier in the game. At least we've seen him before. At least he's actually done something against me and against my family. At least some effort was made to show, not tell. Linnaeus is literally some guy who we've never met before the final confrontation. All we know is some vague stories about how mean he is. Now he's complaining about the intro, telling you the history of these groups. And his solution is to have an NPC tell you the history. Literally the exact same thing he complained about earlier. So an NPC telling the history of Lanius is bad because it's just some guy in a hat, and at least Autumn and Fallout 3 did stuff to you. But an NPC telling the history of their faction is a good thing, because I guess it's time to dunk on New Vegas again to show why Fallout 3 is good. Right. This seems like a pretty obvious double standard, and only reinforces the idea that he's here to defend Fallout 3 from criticism at any cost. To the point he's not applying consistent standards to these two games, the very thing he complained about earlier when it's done against Fallout 3. You see, disliking Fallout 3 is a game with some crazy rules, like it's totally okay to criticise Fallout 3 for doing something that Fallout New Vegas did and then just politely pretend New Vegas is invisible for a minute. At least some effort was made to show not tell. Linnaeus is literally some guy who we've never met before the final confrontation. All we know is some vague stories about how mean he is. The second town you find is held by the NCR. They could very easily have given you a quick NCR history lesson. And people wondered why I got the impression that he didn't like New Vegas when he constantly does this shit throughout the video. Regardless of whether or not it's his favorite game, that doesn't change the fact that he's being incredibly biased in favor of Fallout 3 and against New Vegas throughout this entire video. Additionally, why would these rando NPCs just give you a history lesson on their faction? Still, that's a fairly minor point. The actual discussion around Fallout 3's story breaks into two parts. Writing and plot. Let's start with writing, because weirdly it just became part of the accepted narrative to say that Fallout 3 has bad writing. In all the commotion, Miss Beatrice suffered a rather bad sprain in her left toe. The big one. Obviously, I had no choice but to amputate. The leg. Yeah, I'm sorry to say the operation was uh, not a uh, success. I even stitched a little smiley face in you to keep up your spirits. It's kind of hard to see from your side, though. This is a sad day. A day that every man, woman, and child will remember as they toil in the English salt mines as slaves. Yeah, sorry, I'm not having that. Fallout 3's got some great writing and some amazing voice acting to go with it. Are you referring to character dialogue specifically for this point? I'm pretty sure when people say the writing is bad, they're also referring to quests and story and world building, all of which are garbage. Bad dialogue is usually referenced specifically as its own thing, but just for the sake of being thorough, I'm going to cover both versions. So in terms of dialogue, he doesn't substantiate why it's good in Fallout 3. He just gives a few random examples of lines from characters that he likes. Even if these specific lines were good, they're still incredibly minor. When it comes to the story dialogue, it just doesn't compare. Eden wants you to poison the water to kill everything that is genetically impure. Why? Because that's what the Enclave did in Fallout 2. The good people of this country cannot regain control while mutation runs rampant through our land. My soldiers cannot stem the tide, nor can the cult you've come into contact with, this Brotherhood of Steel. 
mutations like the super mutants, and ghouls must be purged from our society, our world, before we can proceed anew. Where others have failed, I believe your father's work can succeed. The purifier your father helped create has the ability to provide clean water to the whole of this capital wasteland. With a simple modification, it can be used to distribute agents that destroy mutated creatures upon ingestion. In time, we could eliminate all mutations in the wasteland. At the same time, the good people of the world regain their health. I need you to make the modification necessary for this to succeed. Anyone or anything that has been affected by mutation will be eliminated. You will likely be immune thanks to your upbringing in the vault. Likewise, the good people of the Enclave will be unaffected as well. I understand that you may have become sympathetic to certain individuals in your travels. Individuals this will eliminate. Please recognize that the fate of our entire country rests on this plan. Sacrifices must be made for the greater good. To make matters worse, he can't even provide a proper reason to do it, beyond the mutants basically deserving it. What a fucking waste of Malcolm McDowell. He deserved a better written character. It's pretty shallow and just a carbon copy of the Enclave in Fallout 2. New Vegas, on the other hand, has some depth and nuance to most of its major characters, and the game's dialogue conveys this. Caesar is driven by his philosophy. I used Imperial Rome as the model for my legion precisely because it was so foreign, so alien. I'd seen what had become of the NCR's attempts to emulate the culture of pre-war America, the infighting, the corruption. Rome was a highly militarized autocracy that effectively integrated the foreign cultures it conquered. It dedicated its citizens to something higher than themselves, to the idea of Rome itself. In Rome, I found a template for a society equal to the challenges of the post-apocalyptic world. A society that could and would survive. A society that could prevent mankind from fracturing and destroying itself in this new world by establishing a new Pax Romana. It means a nationalist, imperialist, totalitarian, homogenous culture that obliterates the identity of every group it conquers. Long-term stability at all costs. The individual has no value beyond his utility to the state, whether as an instrument of war or production. No, I'll destroy it because it's inevitable that it be destroyed. It's Hegelian dialectics, not personal animosity. How do I put this basically enough? It's a philosophical theory, the kind you might encounter if you took time to read some books. The fundamental premise is to envision history as a sequence of dialectical conflicts. Each dialectic begins with a proposition, a thesis, which inherently contains or creates its opposite, an antithesis. Thesis and antithesis. The conflict is inevitable, but the resolution of the conflict yields something new, a synthesis. Eliminating the flaws in each leaving behind common elements and ideas. The bombs wiped the slate clean. Human civilization descended to a level of ignorance that effectively set our cultural progress back to zero. The NCR has all the problems of the ancient Roman Republic. Extreme bureaucracy, corruption, extensive senatorial infighting. Just as with the ancient Republic, it is natural that a military force should conquer and transform the NCR into a military dictatorship. Thesis and antithesis. The Colorado River is my Rubicon. The NCR Council will be eradicated. But the new synthesis will change the Legion as well. From a basically nomadic army to a standing military force that protects its citizens and the power of its dictator. What else did you want to know? Do you want my opinion as a former citizen or future conqueror? Actually, my opinion is the same either way. 
As a young man, I was taught to venerate President Tandy of Shady Sands, the founding mother of the new California Republic. Did you know her presidency lasted 52 years? And that her father, Aradesh, was the Republic's first president? Does that sound like a democracy to you? Or a hereditary dictatorship? Because the council didn't dare oppose her. She was too popular. She had the people's love. So things ran smoothly, more or less. And as soon as she was gone, as soon as there really could be democracy, what happened then? Ever since losing its queen, the NCR has been weaker, more diffuse. Democracy has been its weakness, not its strength. Greed runs rampant. The government is corrupt, accepting bribes from Brahmin barons and landowners to the detriment of citizens. The NCR is a loose conglomerate of individuals looking out for themselves. It's lost virtue. No one cares about the collective, the greater good. It's not built to last. I'm just hastening the inevitable. Of course, the most powerful my legion has faced. Also the first to which I am ideologically opposed. Until now, every tribe I've conquered has been so backwards and stunted. Enslavement has been a gift bestowed upon them. My conquest of the Mojave will be a glorious triumph, marking the transition of the Legion from a basically nomadic tribe to a genuine empire. Just as my namesake campaigned in Gaul before he crossed the Rubicon, so have I campaigned and will cross the Colorado. House has a vision for the future. New Vegas is more than a city. It's the remedy to mankind's derailment. The city's economy is a blast furnace in which can be forged the steel of a new rail line running straight to a new horizon. What is the NCR? A society of people desperate to experience comfort, ease, luxury. A society of customers. With all that money pouring in, give me 20 years and I'll reignite the high technology development sectors. 50 years, and I'll have people in orbit. 100 years, and my colony ships will be heading for the stars to search for planets unpolluted by the wrath and folly of a bygone generation. Even characters outside the main factions are written intelligently. Marcus doesn't want you to kill the mercenaries, as it's likely a trap. As for the story and world-building side of this, just think of everything I've covered until this point. The extreme shallowness of power of the atom, and the lack of impact it has on the world. The nonsense of lamplight, having no source for new children. Or how super mutants haven't managed to tear down their cheap wooden barricades. Or how absurd Autumn and Young Clive are. Now let's go another level deeper. Let's pull another example of terrible world building out, and tackle it really quickly. So most of the residents at Tenpenny Tower have no source for their income most of them seem entirely detached from the rest of the world. They're just rich because Bethesda said they were. Don't think about it, don't ask questions. But to illustrate how little effort it would take to expand on this world, let's imagine a different scenario. Let's take Michael Hawthorne as an example. An otherwise generic tenpenny resident, with little relevance and literally nothing to do. He even says so himself. So first off, there shouldn't really be nothing to do in the post-apocalypse. In the fact, they literally wrote this into the game shows what a massive lack of world building the game has. Now let's imagine a hypothetical. Instead, he's actually an important person in the capital wasteland. Let's say he ran a gun manufacturing business. By changing this detail alone about him and supporting it in game, it adds tons of world building and quest potential. He has a factory, employees, customers, caravans for materials and product deliveries. By running this business, we know where he gets his money from, rather than it just being the power of the developers saying this is how it is. It shows people are trying to not only rebuild, but also make new things. It gives the source for weapons to be so abundant. It adds plenty of quest potential from making deals with different groups, protecting caravans, sorting out labor disputes, and so forth. To take another example, let's say there are active farms in the world, 
but they used slave labor. This would make it so Paradise Falls actually has customers, but it also raises quite the moral dilemma. Do I free these slaves at the cost of the scarce food in the wasteland becoming all that much more scarce? Or do I allow these people to remain in forced labor so the people of Wasteland can eat? And by extension, this adds great morality to pretty much every settlement you have to deal with in the game, as they now have to deal with the same quandary, and dealing with the discussion of what is the right thing to do. It could be a multi-layered conflict with opposing sides, an entire faction of people willing to fight against slavery at any cost, versus people who only care about surviving day to day. They're not outright evil, but through participating in the system, they're supporting the slavers. See how these small changes have a huge impact on the world? The point being, because so little thought was put into the world, it ends up feeling like everything is just in stasis until you approach it. Then suddenly, everything becomes active, and the world ends up feeling more like a set than an actual world. This series of set pieces that is supposed to be the game's world ends up feeling like a Fallout-themed amusement park, rather than an actual game setting, because next to no thought was put into how anything in this world works. Still, that's just the script. What most people want to talk about is the plot. I've never fully understood the hate here either. Really? You said you looked into it at the start of the video. You're telling me none of the criticism you've seen properly covers the main story? Even ignoring that, you've never looked at it critically yourself? This shit falls apart basically immediately. So it's a bit weird you've never noticed its issues before. At a high level, as I discussed earlier, key information about the world is unveiled as it becomes relevant, slowly expanding the story from a personal one into one where you're a key figure that deals with major factions, which strikes me as somewhat similar to New Vegas' structure of hunting down the chip in Act 1 and through your actions in that hunt coming to the attention of major players in the world who therefore want to deal with you going forward. But some people seem to have a real issue with the structure of Act 1 in Fallout 3. The story of leaving the vault and tracking down your dad. To revisit H-Bomber Guy's well-known critique, he dislikes how you move around the game world, running into major players and factions as you go, walking from clue to clue, the overarching story boiling down to, and I quote, you're still following this one guy's trail. Again, I find this an odd criticism, because I've never seen anyone hate on New Vegas' first act, even though it's pretty much exactly the same. You spend the first act trying to track down one guy who you can run straight to if you know where you're going and how to get there, but most players will be following the road from clue to clue, running into major characters and factions on the way. I find the fade into Benny here funny, as if John's point is in any way valid or accurate. So what we have here is a complete misrepresentation of another YouTuber again. As if the first time wasn't bad enough. H-Bomb never said he dislikes running into major players and factions, the point of what he was saying is that it was all pointless busy work. With just this one location, you've actually been shown two places to go. On top of that, you actually can't get into the vault without a rope. Luckily, you now know of somewhere where you might find one. No objective marker needs to pop up to let you know you need to find a rope with an arrow floating over the people who can sell you one. You go there, you see you need one, and then it's up to you to find it. This establishes a very important narrative and thematic throughline. You're told to do something or go somewhere, but doing that isn't so straightforward. You have to be resourceful to make things work. The game is saying, what you have to do is not going to be obvious. Use your head. This is capped off by how, once you do get a rope and descend to the bottom of Vault 15, you find the lower levels have been completely destroyed and you're going to have to search elsewhere. So the only instruction you've been given leads to a dead end. None of the people in Shady Sands have probably ever seen a computer in their lives. You have to find your own leads from here on out. The game doesn't hold your hand, but it nudges useful options into your path for you to work with as you see fit. Now it's just you, the wasteland, and, hopefully, somewhere, a water chip. Finding out where one is, and figuring out how to get it, forms the basis of the entire first half of the game. It's a free-form journey you venture on yourself. Compare and contrast with the search for your dad, where there's always an objective marker pointing to your next breadcrumb which will tell you where to go next, marked on your radar of course, until you find him. There's no actual adventuring for the player to do. I think this is why a lot of players ignore the story for a lot of their time playing the game. The story is so unengaging and requires so little effort or thought on your part that your brain sort of slides off it and you go off to mess about with Tenpenny Tower or those vampire guys or just wander around listening to the radio. 
Fallout 1 always makes you feel like you're the hero on a journey by straightforwardly putting the onus on the player to connect the dots, while handing you places to look in an order of increasing complexity and danger based on where players are most likely to go next in their mission. It's freeform, and yet it's also subtly structured. You're always searching for the water chip, always on your guard for someone who might happen to be able to help put some pieces of the puzzle together, and when side quests happen, they're also engaging, and they're introduced in an organic, entertaining way. I go see Killian, who is like a shopkeeper as well as a sheriff. While he doesn't know anything about the chip or vaults, and actively gets annoyed by vault dwellers who live lives of safety and complacency, he seems like a nice person, and has stuff to sell that can help you out. Then a guy comes in and tries to murder him. Obviously you help out. Then Killian's like, we know Gizmo's behind this, but we're law and order type guys, so we have to follow procedure. Next thing you know, you're wiretapping Gizmo's office, or getting him to confess to wanting to murder Killian into a tape recorder. Wait. Do you see what the game's done? You've reached a point where you're pulling classic cop show hijinks, and it all happened completely organically from walking into a store to ask about the water chip. It's badass, and the side quest is not only entertaining and fun side content, but despite being technically totally optional, the game almost forces you to get involved from how it introduces it to you. There isn't just an optional dialogue choice where you ask Killian if he has any side quests, and he's like, yeah, maybe go to a place and shoot some guys and bring me back a MacGuffin. You get involved with the story of this town simply in the process of walking into it. Junktown and Junktown's completely optional additions to the game are peak game design because they present themselves to you naturally. Fallout, despite being made in the 90s before games went mainstream and simplified themselves for a wider audience, is incredibly good at getting people into it. That's why it's so beloved by so many people. Let's contrast with the first town in Fallout 3. You go to Megaton because your game's objective market tells you to. You walk into a bar and a man says, I knew your dad and I'll tell you where to go if you do a thing for me. But if you hack his computer or talk to his employee for five seconds, you don't need to do that at all. The most freedom you have in your journey to see your dad is how much pointless busy work for other people you have to do. Instead of the options put in your path being different rewards for different actions, most of the rewards are how much side content you want to skip. After that, you go to Galaxy News Radio and see Three Dog, because that's where the objective Marcus says, and then eventually Three Dog tells you he knows where your dad went. But first, would you like to do an optional quest for me? No? Okay, well he went to Rivet City. Alright. So you go to Rivet City. They say he went somewhere else. You go there, you clear out the mutants there, your objective mark tells you- If you are worried about the story, don't be. It's very well structured and focused. And then you go there and blah blah blah, you're still following this one fucking guy's trail. Which brings me to the game's biggest single narrative and gameplay problem. The main character is never the main character. Your dad is the main character for most of it, doing his own thing for his own reasons. All the game's truly big decisions, the decision to abandon his life's work and raise his son, the decision to leave and try again, the decision to kill himself in order to prevent the Enclave from taking over, you spend too much of this game watching your dad have a much more intricate story. But even when your dad dies, you're not left to pick up the pieces and make things work for yourself. Dr. Lee immediately takes over and starts giving you the orders for where to go next. We've got to evacuate now. Don't wander off. We're going to need you. John says of this is pretty much exactly the same as the first act in New Vegas. However, there's a far bigger issue here, and this is the point where I actually have to stop the video and talk about it. And that's the extremely dishonest method John is using to respond to other people here. Once could be an accident, twice a coincidence, but three times is a pattern. With Indigo Gaming, he took his quote out of context, and responded to it in such a way that it was convenient to debunk the out of context quote. He additionally strawmanned Indigo by adding in the issue of realism, which was not something Indigo mentioned, and further applied it to an entirely different part of the game in order to debunk it. With H-Bomb criticizing Autumn as a villain, he again took an out of context quote and left the substance of what H-Bomb was saying out and singled out the line that Autumn is just some guy that is talked down and leaves, which John then uses a whataboutism fallacy to complain about Lanius, and completely ignored the entire criticism H-Bomb was actually making. Now, John takes H-Bomb out of context again and ignores the substance of what he's saying, focusing on the line about following one guy while completely ignoring the fact the H-Bomb's criticism is all about how Fallout 3 leads you around by the nose, 
and never really makes you think about any difficult choices. And H-Bomb is additionally criticizing how overly simplistic most of the main story is. Go to a guy who tells you to go to a guy who tells you to go to a girl who tells you to go to a holotape that tells you to go to a dungeon. There's nothing to really figure out for yourself. It's just a sequence of mindlessly following orders for a large portion of the game. Even after Vault 112, the main story remains simplistic, with the only major choices being good versus extreme evil options. And again, John recontextualizes H-Bomb's comment and adds shit to it that was never there in the first place. To revisit H-Bomb a guy's well-known critique, he dislikes how you move around the game world running into major players and factions as you go, walking from clue to clue, the overarching story boiling down to, and I quote, you're still following this one guy's trail. That wasn't actually the criticism H-Bomb had made against the game. This is something John invented entirely to counter what H-Bomb had said. Or in other words, he's strawmanning him. So here we have three examples of John responding directly to points from other people's videos, and all three times, he takes quotes out of context, leaves out the important information and the substance of what they were saying, just to respond to an extremely cherry-picked line, and even then, he goes above and beyond to twist what was said, or apply it to different parts of the game than what H-Bomb and Indigo were referring to. Not to mention the logical fallacies he uses, such as false equivalence or whataboutism or strawmanning, straight up inventing arguments that were never made in order to counter them. All of this paints a pretty clear picture that John is responding in bad faith, that he's not looking at the actual criticisms that are being made, but that he's taking something else away from them entirely and responding to that instead. It is absurdly fucking dishonest to argue in this fashion, because it's easy to take select quotes and do whatever the fuck you want with them. As John has done three times now in this video, and respond to that instead of what was actually said. This is why in my responses, I play large blocks of the video I'm responding to, so those watching can see for themselves what's being said exactly, and what the response to that is. Because the context is what matters. Now this brings literally everything else he's responding to into question as well, as his entire video is a defense video. He's defending the game from much of the criticism it has received, but he's not plainly referencing any actual articles or videos that his audience can see. He's just framing the criticisms on his own, which allows him to present them in literally any way he wants. So if he's going to dishonestly respond to other YouTubers, why wouldn't he do it with these other criticisms as well? In fact, I have examples of it earlier in the video. Now this is where I start getting a tiny bit confused, because the criticism I see over and over about Fallout 3 is, there's no freedom, there's no choice, there are no skill check resolutions, there's no opportunity to roleplay, but Fallout 3's tutorial section seems to be trying to provide exactly that. Now, I agree, it's unrealistic that if you shoot children, they don't die. The thing is, no game will ever be 100% realistic. Of course, the only reason child murder actually ever gets brought up at all is because Fallout 1 lets you do it. Oh, and what happens when an outside power discovers the location of their vault? Why, the lone wanderer heads straight there and murders everyone inside it. In Fallout 3, you are the mutant's bad ending. Now, you can set him free and tell him he's on his own. He'll get himself shot dead in seconds and Penny will leave. So, you've basically led a man to his death in order to rescue a child. Is a child's freedom worth a man's life, and do you have the right to make that decision? You see, the first area you play in when you get control can actually be very interesting, because what the devs choose to tutorialize first shows us what they think the core gameplay elements are. And I believe I should have the skill to... Can I activate this? Yes, I can repair the 9mm machine gun. And let's chemistry set, yes, let's make some stim packs because I have science 25. New Vegas, meanwhile, started you off with the gecko hunt. Sunny Smiles immediately tutorializes shooting, iron sight aiming, crouching in order to shoot better, sneaking to get close to things that you want to shoot. The skill checks don't come into the game until quite a bit down the line. But remember, Fallout 3 isn't a proper Fallout game because there aren't enough skill checks, choices, or alternative solutions. I mean, there demonstrably are, I just told you them. To me, this seems to prove that he was never interested in actually discussing the criticism honestly, and figuring out what was or wasn't accurate. He was here to defend the game from criticism, 
Damn the facts and context. At least this seems to explain why his video is so terrible, and how I managed to make an 8 hour long response to it. Because there's just that much wrong with his arguments, that required this long to deconstruct them all, with shown examples and facts. It is much easier to put out something short, when you are making things up, ignoring facts and context, in order to defend something at any cost. Anyways, back to the video. This really just gives the impression that John is only looking at the absolute surface level aspect to the story, starting with you pursuing someone. Because to say they're pretty much exactly the same in the first act, it's a bit fucking absurd. It's pretty clear that New Vegas has a lot more going on in general, whereas Fallout 3 barely has a plot. It's more akin to a list of plot points that are barely expanded upon. I also already covered how meeting groups in the two games aren't anywhere close to the same, so I won't repeat that here. Literally half of the entire main quest line is finding Liam Neeson, or doing chores for him at Project Purity. The main quest line literally only has 12 quests, one of which is skippable, and two others don't even really qualify as a quest. For the sake of completion, let's go through every single one of them. Escape! Covers the entire section where you escape from the vault, where you kill or evade guards and leave. Following in his footsteps, has you dealing with Moriarty. The only goal here is to get information to continue your search, which directs you to GNR through a dungeon. Galaxy News Radio has you do a dungeon full of generic enemies to get an item to repair the radio. Alternatively, this could be skipped with a speech check. Scientific Pursuits has you talk to Dr. Lee, sends you to Project Purity, which Liam Neeson was apparently there long enough to get some work done despite the fact it's entirely overrun with super mutants, and a clue there directs you to Vault 112. Tranquility Lane has you tormenting people at Braun's direction, or activating the failsafe to put the residents out of their misery, trapping Braun forever, and allowing both the player and Liam Neeson to escape. The Waters of Life has you return to Rivet City, gather the scientists, purge Project Purity of anything living inside if you haven't done so already, then do some chores for Liam Neeson until the Enclave shows up and takes over, at which point you have to do a dungeon to escape. Picking up the trail, has you reading a terminal to find a vault with a geck, which sends you to Lamplight, and this quest only ends once you enter Vault 87. Rescue from Paradise is the optional quest mentioned earlier. It can be done in isolation of the main quest or skipped entirely. It's a quest about rescuing child slaves from Paradise Falls. Finding the Garden of Eden. It's literally just doing a dungeon to get the quest item. The American Dream. It's literally just doing a dungeon to talk to an NPC. Take It Back is literally just following Liberty Prime's death march. Finally, Project Impurity, which isn't even a proper quest, is literally to just poison the water. Quite literally, most of these quests barely have anything to them. Go here, talk to NPC, go there, do a dungeon. Now just about anything can be oversimplified to that degree, but the difference is that I'm not leaving a whole lot out here. It's the same issue with Autumn from earlier. They have a character to fulfill a purpose and not much else. No depth is given to him or his goals, and much of the overall writing in this game is handled this way. It's the same reason the Brotherhood have essentially been turned into a generic good guy faction. It's the same reason the Water Crisis is barely portrayed in any meaningful way. In fact, the main quest feels like a series of set pieces rather than an expanding and evolving narrative involving important groups and characters in the world. Bethesda absolutely fucking nails making a bunch of visually distinct areas in its major quest locations, but it fails to put any substance behind the characters that inhabit and drive this world. Take Three Dog, for example, who should be a major lore character and is kind of treated like one. He goes on and on about the good fight, but hardly anyone in the world ever mentions it. It seems as though his constant preaching of the good fight exists within a bubble, and most of the rest of the world simply doesn't acknowledge it. There are no groups who try to follow this belief, or put it into action. I'm pretty sure Moriarty is the only one to ever mock Three Dogs' good fight. 
No one wants him killed due to his reporting. It just comes across as something that was never truly developed. An idea that a radio host would try to change the world with the resources he's got, but never developed to the point of portraying anyone in the wasteland actually giving a fuck one way or the other. It's an idea that's executed far enough to let you know that it's there, then it comes to a hard stop. About half of the main story is chasing Liam Neeson. Escape, following in his footsteps, Galaxy News Radio, Scientific Pursuit, and Tranquility Lane are all about finding Liam Neeson in one way or another, and they don't go very deep. New Vegas trims finding Benny down to just two quests, which has you going from location to location, likely because each step in their pursuit didn't need to be its own quest. Even if these two quests take the same amount of time as everything from Escape to the Waters of Life in Fallout 3, this still ends up being a much smaller part of the game due to the sheer amount of quests and choices in New Vegas. The Yes Man Path has seven quests. Mr. House has eight quests. The NCR has five, and the Legion has four. That's just for the main quest line, by the way. And many of these quests lead into subquests, such as things that go boom. If you want to complete this quest optimally, you have to do a bunch of quests for the boomers as well. Weirdly, H Bomber Guy's video even takes a moment to call out the GNR, where you can choose to skip a quest if you can pass a skill check, thereby missing out on content, as if the exact same thing didn't happen in Novak, where the entirety of the rep contest site can be skipped by just breaking into a single terminal in the motel. What H Bomb was pointing out is that 3Dog was asking you to complete a pointless and menial task with no substance or depth. Do a dungeon to get a thing and deliver it to a place. There is no conflict at play here that isn't solved with bullets. It's something that's extremely important to him personally, literally restoring his ability to speak to the rest of the wasteland, and you could just pass it with a fairly simple speech check to make him suddenly not care about it anymore and give you the information you need. Come Fly With Me, however, is a multi-staged quest dealing with conflicting groups that could be solved in any number of ways, including peacefully. Manny cites the ghouls as a genuine problem they need solved, and you just can't talk your way past it. To skip the quest, you have to go out of your way to find the information yourself. Both quests can be skipped, but there's a huge difference between them. This establishes a very important narrative and thematic throughline. You're told to do something or go somewhere, but doing that isn't so straightforward. You have to be resourceful to make things work. The game is saying, what you have to do is not going to be obvious. Use your head. The game doesn't hold your hand, but it nudges useful options into your path for you to work with as you see fit. But let's move on to a higher view of the plot, because unquestionably, Fallout 3 post Tranquility Lane is weaker than Fallout New Vegas post Benny. Yeah, you haven't substantiated in the slightest how Fallout 3 pre Tranquility Lane is better than New Vegas pre Benny. However, I have substantiated why New Vegas pre Benny is better than Fallout 3 pre Tranquility Lane. But I've never been convinced that comparing main plot to main plot is a fair comparison. How is it not a fair comparison? Fallout New Vegas and Fallout 3 are both open-world RPGs. That alone should make it fair to compare their questlines. But more than that, they're both in the same fucking series! This comes off as an excuse for how Fallout 3's story doesn't stand up to New Vegas' story at all. And the only way for him to pull a positive out of this is through some contrived-as-fuck argument. And I'm going to prove that to you right now with maps. So let's have a quick look at New Vegas' world and how you would logically explore it if you are following just the main story, including fast travel, when it would make sense to do so. So we start off in Springs and we move down to Prim, pretty much just following the road. We then follow the road round to Nipton, because that's where the quest marker takes you, before updating to lead you up towards Novak. From Novak, we make a brief trip over to the Rep Contest side in order to get the information we need from Manny. We then head north, probably sticking pretty much close by to the road again, and very likely swinging by the 188 on our way to Boulder City, before proceeding pretty much directly into Vegas itself, cutting through Freeside and reaching the Strip, thereby ending Act 1. After Act 1, let's say we're going to do 
the NCR route, as the NCR is the first faction run into in the game. Next up, you'll be sent up to Nelson to take care of that business. Then after some work in Freeside, you're over towards dealing with the Khans. After the Khans, you have to deal with the Brotherhood, before finally heading over to Hoover Dam to wrap up the game. But all of that assumes that you're basically just going to go in and start shooting. If you actually want to resolve any of the quests that show up at the factions, you need to add in a tiny bit more. So for example, if you want to deal with the Boomer's quest, you're going to need to go to Lake Mead. The most efficient way to deal with the Khans, meanwhile, would be to go and find Melissa in order to get Papa on side with them. And then finally, if you want to do the Brotherhood peacefully, uh, good luck because there's a bunch of stuff to do regarding finding power armor, finding scouts, finding vaults, all the rest of it. Now, the most important thing here is notice how much of the map has just been filled up. Pretty much all the major factions have been visited. This is because the biggest quests in New Vegas are all on the main plot threads. Valare, GI Blues, you'll know it when it happens, Beyond the Beef, Come Fly With Me. And the few big quests that aren't are placed directly next to main plot roads to ensure you don't miss them, like that lucky old son. It's worth noting that the sheer amount of quests in New Vegas, coupled with how the main quest design takes you through much of the map, inevitably puts a lot of them in plain sight. Keep this detail in mind when I get to the amount of side content of Fallout 3. Now let's do the same thing for Fallout 3's map. So we travel from the vault to Megaton. From Megaton the quest marker brings us straight over to the subway. Via the subway system we make it over to GNR. GNR brings us underground over to the mall where we visit the Museum of Technology. From that point we're moving on to Rivet City, but probably the easiest way to do that, rather than trying to navigate the metro system, is returning to the underground system and looping around the outside of the river to get to Rivet City from the outside. That's certainly how I typically do it anyway. I've played a lot of Fallout 3, and even I can't remember the optimum way to cut through all of the metro systems. From that point we nip over towards the Jefferson Memorial to pick up with Project Purity, and then it's over towards Tranquility Lane. Probably the easiest way to do that is from Vault 101. After a brief excursion to Project Purity and an underground jaunt that brings us to the Citadel, we have to go to Little Lamplight. Probably the easiest way to go there is simply cutting from Smith Case's garage up north. In order to access that, we have to nip over to Paradise Falls, and then there's a lot of fast travelling back to Little Lamplight, being teleported up to Raven Rock, and from Raven Rock you can fast travel straight back to the Citadel. So then we skip to the end of the game, where we instead just walk straight from the Citadel down to Project Purity. And that's the entirety of the main game right there. But let's be more generous to Fallout 3 and also say we're going to do the Wasteland Survival Guide because that's a pretty main quest. So those are the three journeys we need there, to the Robco Factory, to Minefield and to the Arlington Library. Okay, let's be even more generous and let's actually say every single town we've passed through, we're going to do 100% of named quests that can be found in those towns. So from Megaton, we will travel over to Arafu in order to do Blood Ties. In Rivet City, we'll do Stealing Independence and for that we can fast travel to the Museum of Tech and then just cut across the mall. And just for fun, let's also say from Robco, we'll nip down to Tenpenny and do the Tenpenny Tower quest as well. Now, even with all those extra quests I shoved in at the end, the result is radically different. Half of the map has barely been touched, but it gets much more interesting yet. Let's look at where some of Fallout 3's big named quests are located. What I've just highlighted there is Gerdeshade's starting point for the Nuka-Cola Challenge. Canterbury Common, starting point for Superhuman Gambit, Temple of the Union, starting point for Head of State, and Oasis, starting point for, would you believe, Oasis. John's argument unintentionally highlights a different problem with Fallout 3. For a game world as big as this, with as few quests as it has, this is actually really fucking bad. We're talking about a game that's already fairly limited in content, Literally just 18 side quests to populate this massive world. Much of that content isn't good, and additionally, the main story has a hard ending that doesn't even warn you about in advance. It's really not a good idea to hide some of your quests in remote areas in this scenario. Hidden quests can be great, and that's a little secret for players to find. But that's more for a game that already has a decent amount of content. Out of every Bethesda game since Morrowind, and including New Vegas, Fallout 3 has the least amount of named quests not related to the main story. Additionally, John highlights Nuka-Cola Challenge as one of the big named quests, which tells me how low the bar is here. Just to remind everyone, this is a quest about a dumb fuck cartoon character who spends all day in her shack, surrounded by dumb collectible bullshit and not actually doing anything necessary to survive day to day in the world that we see, and the quest itself is just to collect 30 Nuka-Cola Quantum for her, 
literally generic if somewhat rare items that randomly spawn in some locations. Let's add a bit more on as well. Major locations with unmarked quests. The locations I've just added on there are Andel, the Republic of Dave, and Vault 108. So obviously there's a big difference in design philosophy going on here. Fallout 3 has shuffled a whole bunch of big, interesting quests and stories way off the beaten track, far away from any possibility you just accidentally walk into them if you were purely doing the main plots. The really crucial thing is, for the vast majority of these, nobody will ever give you a quest marker for them. They're just for explorers, and in these locations, that's where Fallout 3 hides some of its best stories. You see, Fallout 3's story is decentralised. Large numbers of small stories attach to their own communities and people with largely localised consequences, which is why Fallout 3's main plot doesn't stack up well to other Fallout games. This is just plain mental gymnastics as an attempt to justify Fallout 3's piss-poor story. The quality of the main story doesn't change, due to how many big side quests the main story brings you to. In case it isn't obvious, side quests and main quests have different names because they're different things. The main story of New Vegas isn't made any better due to Come Fly With Me being a quest the players are directed to in the main story, because ultimately the main story should be judged separately from the side quests and those side quests should be judged somewhat individually. Oftentimes with these games, Covering every single side quest is extremely time consuming and unnecessary, so covering the more notable ones is fine. Come Fly With Me doesn't change the quality of the writing of the main story any more than Power of the Atom does for Fallout 3. To prove my point, let's look at a small hypothetical. Let's transplant Come Fly With Me, one for my baby, and GI Blues to Fallout 3. So now that these really good quests are a part of Fallout 3, what does it change about the main story? Well, nothing really. Autumn's goals are just as unexplained, poorly written, and motivated as they were before. The issue isn't that many side quests are out of the way of the main story. The issue is that there's not enough in the game to support the main story, and that's the key difference. You see, Fallout 3's story is decentralised. Large numbers of small stories attach to their own communities and people with largely localised consequences, which is why Fallout 3's main plot doesn't stack up well to other Fallout games. That's simply not accurate. John seems to be blurring the line between main story and the game's writing as a whole. The side quests aren't part of the overall story in Fallout 3. They're their own individual contained stories. That's actually why I included the examples I did previously. Come Fly With Me is largely an isolated story itself. However, One For My Baby and GI Blues are related to the major players, but they aren't a part of the main story, and they teach us about some aspects of these factions and how they operate. Fallout 3 doesn't have that. There's literally no side quests that relate to any of the major players, so we don't have that chance to learn more about them in any significant way. If you wanted to learn the history of this version of the Brotherhood, for example, you have to talk to the NPCs to learn it. In other words, the game is telling, not showing. The exact thing John has consistently been complaining about in regards to New Vegas. Also, considering the fact that Fallout 3 has so few side quests, why would these quests detract from the main plot to such a degree that it causes the plot to suffer horribly? Fallout 3's main story isn't simply suffering from poor writing on its own, it's suffering from a lack of supporting side quests that further have us interacting with these groups and informing us about them. Because more than any other Fallout game, Fallout 3 keeps plenty of content away from the main plot. Let's try and add a bit of detail and flesh this out. In Fallout 3, because of decentralized narrative, a lot of the plot is attached to side quests to have their own stories. John is once again conflating things here. The plot refers to the main story. Agatha's song has nothing to do with that. Tenpenny Tower has nothing to do with that. You gotta shoot him in the head has nothing to do with that, and so on and so forth. Fallout 3 has one plot line and a bunch of small side stories. Considering these side quests as part of the plot is disingenuous. The thing about these kinds of games is you can have multiple plots. Take Oblivion, for example. There's the main story. The Mages Guild, the Fighters Guild, the Thieves Guild, and the Dark Brotherhood. Four factions and the main story, for a total of five plotlines. However, 
These faction quest lines have no bearing on the main plot line, and when most of the people refer to the plot of these kinds of games, they're specifically referring to the main story because, well, it's the main story. When referring to the plot of Morrowind, no one is referring to the quests involving the multitude of paralyzed naked Nord men out in the wilderness. They're referring to the Nerevarine prophecy and Dagothur. When referring to the plot of Oblivion, no one is referring to the Siren's Deception or Paranoia or the Mages Guild. It's referring to the Oblivion Crisis. Same applies to Fallout 3. You can't include Agatha's Song or Replicated Man or Nuka-Cola Challenge or Oasis as part of the plot when they're categorically unrelated to Project Purity and the Water Crisis. So, to discuss Fallout 3's story, we also have to discuss its quests. So let's try and get to the big complaints that seem to show up about the Fallout 3 quest, and I think the word that best encapsulates it is uninteresting. Fallout 3's main quests are supposed to be uninteresting for three main reasons I've seen repeated, and here we come back to some of the criticism I mentioned right at the beginning. There's not enough ways to resolve them, there's not enough consequences as a result of solving them, and to come back to Power of the Atom, they're morally uninteresting. Yes, these three complaints are entirely accurate. There are two moral choices in Fallout 3's main story. The first is whether to put people out of their misery or torture them for fun at the orders of a psycho. And the second is whether to poison the water or not. Yeah, to say they're morally uninteresting is the understatement of the fucking millennium. It's two basic good versus extreme evil options and nothing more. As for ways to solve quests, they're extremely few too. Following in its footsteps can be solved as John described earlier, paying Moriarty, doing a job for him, speech check, talking to his employees, or breaking in and stealing the information. These choices end up being pretty basic, but it's also the deepest the main story goes on this. Galaxy News Radio can only be solved in two ways. Do the chore for three dog, or convince him with a speech check. Scientific pursuits can only be solved by getting the holotape directing you to Vault 112. Tranquility Lane, I've already described, torture or put out of their misery. Entering Lamplight could be done in one of three ways. Perk speech check or doing their quest. Acquiring the Gek can be done in two ways. Do it yourself or get Fox to do it for you. There are no options that resolve a quest when it comes to talking to Eden or following Liberty Prime. Though Eden can be talked into killing himself, which hardly affects the main story. Autumn can be talked down or killed. And finally, as mentioned, you can poison the water or not. As for consequences, there basically are none, though the game doesn't describe it. The ending for the residents of Vault 112 is pretty obvious regardless of the choice you made, though it would have been nice to have something there anyways. The only real choice that matters is whether you poison the water or not. So let's take this criticism one at a time. Firstly, quests don't have enough interesting ways to try and solve them. Now for some of the main quests, this is absolutely 100% true, and I could see how somebody who'd only played the main quest could come to that conclusion. He literally specifically said main quests here. Fallout 3's main quests are supposed to be uninteresting for three main reasons I've seen repeated. Fallout 3's main quests are supposed to be uninteresting. Fallout 3's main quests... So clearly he's once again going to conflate what this means. Scientific pursuits, for example, can only be solved by recovering one particular audio log from Project Purity. But it is rather harsh to condemn the entire game by a handful of more linear quests, just like I've never heard anybody attack New Vegas for the fact that both the Mr. House and Yes Man route force you to go to the El Dorado substation and install one thing on one computer with no alternative solution. This has to be intentionally misunderstanding the criticism at this point, and it's getting really fucking annoying. The criticism about choice does not mean that every single situation or scenario needs numerous choices. It makes total sense that some quests might only have one solution. This is yet another false equivalence by John too. The criticism is about the game's trend of having quests with a lack of choice, or that what choice does exist is extremely simplistic. This is an extremely childish and reductive way to look at these games. It's absurd. Fallout 3 isn't being condemned because Scientific Pursuits has one solution. It's a general lack of choice across the board. 
The reason New Vegas isn't criticized for the El Dorado substation quest for House and Yes Man is because the game has a plethora of choices across the board. Most of the game's quests have choices. Beyond the Beef, GI Blues, Hard Luck Blues, That Lucky Old Son, Come Fly With Me, Boulder City Showdown, Ghost Town Gunfight, I Could Make You Care, Nothing But a Hound Dog, Oh My Papa, One For My Baby, Why Can't We Be Friends, and more. Not only that, but his example of the El Dorado substation isn't even accurate because it requires you to make a choice to even receive this quest, in which faction you pick. If I want to complete Fallout 3, I'm required to complete scientific pursuits in one specific way. If I want to get the Gek, I have to gain the trust of the Mayor of Lamplight. If I want to complete New Vegas, I could take the Legion or NCR paths and not have to install one thing on one computer in the El Dorado substation. And because John keeps coming up with small examples of choices and acting like they're significant, I think it's time to quickly go through every single quest choice in Fallout 3 to prove my point. I've covered some of these already in this video, but it's time to put this argument in the ground. Agatha Song The violin can be sold to two other people or given to Agatha, though the violin can be reclaimed from those other two NPCs to give it back to her. Big Trouble in Big Town Rescuing Shorty is optional. Once back in town, you could teach them to defend themselves in one of four ways, if the necessary skill is 40 or higher, which makes this one of the extremely rare skill checks in the entire game. Alternatively, you could just leave them to fend for themselves. You can fight the mutants yourself, or, if you have the Lawbringer perk, you could summon regulators to help out. Blood Ties You can wipe out the family and send Ian home. Alternatively, you can make a deal with the family. Either Ian stays with them, or he goes home. And additionally, the family either leaves Arafu alone, or they defend Arafu in exchange for blood donations. Head of State You could side with either the slaves, or the slavers. You know, a real deep moral choice. Oasis Kill Harold or let him live. He wants to die, but regardless of outcome, the game flags his survival as a positive, which I'll cover more when John gets to it. Additionally, the Treeminder leaders have opposing wishes. One wants to stall his growth, and the other wants to increase it, the former to protect Oasis, and the latter to spread the green living plants to the rest of the wasteland. The player gets no feedback on this ending. Additionally, you can just burn Harold. Riley's Rangers. You could collect an ammo box as an optional objective. Rescue from Paradise. Save the kids by eliminating the slavers, buying them, or helping with their escape plan. Penny can be convinced to leave Rory behind, or you can set him free. You can attempt to escort him out, tell him he's on his own, or tell him he's on his own and wait so he'll safely teleport out. Stealing Independence. You can work with Sydney or go it alone. You can kill the robot, pass a speech check, or do its convoluted forgery plan. Additionally, you can grab two other documents while you're there. Strictly Business. Enslave four targets. The only real choice is whether you actually do this quest or not. Tenpenny Tower. Kill the ghouls so they'll stop bugging the residents of the tower. Kill the residents of the tower to allow the ghouls to take over or open a back door for the ghouls to get in and kill everyone themselves. Find a peaceful solution to the quest, where the conflict is solved amicably, and the ghouls are allowed to live in the tower alongside the humans, and everyone gets along. Until Roy decides to exterminate all the humans anyways, and to make matters worse, even if you kill Roy, they all get slaughtered anyways. The Nuka Cola Challenge Give the bottles a pop to the retard or give them to the dude simping after her. Power of the Atom Nuka Town or disarm the bomb. The Replicated Man. Allow the Institute to take Harkness or kill them for him. The Superhuman Gambit. Help one kill the other or convince them to leave. Wasteland Survival Guide. Do Moira's tasks and optionally do the bonus task. Or lie to her about them. Alternatively, talk her out of doing it. Those. 
Kill the Ant Queen or help Let's go with her. Pick where Brian Wilkes goes. Rivet City, Paradise Falls, Little Lamplight, or abandon him in Grey Ditch. Trouble on the home front. Convince the vault to open up, convince them to stay closed, or destroy the vault. You gotta shoot them in the head. Kill or convince the targets for their keys. Kill Tenpenny, or tell them of the plan and turn on Crowley. Also, take the power armor for yourself if you feel like it. Escape! Let the Overseer live or kill him. Following in his footsteps. Get the info by speech check stealing the key or breaking into the computer. Convincing his employee or doing his quest. Galaxy News Radio! Do the dungeon for a quest item to repair the radio or pass a speech check to bypass it entirely. Scientific Pursuits! There are no choices here. Tranquility Lane! Put the residents out of their misery or torture them. The Waters of Life! There are no choices here. Picking up the trail! Gain access to Lamplight through a perk, speech check, or doing their quest. Finding the Garden of Eden! Get the Gek yourself or get Fox to do it. The American Dream! Have Eden kill himself. Or not. Take it back! The only real choice is to kill Autumn or let him go. Project Impurity! This quest literally exists to account for if you poison the water. That is every single named quest in the base game. There are some choices here, but few are substantial or have any kind of significant consequence, and most of those choices are extremely simplistic. And the main story in particular is lacking choice, with only two significant choices, Tranquility Lane and Water Poison. It's also worth noting that a lot of these choices are more related to how you solve a problem rather than choices that offer different endings. In fact, I've come up with a theory about this criticism of Fallout 3. I strongly suspect that some people have underestimated just how many interesting options there are in Fallout 3, because just like in Fallout 1, some options simply don't appear in dialogue unless you already have the requirements to fulfill them. In short, I reckon some people assumed Fallout 3 didn't have enough options just because they never explored well enough to find them, and Fallout 3 didn't clearly flag they were there to be found. So assuming John is right here, this is still a problem for Fallout 3. First off, this means the default amount of options are still rather limited regardless. Secondly, Fallout 1 and 2 would have options that could appear due to what you know, or what your special is, which could give different options as a result. Fallout 3 barely has this at all, to the point there's really only a handful of examples. In Big Trouble in Big Town, there are four skill checks. Guns, Explosives, Sneak, and Repair, that become available if those skills are high enough. Overall, it's a rather simple quest, but it's one of the few that had this effort and attention to detail put into it. Complete with a short training section for each, where the people of Big Town learn to defend themselves. It's a really nice little moment that most of the rest of the quests in the game simply do not get. If there really were as many of these choices as John claims there are, the people would likely have found them by now, especially considering the game is over a decade old. It doesn't seem right to just assume players didn't explore enough, because first of all, random exploring is never what Fallout has been about. Secondly, it would mean that all these big important interesting options are locked away in random dungeons that are otherwise unrelated to the quests at hand, which is bad game design. Let's say, for example, that Power of the Atom had a secret third ending to the quest, but you can only find it in Old Only. So now if I start a new game and want to achieve that ending, I have to go far off in the opposite direction of anywhere I actually want to go in order to unlock the hidden option to solve this quest. Yeah, that fucking sucks! and most people would never know about it, and as John accurately pointed out, the game doesn't even flag these options as existing, so how is anyone to know about them? This doesn't actually negate the criticism of limited choices. Let me give you an example. The Superhuman Gambit, which is a great little wide open side quest. The setup is there's a superhero and a supervillain, and you have to stop them. In fact, stopping either will do, as then they'll stop fighting, which is actually a really interesting setup in my mind. There's all the usual skill checks and alternative ways around that just about every Fallout 3 quest has. Again, dishonestly presenting Fallout 3's quests to appear better than they are. 
Most of Fallout 3's quests don't have skill checks in the broader sense. I think John is conflating speech checks with skill checks. The difference being a speech check is specific to speech, while a skill check can relate to any skill. For example, Big Trouble in Big Town has the four skill checks I've already mentioned to teach the residents to defend themselves. These being sneak, guns, explosives, and repair. A speech check is the same, but specifically for the speech skill, and as such, is far more limited. John is correct on a technicality here, because a speech check is by definition a skill check, however, him broadly calling them skill checks is the issue when a good 98% of the skill checks in this game are speech checks. By being so broad, it makes it sound better than it is, because skill checks imply more of your skills are being used, rather than just one. You can use speech and perk checks in town to gather additional information. In fact, you can't actually speech your way to a peaceful solution if you haven't asked around town to discover the antagonizer's real name. Plus, you can use lockpick 50 to bypass her base, and then you can help her kill the mechanist or help the mechanist kill her. But there's one really interesting resolution, but it's only for explorers. Now, I'd wager the vast majority of Fallout 3 players have never been to Hubris Comics, because it's fairly well tucked away. But if you do go there, and you do read a particular terminal, you discover a letter to the editor discussing how the antagonizer used to be a more interesting character, rather than the one-dimensional villain of later Grognak comics, and how the character should have been redeemed. Knowing this raises a completely unique and hidden dialogue option, allowing you to ask her where she got the idea for her costume, leading into another way to talk her down. But this is the crucial bit. Nobody, ever, tells you to go to Hubris Comics. No quest marker will ever point you there. Nobody will ever mention it or in any way imply you should go there. It's just there to be found if you explore. So there's a rather big problem with this argument John is making. He's highlighting this choice as being an example of how there are some choices hidden out in the world for explorers to find. However, this is the only example of a hidden choice existing out in the world. One quest, having one hidden choice to be found out in the world, does not in any way, shape, or form negate the fact that Fallout 3 is lacking choice. And I realize I've used this word a bunch in this video so far, but it really is the best way to describe this. It is absurdly fucking disingenuous to take this one single example and hold it up as if it debunks the criticism about a lack of choice. I also have to point out again that John opened the section under the pretense of talking about the main story, and here he is talking about a side quest. Fallout 3's main quests are supposed to be uninteresting for three main reasons I've seen repeated. I shouldn't have to say this, but side quests are not main quests. Side quests are side quests. That is why they are called side quests. We'll come back to that point later, but I want to draw your attention to something that hints at one of the biggest differences between Fallout 3 and New Vegas right now. How many significant New Vegas landmarks are there that you are never sent to by any quest, excluding the areas we discussed earlier, which have nothing unique in them, or are just single room shacks? Because I count two. Guardian Peak, and the H&H &H Tools Factory, and the latter was clearly planned to be involved in the quest before they took it out. Remember that New Vegas map? That was just the main plot. New Vegas settlements are full of quest givers that lead to more quest givers. New Vegas will, slowly, eventually, quest marker you to, or very close by to, just about every location on the map. Keep that in mind, so I think it's actually very important. Yes, New Vegas was very clearly designed so that much of its content could be found by players. It's an interconnected world. It makes total sense that groups and towns would be aware of each other. That actually ends up being one of the big weak points of Fallout 3. Hardly any of the settlements in the game seem to be aware of each other. As mentioned, no one really cares that Megaton is destroyed when it should be a really big deal. In fact, I'd argue in an area as harsh as the Capital Wasteland is, the loss of a town like that, along with a fucking nuclear bomb going off, should have a far bigger impact upon the rest of the world. But let's move on to the second criticism I mentioned for the moment. There aren't sufficient consequences to quests, making them feel meaningless. Now on this one, New Vegas absolutely wins, hands down. The reputation system isn't just about consequences, it's about lasting consequences. 
shoot up Rivet City in Fallout 3, and they'll shoot back, but go away for a few days, and when you return, everyone will pretty much be fine with you. New Vegas made it so that annoying a faction had long-term consequences that would likely go on to expand or limit your options as time went by. Fallout 3 didn't have this, but mostly that wasn't a big deal, because most groups and towns and factions are only visited once or twice. You have very little reason to revisit Oasis after you're done with it, say. The reputation system is only one part of the equation. Another part is the inslides. It was a way to tell us how things played out for each group and location we interacted with long beyond the end of the game. None of what John just said is an excuse for Fallout 3 either. He cites Oasis as a place you only visit once, but it would still make sense to have this system for interacting with other groups and towns. Problem is, Bethesda doesn't really have factions you can interact with in any meaningful way. Let's take the Talon Company, for example. They're a group of mercenaries who are always hostile regardless of your karma or anything else. You can't ever interact with them in any way besides shooting them, wailing on them with a melee weapon, or looting their corpses. Or how about the Mysterious Regulators? A faction with so little presence in the game that they only control one location, which only exists for the Lawbringer perk. And the only named NPC outside of that location is... Lucas Sims, apparently. These are the factions that Bethesda themselves made for this game, and they're pathetic as fuck. It even takes third-party information to even find out what the Talon Company are even doing. And that explanation is laughably terrible. Apparently some unknown shadowy figure has enough money to hire this group to prevent the Capital Wasteland from rebuilding. Yep. This nameless Randy just has enough caps to hire an entire mercenary group. I can only assume an unpaid intern wrote this shit, but it's irrelevant regardless because it's not even in the game. Meaning there is literally no explanation for why they're permanently hostile. They just are because reasons. As a result, this entire faction is nothing more than reskinned raiders with some better gear. Bethesda having so little content in Fallout 3 that a reputation system is redundant is not a positive point to Fallout 3 and is not an excuse for a lack of proper consequences. While it would be a welcome nice to have, Fallout 3 wouldn't actually benefit much from a reputation system because it's not a bustling, rebuilding world with representatives of the same few competing groups present in every settlement. And I don't mean that as a criticism, Fallout 3 isn't trying to be a bustling, rebuilding Fallout. It's a lonely, desperate place still struggling to recover from the apocalypse. I'd argue that would make a reputation system even more important. With this many smaller groups all trying to survive, there's a lot of room to make morally grey quests, as they come into conflict with one another, or as one tries to strive for dominance over the others, in an effort to rebuild. As such, the reputation system would be extremely beneficial when interacting with these groups. Again, the fact that Bethesda didn't put much effort into these aspects isn't a positive. It's in fact a huge mark against the game. There's no good reason why the Capital Wasteland should still be trying to recover from the apocalypse, when we're 200 years past the war. I'm not even asking for an NCR-sized faction here, just something to show the world is rebuilding. It makes no sense that the people of the Capital Wasteland have more or less just passively survived for 200 years. No one is making anything new. It's just this perpetual state of existing and not doing anything. And if Bethesda had put more content into this game, then faction reputation would be a big deal. For example, if you interacted with Big Town more than once, say they had numerous quests and not just one, then a reputation system would add a lot to the interactions, especially if there's other groups who are against Big Town or even allied with them. It's also worth noting that the reputation system existed in Fallout 1 and 2. This is especially significant in the case of Fallout 1, which took place around 85 years after the bombs dropped. The world of Fallout 1 has a lot of smaller settlements, like Shady Sands and Junktown. The largest cities of Fallout 1 are the Boneyard and the Hub, both of which are still rife with issues like crime. The point being here, that still trying to recover from the apocalypse doesn't excuse the removal of any sort of reputation system. Even if that excuse was valid, 
Does it make any sort of sense that I can launch mini nukes at the Brotherhood Paladins, mow down the Rivet City Guard, just to have them magically forgive me a few days later? Even so, I think there's a lot more consequences than people give Fallout 3 credit for, but just like the hubris comic solution to the superhuman gambit, I think some people didn't see them and just assumed they weren't there. Wouldn't that be the problem then? If these consequences are so hard to find, to the point of players missing them entirely, that seems to reflect how poorly these consequences are implemented. Because really, that's half the battle. It's not enough that consequences exist, they should be significant enough that the player has a very reasonable chance of dealing with them. Not to mention, this game entirely lacks any end slides relating to the various quests you do that describe the long-term ramifications of your actions. Aside from simple karma levels, whether you activate the purifier or not, and whether you poison the water or not. It doesn't help that Broken Steel doesn't seem to recognize your actions either. You see, the reputation system makes consequences very obvious. New Vegas literally pauses the game to tell you that you're now accepted or idolized or vilified by a particular faction. Fallout 3, meanwhile, handled its consequences a bit more subtly. You see, Fallout 3's wasteland is populated overwhelmingly by drawing random events out of a deck. Completing quests in a particular way added additional events to that deck, but because it was still a random draw, you might not see it on that playthrough, but they were still there. And what I particularly liked about that system was it meant you got to see the consequences of your small decisions live, when even New Vegas mostly didn't do that. Let me give you an example. In New Vegas, you might choose to help the ghouls of the Repcon test site escape in their rockets, but there's no in-game payoff to that aside from the quest rewards. The actual consequence for the ghouls themselves is only relayed via the ending slideshow. Literally, it is told, not shown. Yes, these games have done end slides since the beginning. The purpose of which is to show the long-term consequences of your actions that the game itself cannot portray, or consequences so far down the line that the only way to let you know what happened is to tell you, such as Myron dying in Fallout 2. The Repcon Ghoul's ending is something the player won't see the consequences for because they literally launched themselves out of the playable area, and additionally, the results come after the game ends anyways. It's quite literally impossible to show these consequences, but the writers still came up with logical outcomes and added them to the game in the form of slides. This is something Fallout 3 does not do, and as a result, we don't know what the long-term ramifications are for our actions in most cases. Take Power of the Atom, for example. Maybe with fresh water due to the purifier and the deactivated bomb, the town thrives and expands. Maybe if you have the Vault 101 dwellers come out for trouble on the home front, they start rebuilding a Vault City-like location that becomes a major trade hub in the capital wasteland. Or alternatively, if you nuked it, the slides could detail the impact it had on the world. One less light in the darkness, one less port of safety in a deadly storm. The area around Megaton becomes more wild and deadly due to the radiation, and due to there being less humans traversing the area to keep the wildlife in check, thus making it far more difficult for the residents of Vault 101 to explore and expand. Stuff like this adds a ton of weight to the decisions you make, because it shows what you do really does matter in the long term. Tim Kaine and in Interplay even received letters from fans after Fallout 1, telling them how the bad ends, as a result of their choices, such as Necropolis dying out, made them replay the game to get the good endings. And short story arcs in the game would have different endings based on that, and then when the game ended itself, that's when we came up with the idea of, hey, we're going to show you slides and say, because you acted this way, here's what's happening to these people that you you know, have been playing this game with for 40 hours, you know, here's what happened to the people of Junktown or Shady Sands or The Hub. And some of them were pretty horrific. They were like, you know, these people all died because you, you know, took their only source of water from them. And we heard later that people would get these slides and then they'd replay the whole game because they didn't want to see that slide. They couldn't live with the idea that they had killed off an entire population. Fallout 3, meanwhile, lets you stumble across so many consequences. For example, did you know that if you persuade the antagonizer to leave town purely because the mechanist isn't worth her time in the superhuman gambit, there's a chance you'll stumble across her later attacking random wastelanders with her ants. Depending on how you resolve trouble on the home front, you can run into vault dwellers thriving on a trading trip, or stumble across a martyr being interrogated by the Enclave if you force them out. 
After completing Riley's Rangers, you can run into Donovan fighting even more mutants, assuming he survived in the first place, betray Sydney in stealing independence, and she can hunt you down with her friend Emmeline, help Big Town, and you can run into a traitor who's delivering whatever it is you taught them how to use. There's even consequence events for tiny things. If you enslave anybody at any point in the game, then you can run into a group of wastelanders hunting you down because you're a slaver. Yes, these are some nice details to add into the world as a result of completing quests. However, the problem is, as John described it, that these are random encounters. Fallout 3 has a specific mechanic, where a bunch of events are made that can appear in any number of specific locations, a quick example being the Karma Bounty Hunters. They don't actually hunt you down, they spawn when you're near one of these random encounter locations. The huge problem with this system is the fact that there's so many random events, including some that repeat, that you might not ever see the ones related to the quests you do, especially if you're not exploring purely for the sake of exploring. As such, it's a bit of a piss-poor way to portray consequences from your choices, made worse by the lack of end slides, and by the fact there are extremely few static consequences in the world, where something is changed in a fixed location. A few examples being Megaton not existing anymore, Tenpenny Tower being inhabited by ghouls, and Harkness being replaced as the chief of Rivet City Security, because of course they had to make those changes. If you complete three card bounty in New Vegas, the entire first recon team will actually relocate to Camp Forlorn Hope. If you destroy Vault 101 to force residents out, they don't actually physically leave. You just find a corpse in a random location every now and then, if this event happens to spawn. It also limits the potential consequences of events, because now Bethesda has to keep them within the confines of what can actually be put into the game as an encounter. For example, the aforementioned idea of a Vault City-esque settlement forming after trouble on the home front is practically impossible, because the developers have limited themselves to random encounters. We can't see the long-lasting consequences of our actions, nor do they feel significant. And there's loads of this sort of thing in Fallout 3, but rather ironically, given I regularly see Fallout 3 condemned as a simplified and dumbed-down entry into the franchise, it was organically inserted into the game so subtly that people didn't even see it and just assumed it wasn't there. This is what being absurdly positive in defense of something looks like. It's like listening to a used car salesman. It's not that these encounters can be entirely missed by people, because they might not even spawn in. It's that they were so well implemented into the game, that people didn't even realize they were there. But this are game design wizards who do things so amazingly well, that people don't notice it, and assume it's bad as a result. You know there's a difference between being positive about something, and looking at things through rose-tinted glasses? All throughout this video so far, John has assigned clever intentions to just about all of Bethesda's design choices, and is constantly trying to prop them up as super awesome amazing, while at the same time being incredibly negative about New Vegas, going so far as to outright completely ignore context in a number of scenarios, cherry pick parts of dialogue to support his points, while ignoring dialogue from the same character that goes against his point, and going on a lengthy tangent about a lack of dungeons, based entirely on speculation and personal theory, without any actual evidence to back it up, among other things. Bethesda already had a blueprint on hand to show consequences, and they tossed it in the dumpster and did nothing with it. Instead, we get these random events that don't even fully explain long-term consequences. They just show us a small slice of them. Take John's antagonizer example from earlier. She's killing some randies with her ants, so she's still out in the world doing stuff. That doesn't tell us much of anything besides that she's killing randies. Now let's consider some possible end slides for her. Maybe she harasses another town we care about. Maybe Big Town or Arafu. Maybe she gets brutally killed by some raiders or the Enclave or something. Maybe someone finds her powers useful and finds a way to manipulate her to their own benefit. Or how about we take the redemption solution to the quest instead, the one John mentioned, and as a result, she goes out into the world to use her powers for good, to stop the evildoers of the wasteland. Or maybe she decides to defend Canterbury with her ants, instead, becoming a local hero to those she attempted to conquer. See how those potential end slides would be far more impactful than, oh look, she's killing some randies. 
These random encounters would have been a nice way to supplement static consequences and end slides, but they don't do the job on their own. As mentioned before, the information offered by these encounters is limited at best. The ending slides tell us the consequences of things that couldn't possibly be shown because they're typically much further in the future and are too grand of a scale to be shown in-game. The founding of the NCR would sound a lot less cool if Shady Sands remained exactly the same and there's just a new flag at the entrance. The return of the Bright Brotherhood would be way less interesting if Novak just had random ghouls in it. Even in New Vegas' cut content, having Securitrons that just have random dialogue that says, True to Kaisar, is not as interesting when compared to descriptions of Caesar triumphantly declaring New Vegas his own Rome. It's not the player's fault for not triggering every random event location and not seeing the consequences as a result, and all these random events existing don't actually counter the argument that Fallout 3 is simplified and dumbed down. In fact, I'd argue they're part of the dumbing down. Rather than writing detailed explanations for what happens after the fact, they throw some cheap random encounters into the randomized event system. Rather than giving the player strong moral choices, we get stuff like, do you want to poison the water or not? Do you want to torture these innocent people or not? Do you want to nuke this town full of innocent people or not? Do you want to slaughter these ghouls or the people of Tenpenny Tower? Oh, what's that? You found a peaceful solution? No, fuck you. Genocide happens anyways. Do you want to give this man his freedom or allow him to be memory wiped, essentially killing him and taking him back into servitude? Yeah, this game is dumbed down and simplified as fuck. I absolutely need to point this out again, but at the beginning of the segment, John said he was talking about main quests, and he's still using side quests as examples, because he can't actually defend the main quest on its own, because these things don't exist for the main quest. Fallout 3's main quests are supposed to be uninteresting for three main reasons I've seen repeated. It's extremely telling that he has to argue in this fashion. And I think rather tragically, Bethesda actually realised this, and you can see it in the way in which the game has evolved between Fallout 3 and Fallout 4. You see, in Fallout 3, the little Grognak mini-game, it's buried away inside your Brisk Comics, the area we discussed earlier, just in a little terminal, hidden away in a dead end in a building the vast majority of players will never actually see. It's just a nice little easter egg, a reward for explorers, something that you might not find for years, maybe not even at all, maybe this is the first time you've ever heard of the damn thing. It's just a fun little text adventure. But after Fallout 3, and possibly as a result of the feedback that they got to Fallout 3, by the time Fallout 4 came around, that had very much changed. Fallout 4 also has a Grognak minigame, but it's not hidden away as a fun little extra for players to find. No, 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 it's put right in the memory den, in plain sight in a main plot location. And the other four mini games are as well. Vault 111, Concord, Valentine's Detective Agency, Fort Hagen. They are laid right in front of you in the critical plot path to make sure you couldn't possibly miss them. And I think that's a bit of a shame, because Fallout 3 was just at its absolute best when you went exploring and you found cool things hidden around the edge of the map. Bethesda seems to think their customers are idiots. I thought Skyrim's picture matching puzzles was proof enough of that. So easy a toddler could do it. It's no surprise that they'd put these items on the main path as a result, but this is additionally just an assumption of John's, and just in general a bit of a nonsensical argument. I'm not really sure what to even classify it as. So first off, this doesn't actually have anything to do with what he's been talking about in this section. The consequences for your actions. He's using the example of an extremely obscure and hard to find minigame. I'm not even sure if there's any others like it in all of Fallout 3. And he goes on to talk about how all of Fallout 4's minigame holotapes appear in main quest locations. He almost seems to be blaming critics for this as well. But after Fallout 3, and possibly as a result of the feedback that they got to Fallout 3, by the time Fallout 4 came around, that had very much changed. Fallout 4 also has a Grognak minigame, but it's not hidden away as a fun little extra for players to find. No, 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 it's put right in the memory den, in plain sight in a main plot location. And the other four minigames are as well. Vault 111, Concord, Valentine's Detective Agency, Fort Hagen. They are laid right in front of you in the critical plot path to make sure you couldn't possibly miss them. It's no secret that Bethesda has been dumbing down their games more and more for about 20 years now. You know, the exact thing many Fallout fans are complaining about in regards to Fallout 3 being dumbed down from the originals 
and Fallout 4 only pushing that bar further? The truth is right here in front of your face. You're pointing at it and referencing it, and yet you still can't see it for what it is. I can prove they're dumbing down each release pretty easily too. Morrowind didn't have a lot of puzzles, but they tried to make them unique, such as riddling Antronauts, the Palace Canal puzzle which you need to drown yourself to solve, and even the sound matching puzzle in Blood Moon. They're not the best puzzles ever made, but they did require a bit of thought and attention to complete. By the time Skyrim rolled around, they had tons of puzzles in their dungeons, or more accurately, two puzzles repeated ad nauseum, the picture matching ones and the claw ones. Rather than acknowledging this, John throws in a line that it's possibly the result of feedback they'd received, and he speaks in a very annoyed tone about how Fallout 4's minigames were handled. But I think the real highlight here is that John already explained what the issue was himself, and still somehow managed to miss it entirely. You see, in Fallout 3, the little grognak minigame, it's buried away inside your Brisk Comics, the area we discussed earlier, just in a little terminal, hidden away in a dead end in a building the vast majority of players will never actually see. It's just a nice little easter egg, a reward for explorers, something that you might not find for years, maybe not even at all, maybe this is the first time you've ever heard of the damn thing. John acknowledges that this is so obscure that most people would never find it on their own, and that him mentioning it here in this video might even be the first time many people even heard about it existing. He even calls it an easter egg. So, what is the argument here? More importantly, what does this have to do with the consequences? He can't even really use Fallout 4 for this point either, since that game basically removed all choice. Sure, there's a couple that can be found in random encounters, but that just strengthens my point, not his. John says that the consequences were so subtly put into the game that most players didn't even realize they were there. Then he says he thinks they realized that issue, highlights how the two games were made differently, highlighting the handling of mini-games, not consequences, because Bethesda did the same damn thing with the consequences to that game, but they somehow made it even worse. Fallout 4 has two endings, one for the Institute and one for everyone else. That's literally the only things they take into consideration. I mean, hell, even Fallout 3 shows an image for nuking Megaton or burning Herald. There's no narration for them, so we don't actually know what the long-term consequences are for our actions, but at least they showed an image. Fallout 4 doesn't even do that. Still, let's get back to Fallout 3 and something I do really want to draw attention to because it is something that Fallout 3 innovated and it did stick around into New Vegas and Fallout 4 and quite rightly too, the radio. Nuts for inventing the idea of juxtaposing Jaunty's 50s music with creeping around a raider base in some dark ruins, which perfectly suited the classic Fallout trend of mixing sometimes goofy humour with moments of utter darkness. This doesn't perfectly suit the classic games at all. Both Fallout 1 and 2 started off with an old 50s song, Maybe, and Kiss to Build a Dream on respectively, but after that, the tone of both games were generally really grim, to the point that Tim Kaine refused traditional video game music for Fallout 1, and instead having the music be as grim as the world, the scraping of ancient metal, the sirens of a dead world, the beating of tribal war drums. Even the goofy aspect is way overblown, and I think that's part of the problem with Bethesda Fallout. It's like they saw some of the goofier aspects of Fallout 2, which is already pushing the limits for the series, and is arguably one of that game's weak points, and they cranked it up to 11. Fallout 1 was generally more subtle with its humor, with maybe the exception of a one intellect run. Now while I do think it makes sense for radio stations to be established, and even playing appropriate music, the statement that the jaunty music mixed with dark raider basses perfectly matches the originals is wrong. I think highlights a fundamental misunderstanding of these games. But for the fact it provided constant feedback, letting you know what happened next, and how people feel about that. The morality system in Fallout 3 is far from perfect, but when paired with the radio, I think it actually works well. It's nice that if you do something awful, Three Dog calls you out on it. So John complains about New Vegas telling you about Lanius in a way that doesn't break immersion. A way that makes sense within the world. Someone telling you. He also complains about the intro of New Vegas telling you basic information about the major factions, to which his solution was to talk to an NPC and have them just tell you the same information. And now, he's praising Three Dog for telling you 
that you're good or bad for doing good or bad things. Sounds like another double standard to me! However, once again, I think this ends up being a stronger point in my favor than his. John says it's nice that Three Dog calls you out for doing something awful, but that quite nicely highlights just how shallow and black and white most of the choices are. Three Dog only ever praises or condemns you. There's never a situation that doesn't have a clear good or bad outcome, where he has to either really show a bias, or where he has to admit it was a complex and unfortunate situation, and not everything is as clear cut as simple good and evil. This is worsened by the fact that Three Dog is literally behind a cause called The Good Fight. The game practically makes him a good moral standard, and one can't construe this as him having certain thoughts on things. Rather, his judgments do accurately reflect good and bad choices. Pretty much every choice in the game has the power of the atom issue, or the poisoning in the water issue, and that's the fact that most choices are black and white, with extremely rare exceptions. Tenpenny Tower is one of these exceptions, with two endings that result in Three Dogs' condemnation regardless, one ending that seems good at first, until the game pulls the rug out from under you for no reason because... Haha, ha, murder funny. He doesn't acknowledge that it's a bad situation with no clear good outcome. The most optimal possible solution is the one the game arbitrarily completely disallows. So you're a bastard if you kill the ghouls, and you're a bastard if you kill the tower residents. And you're a chump if you try to make peace, only for the humans to be exterminated anyways. What's worse is the fact you need to go over your way to listen to the radio to even get this feedback, and compounding it even more is the fact that Three Dog won't say shit to your face. He has no problem talking all kinds of shit about you on the radio, but there's no mention of your actions face to face. It's like Radio Three Dog and NPC Three Dog are two entirely different people. Additionally, the radio didn't tell you how people feel about your actions, it told you how Three Dog feels about your actions. It's purely his opinion and nothing more. And we never get to actually see how he feels about more complex and nuanced scenarios and conflicts. How would Three Dog report on a quest like GI Blues? By contrast, I found Mr. New Vegas rather uninteresting, and I'm not sure I've ever heard anyone say they prefer him to Three Dog. And that's because Mr. New Vegas fairly neutrally reports on what your actions have done to the game's factions, whereas Three Dog has a personality, and one that's perfectly happy to call you out or praise you, thereby giving direct feedback to the player. Direct feedback wasn't necessary, with how simplistic most of the choices were. And considering the karma system lets you know pretty easily if your actions were good or bad, Furthermore, it actually makes a lot of sense for Mr. New Vegas to report neutrally on your actions, rather than taking sides. He's reporting the news. He's not your personal cheerleader, nor is he someone meant to pass judgment. Many of the conflicts in New Vegas are more complex, because most of the characters you deal with in New Vegas were written to have some depth to them, not to be dumb and shallow cartoon characters like in Fallout 3. Take Boulder City Showdown, for example. The cons have taken some NCR soldiers hostage, and they helped Benny when he shot you. However, there's more depth to them than being flat cartoon goons. There's history between them and the NCR, and while they do some shady shit, there's still people trying to survive in the world. They didn't ask you to nuke a town because they thought it would be funny. The nuance to the great cons is furthered by the fact there's a massive history of mistreatment towards them. Looking at how their canon endings in 1 and 2 involve them being wiped out, then their history of being displaced twice from New Vegas, then Bitter Springs, we could see that they have good reason to be considered victims. As such, you can wipe them out for what they did to you, but you can also talk them down. You can wipe out the NCR if you so choose, if you happen to dislike them for whatever reason, or you can come to a peaceful resolution through dialogue. Now how would Three Dog be able to report on that? Every single report he does in Fallout 3, about the quests you do, is under the lens of good or evil, and he doesn't have much to say if they aren't. There is no in-between, and there is no deeper discussion that doesn't really have a clear-cut answer, or even Three Dog doesn't know what the right answer is, where he's forced to say that he hopes the player is doing what they think is right. Would he condemn you for slaughtering the cons? But they're generally regarded as some pretty shady characters, and they're holding people hostage, so would that be fine in Three Dog's eyes? See, more complex and nuanced situations will allow for some actual character development for Three Dog, 
rather than him simply talking about black and white good versus evil choices. Because how he responds to these situations would tell us a lot about him as a character. For example, if he condemned the cons, and potentially the player for solving the quest peacefully, that would tell us that he thinks any wrongdoing is worthy of death. Or maybe he has some kind of bias towards the cons, especially since the massacre of Bitter Springs is something that's happened recently. Or maybe he thinks the NCR are an oppressive government harassing the little guy, and he instead approves of them being wiped out in order to save the cons. But we don't know, and we'll never know any of this, because pretty much all of Fallout 3's choices, and Three Dog's responses to them, are entirely black and white as a direct result. In fact, of the few times we do see his bias at play, it proves him to be a brain-dead fucking asshole. If you nuke Megaton, all Three Dog has is his baseless speculation. You are at Megaton, then you are hanging out at Tenpenny Tower. Ultimately, it's an extremely tenuous connection, especially when Three Dog himself says Tenpenny wanted to secure that location for years, not destroy it. Yet that's enough for Three Dog to broadcast to the world his suspicion of the player. If the world of Fallout was a real place, this could potentially lead to the Lone Wanderer being attacked and possibly killed as a direct result, all based on speculation with no actual evidence. In fact, there's even a random encounter in which Megaton refugees may attack you. Where did they come from? Only Moira survived the town's destruction. Either way, with the way the quest goes down, no one really knows that you did it. There is no evidence or witnesses. Since most of the Three Dogs broadcasts revolve around the player, it makes the world feel small. It makes it feel as if the player is the only one doing anything newsworthy in the world, and that's a big problem for a world that's supposed to be rebuilding in some way. He also implies that Mr. New Vegas has no personality, by specifically stating that Three Dog does. Let's be real here, Three Dog's personality is just being a loudmouth, which isn't really bad itself. It's definitely memorable if nothing else, even if being a loudmouth radio host that talks too much isn't a unique concept, considering that's how many radio hosts act in real life. But Mr. New Vegas has a personality of his own too, a far more subtle and toned down one. He makes jokes. Hey, it's Mr. New Vegas letting you know I've got a new Christmas compilation coming out soon. Nuclear Winter Wonderland. Look for it on holotape. Tells you his favorite songs. And now, I'd like to play one of my very favorite songs for you. He tries to be personable. I'd like to play something really special for you right now because you deserve it and sometimes even flirty with the audience. Have you ever been in love with a celebrity? Now come on, you don't have to be shy. I feel it between us two. Welcome back to the Mr. New Vegas Show, the show within my opinion, which I respect, the best looking audience around. Somebody prove me wrong? Anyway, moving on. The third big complaint about Fallout 3's storytelling and the quest structure. The power of the atom problem. That Fallout 3 doesn't have interesting moral choices. Now this one I think is just plain wrong, and I think Fallout 3's decentralised storytelling and lack of a reputation system actually helps with it. You see, New Vegas doesn't really do moral questions for the most part. Instead it has faction questions. Rather than asking you to figure out what was right, New Vegas asked you to pick which faction you wanted to benefit. Morality was a secondary concern, with the character's karma level doing basically nothing mechanically. John keeps bringing up the idea of decentralized storytelling, but that's not inherently a good thing, nor is it even really accurate for what's happening in Fallout 3. There's the main story, and a bunch of random, completely unrelated side quests. That's not decentralized storytelling, it's one large story and a bunch of smaller ones. To take Morrowind's as an example again, it has plenty of quests all across the world. It has 10 faction quest lines, most of which have little to no relation to the main story, not even mentioning the literal couple hundred side quests that exist out in the world in remote locations. With all that in mind, does that help Morrowind have interesting moral choices? Well, no. It doesn't really. As for his other point there, John's claim about New Vegas not having moral questions is blatantly false. He's framing questions of faction loyalty and moral questions as totally mutually exclusive things. This is false. 
as your choice between factions is likely going to come down to your moral principles. To give a quick example, I'm going to use Come Fly With Me again, because it really is a good example. You can kill the ghouls or help them. You could kill the nightkin or help them. You could kill the trapped ghoul in the basement or help him. After doing all of that, and some of the item retrieval objectives for them, right at the end, you have the choice to kill them all or adjust their coordinates to help them. At nearly every stage, there are options one way or the other, and especially with the Nightkin, it would be easier to kill them than to sneak by to complete that stage of the quest. But doing the optimal ending takes effort. To take another example, GI Blues, how you complete this quest and which faction you end the game with will impact the factions you deal with in different ways. For example, if you go for the optimal ending, where there's peace between the Kings and the NCR, yet you finish the game for House, this results in the Kings of being wiped out. All that effort for them to die anyways, and the NCR driven out, and as a result, what seems like the optimal ending led to short-term peace, but the extinction of an entire faction, and the other being forced out anyways. Whereas if you had sided with the Kings against the NCR, the Kings would prosper under House. Now yes, that is still a faction-based question, but the morality still plays a big part of it. You can choose to pick the optimal ending, which results in more death long term, or you could side with a faction in order to save them at the cost of another faction's short term stability for its citizens. That strikes me as a much deeper moral choice than John seems to give it credit for. Additionally, he frames the morality issue for Fallout 3 as the power of the atom problem, but realistically, it's a Fallout 3 problem, because it's not just Power of the Atom that is that shallow or black and white. Again, Tranquility Lane, Poisoning the Water, Big Town, Head of State, Strictly Business, Replicated Man, those, and even those that seem deep at first, hint heavily to there being a correct answer, such as Oasis. Let me give you an example. In New Vegas, you can decide the fate of the town of Nelson, but it's never framed as a moral question. Nobody even considers what's best for Nelson or the people of Nelson, because Nelson doesn't have any people. It's just a space for the NCR and the Legion to fight over. Choose the NCR and clear out the Legion, or choose the Legion and assassinate the NCR commanders. Nelson is a very obviously a cherry-picked example. New Vegas has plenty of quests that deal with morality on some level. I actually went through New Vegas's quest and tried to find ones that had interesting moral quandaries, and I found two. Etuma Brute is an interesting one as it's unclear whether allowing Caesar to die is a good or a bad thing. It might destabilise the Legion, but it might also unleash Lanius to do even worse things in the short term. And Hard Luck Blues definitely has an interesting choice between directly and immediately being responsible for the deaths of a few versus the risk you might hurt the long term viability of a much wider community later. Other than that, most quests don't ask you to figure out what's right, they simply ask you to pick a beneficiary. I find it really hard to believe that you went through even a quarter of the quests in New Vegas and only found an entire two quests that have any kind of moral question. What's worse than that is the fact he completely misses the fact that siding with a faction is in itself a moral question. You're deciding whose morals are going to rule the wasteland is it Caesar's, who doesn't care about the individual, but the future of the human race as a whole, yet engages in slavery and crucifies its enemies? Is it the NCR with its bureaucracy and red tape, and being stretched so thin that its citizens are suffering as a result? Is it House, who is looking at the big picture, with dreams of a functional colony on Mars in the future, at the cost of those living in the here and now? Here's a short list of some quests that have moral questions. My Kind of Town involves picking a sheriff for Prim, with all of your options having benefits and drawbacks to the town's security. Heartache by the Numbers has you choosing between helping Cass get revenge by taking the easy route and murdering Alice and Gloria, or taking the long route and letting the legal processes take down their whole operation. The Whitewash makes you choose if murder should be forgiven, if it means giving a poor community water. Return to Sender asks if one should tolerate a plan that is getting people killed to have the NCR fall back from the Mojave, but has the ultimate intention to benefit the NCR. 
but because Fallout 3 doesn't have ubiquitous recurring factions, each quest has to be resolved on its own merits, and some of them ask genuinely difficult questions. He's framing this as though the faction question is all that matters. However, in many quests, you can still choose to complete these quests in different ways, which you prioritize morals over faction, which I believe makes it more of a question of morality, not less. Just think, if you plainly follow a faction lines and nothing more, you're the one putting aside your morality for the sake of your chosen faction. Rather than putting the morals first and your faction second, it gives more depth to these choices and makes them more complex as a result. For example, in Boulder City Showdown, negotiating with the Great Cons ends with Lieutenant Monroe receiving orders to wipe out the Great Cons regardless of whether a deal was struck with them. The moral question here is obvious. Should NCR orders be followed and the cons wiped out, or should you advise Monroe to honor the deal he made and set them free? Do I do what I think is right at the cost of my faction, or do I forsake my morals in service of the side I've chosen? John completely misses that this in itself is a moral question. Oasis straight up asks you to deal with the question of euthanasia in cases where the person is unable to take their own life, but their family doesn't want to let them die. And then on top of that throws in the complication that if you disregard Harold's wishes and keep him alive against his clearly stated desire to die, it might present a long-term benefit to the wasteland. That is a good question. However, the quest itself hints towards what the correct answer is. When Harold sends you into the caves, he says he's going to make the tree minders understand even though he hasn't been able to for years and years, he somehow thinks he'll get through to them now. And if you let him live? He does. Well, the tree minders will praise you. Harold says he'll give them another chance. He isn't in despair at being damned to continue living against his will. And the only chance he's had in ages, the only chance he'll likely have for a very long time. He isn't angry or spiteful or anything of the sort. He's positive about it. Similarly, if you kill him, the head tree minder will be mournful, saying he came to his senses when talking to Harold, wishing he had seen the truth sooner, so he can make things better for him. The pit asks if it's justified to abduct a baby from loving parents and hand her over to someone who will cause her pain and suffering, if it might lead to the discovery of a cure to a disease slightly sooner. Uh, no. Sorry. You don't get to defend the base game's lack of choice using DLC. The base game and the DLC should be judged separately. A choice in the pit is not a choice in Fallout 3. Similar with how John praised the choice in the opening of Fallout 3, if the DLC had all the choice in the world, that would not change the fact that the base game lacks choice. Now I've gotten a response to this a few times in the original video, so I should make my position on it very clear to prevent claims of hypocrisy for using DLC to defend Alanius earlier. DLC that makes lore changes, or explains the things in the story are fine to use, specifically because the story and lore don't exist within a bubble. It's a series, and as such, the story outside the singular game that should be accounted for. Same as how I refer to other games when it comes to lore issues. However, the DLC doesn't change mechanical issues, such as the lack of choice. Because by the same token, I could easily use Operation Anchorage, or Mothership Zeta, as proof of Fallout 3 lacking choice and dumbing the game down to the point of being a dumb mindless corridor shooter. Even quests that initially look simple have a sting in the tail. Trouble on the home front, for example, looks clear cut at first glance. A martyr wants to open up the vault and let people come and go on occasion, and the overseer who murdered Jonas and is generally a dick wants to keep it locked forever. Now, everything in Fallout history says a martyr is right. She's been the sympathetic character so far, the overseer is clearly framed as a slightly mad villain, and thematically, Fallout's all about moving on, rebuilding, the horror of the past, and the hope of a better future. Except it's a bit of a no-win, in fact. The Overseer's terminal reveals that the Enclave are actively seeking to enter the vault, and if you head outside, you can find one of their vertebrates literally parked around the corner by Springvale. But on the other hand, a more science-minded lone wanderer can inform the Overseer that genetic diversity means the vault is doomed within a few generations if he does nothing. So, what's the right thing to do with Vault 101? I thought Fallout 3 was thematically about clinging to the past. I do agree, however, that Trouble on the Homefront is one of the better quests in Fallout 3. It actually does ask a question with no clear right answer, and it's up to you to choose what you think is best. Initially, at least. 
The whole thread of the Enclave falls a bit flat once you realize you completely wiped them out at the end of the game, and Amada even says it will take a while for them to prepare to even open the vault. Also, the whole issue of genetic diversity seems like a pretty big deal. Or take Tranquility Lane, where you have a choice. You can perform acts of cruelty to cause the residents of a simulation to suffer pain and death for a mad scientist's amusement, or you can figure out how to disable the simulation and stop what he does forever. This seems simple at first until you pay close attention to the simulation and what ending it actually means. You see, even though you're torturing and even killing the residents of Tranquility Lane, the simulation resets and they don't seem to remember any of it, with the exception of Old Lady Dithers. Activating the failsafe leads to the actual real-world death of all the Vault Dwellers and Brawn left trapped, alone, in a simulation you can never escape from, forever. So which of those actually causes the least suffering? I like how John says, if you pay close attention, as if people are too stupid to understand information that is very clearly and plainly shown and told to them. He's trying to make this a question of grey morality, when it's pretty clear cut, just like the slavers earlier. Braun is clearly shown to be an evil and horrible person from the fact he gets off on tormenting people. From the very fact that Old Lady Dithers has memories of the torment, it's proof enough alone that putting them out of their misery is objectively the correct option. There is no reason in the world to have any sympathy for Braun when he gets trapped in the simulation forever. But it gets worse than that. The very fact that Dithers is starting to remember what happens implies it's possible that might start happening for other residents. That's not even taking into account the fact that Braun might just stop giving a shit entirely and stop erasing their memories. This is something I talked about in my Fallout 3 analysis video, and someone pointed out that a memory chip was stolen from Vault 112 for Harkness in The Replicated Man, which explains how the memory wipe isn't affecting Dithers, and not actually an issue for anyone else in the simulation. And it's just a point I initially agreed with, until I thought about it a bit longer. If the memory chip was removed, wouldn't it cause her to lose her memories, rather than remember everything? Either way, it's extremely clear what the good and bad options are here. Another fun one that many people miss is Tenpenny Tower. The setup is that Roy Phillips wants to live in the tower, and Tenpenny and the other residents don't want ghouls there. You can kill Roy, help Roy take the tower by force, or persuade the tower residents to allow the ghouls in, after which point most residents accept the ghouls actually turned out to be okay. It all seems very clear, the moral, good, proper option is the last one. Except if you do that and you return a few days later, the humans are gone. Search around and you can find a pile of corpses in the basement. Roy planned all along to murder the humans and take the tower for himself and his ghoul friends. So once you know that, perhaps the best option is to kill Roy and his gang. Four people dead to save the tens of people who live in the tower. Well, two small issues there. First, you have to wipe out his whole gang, which includes Bessie, a shy and completely oblivious girl who absolutely has no idea about the plan. Fun. That's not the word I'd use to describe this quest. Frustrating, contrived, stupid, but not fun. Obviously, how fun this quest is, is subjective. However, I'd wager if anyone actually cared about doing the right thing in this scenario, they'd come away from it annoyed at how it plays out. Literally, the only winning move is to not play. You've got two options, slaughter the tower residents, most of which are innocent, and a few aren't, or slaughter the evil ghoul, the good ghoul, and the morally questionable but probably not so good ghoul. Yeah, those aren't great options. John breaks up Bessie, but that's part of what makes us so contrived. Why must she be killed too? Because the quest says so. Because it was written that way. Royal Michael Masters are all that's really needed to be killed. But it's not like Bessie alone will be a threat. And she's seemingly unaware of the plan, as John says. And she even says she doesn't want anyone to get hurt. So why can't she be convinced to go elsewhere? Well, because the writer said so. The conflict isn't deep, if that level of depth is contrived. Roy Phillips is very clearly an evil character. There is no debate, he slaughters the residents of Tenpenny Tower, regardless of what you do if you take his side. Which brings me to the secret third option, the peaceful option. John does describe it accurately. Roy kills everyone even if you get him in peacefully, which includes totally innocent people like Herbert Dashwood, someone who respects ghouls and was friends with one in his adventures. What you've got is a quest 
with a false level of depth to its conflict, and one of the extreme few quests in the entire game that deals with two groups in conflict that can be solved peacefully and a seemingly positive ending, and the game still tells you to go fuck yourself if you check up on them later. This isn't a quest that has no clear good answer, this is a quest where the game itself betrays you for trying to do the right thing. And secondly, the reward. The only way to get the ghoul mask is to help Roy, either by directly helping him to storm the tower, or persuading them to let him in, both of which end in the tower's inhabitants all dying. And the ghoul mask is great, especially if you've got Broken Steel installed and the feral ghoul reavers start showing up. Are you willing to condemn an entire society to death for a valuable unique item, given the vacated tower will go on to be a home to ghouls anyway? Why in the fuck are you bringing quest rewards into it? That's not part of moral choices at all, and it shouldn't be included as part of the discussion. A moral question is about what is or isn't the right thing to do. A hard moral choice typically deals with a situation with no correct answer. If you disregard the morals in favor of reward, that doesn't make the moral question deeper or increase its impact in any way. That's you choosing a reward over morality. It should be fairly obvious that having loads of people murdered so you can get a reward is, by no means, morally grey. By the same token, we could say Power of the Atom offers a deep moral dilemma for the fact that the Tenpenny Suite looks nicer than the Megaton home. So are you willing to condemn an entire town to die for a nice apartment? I'd sacrifice people by the cartload if a man could get better parking or not have to wait in line. If anything, taking the reward into consideration would be more of a lack of morals than anything else. John frames it as though it's a legitimately hard question. Should an entire society die in return for a useful reward? The morality falls by the wayside in favor of doing something useful to the player. That's less a question of morality, and more of a question of how you weigh a moral question versus a reward. Now of course, we can't discuss morality without briefly touching on the karma system, and it's not a great system. In particular, it occasionally undermines the grey morality of the quest by effectively flagging one result as canonically good and the other as being bad, though many times it actually didn't. Oasis is karma neutral, unless of course you kill Harold using fire when he specifically asks you not to do so because he's terrified of fire. The game calls that evil, and hopefully that's not too controversial. Why would that be controversial? Regardless, there aren't many situations in the game for the karma system to even undermine in regards to grey morality. Now as we've seen already, he's tried to stretch the idea of grey morality to cover clear-cut evil characters such as Braun being trapped alone, or the Slavers of Paradise Falls being wiped out, as morally grey decisions, even though they very clearly aren't. Without those, there's only a handful of examples. Dr. Lesko trying to make Ant small again in the quest Those is one of them, you can either help him or kill the Queen and ruin his work. Of course, Three Doc has nothing to say about this one way or the other. There is one interesting thing about the karma system though, and it helps Fallout 3 avoid a trap that many great games do fall into. You see, given the ubiquity of the main factions in New Vegas' map and main quest missions, most players will probably pick one that they're going to be supporting early on, and experienced players will very likely do a house run or a legion run. It's just the same way that I might play Mass Effect 1 and choose at the beginning if I'm going to be going Paragon or Renegade. In both cases, it's optimal to go all in in a single direction. Once you're back in the NCR, there's basically no reason to help the Legion on any occasion when there's a choice between them. Getting idolised with your preferred faction as quickly as possible gets you more unique dialogue options, better prices in stores, access to powerful armour via safe houses, all sorts of good stuff. Fallout 3 meanwhile managed to avoid that by making extremely high and low karma not the most powerful or useful position. Neutral karma is arguably the best place to be. Impartial mediation is the most powerful skill point boosting perk in the game and only remains active while you maintain a neutral karma. Meanwhile only neutral characters don't have talent or bounty hunters constantly attacking them. And as soon as it's optimal to sometimes be good and sometimes be bad, the need to always pick the same option just as that's the run you're doing disappears, meaning you're free to evaluate each quest in its own moral merits. This is just embarrassing to listen to. It amazes me that someone could conceive this argument, write it out, speak the lines, and edit it into a video without realizing how nonsensical it is. You might do a house run or a legion run, but Fallout 3 avoided this by making a neutral run possible. He's framing picking faction paths from the start as a problem, and complete dedication to one faction as problematic. However, how is it remotely problematic that choosing to help the NCR or any other faction at every turn 
would allow you to reap the benefits of having such a good relationship with them. Furthermore, if you're studying with the NCR, who are at war with the Legion, why in the world would a player have a hard time picking between the NCR and Legion? Even a character who has fully dedicated themselves to the NCR still has choices they can make in regards to how they handle factions such as the Khans or the Kings. Worse than all of that, however, his own argument defeats itself here. A neutral karma run is no different from a good or evil karma run in Fallout 3. You're still choosing to do a specific run. Most games with choice do struggle with this issue, I'll agree there. But it's not an issue that Fallout 3 escapes in the slightest, nor are you as free to evaluate each question on its own moral merits as John claims. If anything, it forces you to ride the line if you wish to keep the neutral karma benefits, or you might have to make good or evil choices you don't want to in order to maintain your neutral karma, rather than actually judging each quest on its moral merits. Let me give you an example. If I got neutral karma, and I've done a few too many things to gain karma, and want to keep my bonuses, then during Big Trouble in Big Town, for example, I might instead choose to wipe the town out. Gotta maintain that neutral karma, after all. That said, even talking as though these quests really have moral merits is a bit fucking absurd. As explained, the power of the Atom issue is a Fallout 3 as a whole issue. When most of the simplistic choices in the games are black and white, good and evil, there's less of a question of moral merits, and more deciding if you're going to be Jesus or Satan. In fact, I honestly think New Vegas made a bit of a mistake in this regard, because New Vegas contains too many optimal solutions. Consider Boulder City Showdown. You can either help the NCR kill the Khans, help the Khans kill the NCR, free the hostages but then immediately betray the Khans, or negotiate for the Khans to go free and get the NCR to honour the deal, which leads to everyone surviving, reputation gain with the NCR, and reputation gain with the Khans. So, why would you ever do anything other than that? It's literally a perfect resolution with no downsides. Why would you do anything other than that? Because role-playing, of course. Though from his Fallout 4 defense video, I know he doesn't know what that means. In the entire franchise up to Fallout 4, Power Armor was just an elite armor type. There were no perks for it. If you wanted to roleplay as a Brotherhood Knight, then I hope you've got a good imagination, because the game's got nothing for you. It's fucking hilarious that you say you hope the audience has a good imagination, because that's exactly what roleplaying often entails. No, seriously. I really love how you were trying to take a jab at the other games for not having perks for roleplaying purposes, and in doing so, you tipped your hand and proved you don't actually know what the roleplay in roleplaying games even means. Good job! What if you don't like the cons? I think they're more trouble than they're worth for the Mojave. What if you're roleplaying as someone who despises them for whatever reason, including aiding Benny? What if you're playing a Legion Align Courier who would prefer to wipe out the NCR here? There's plenty of reason one might choose any of the options besides the optimal peaceful option, and even then, these options existing aren't a bad thing. This optimal solution is good for the two parties involved, but the player could certainly have their own agenda that does not involve happy endings for the NCR and great cons. John cites his quest under the complaint that too many quests have optimal endings for all sides, but he fails to explain why that's a problem. Even ignoring role-playing reasons, it's a choice regardless, and different people are likely to make different choices, so... Why would that be an issue? There's plenty of these in New Vegas and the game is better for it, because if you had been paying attention to New Vegas is teaching us with these opening quests, you'd realize it's teaching us about how the world works. Ghost Town Gunfight teaches us that conflicts will arise in a world where there is no peaceful solution. There will be blood regardless of what you do if you decide to pursue these paths. Boulder City Showdown expands upon this idea, showing us that peaceful resolutions can be made if you choose to do so, and the speech check to do this is relatively low, so it's easier for players to do this early on into the game. But you're still just as free to choose the other options. John refers to other choices in this quest almost as if they're entirely worthless. He literally asks why would you ever make the other choices, since the optimal solution is so easy to achieve, which shows he fundamentally does not understand what choice is to these games and why it's so important. In Fallout 3, even a quest as simple as Power of the Atom has a downside to the good resolution, 
Even if you arrange for Burke to die so he can't send Hitman after you, it locks you out of ever owning the Tenpenny Tower Suite. You can only ever own either the Megaton House or the Tenpenny Suite. This isn't anything Fallout 3 deserves credit for. In fact, it's pretty standard for games that have any kind of choice that there would be different rewards for different choices. In fact, Fallout 3 was actually very good at balancing rewards in general. Head of State, for example, was much easier to complete if you just joined the Slavers, but the best reward came if you sided with the Slaves. The Wasteland Survival Guide is incredibly easy to complete. You can lie to Moira if you want and do the bare minimum work for each chapter, but the perk you'll receive at the end is much better if you put in the work. This is like the bare minimum the game should be doing. Praising these aspects is the equivalent of giving it a participation award. It's a base expectation that extra work will yield extra rewards. Anyway, let's move on because it's time to get to the perhaps controversial bits. The bit that I think Fallout 3 does utterly masterfully, and it's right there. Look very, very closely. Yep, nothing. It would be very easy to make a joke that John is correct here. The Fallout 3 does do nothing masterfully. I mean, it's kind of true. Empty space. The Wasteland of Fallout 3 is a masterpiece, and it's where many of the points I've been discussing so far all come together, and it's where everything that's best in Fallout 3 works perfectly in harmony. You see, Fallout 3 is set in the post-apocalypse. I know it doesn't feel like that needs to be said, because Ron Perlman never shuts up about it, but it actually does, because New Vegas isn't. That's a post-post-apocalypse game. This is such an asinine distinction to make here. It really just comes across as completely unnecessary shots at New Vegas now. It's not a post-apocalypse game, it's a post-post-apocalypse game. It's also a mostly meaningless distinction to most people as well as the average person isn't going to understand or even care about the difference, because to them, there isn't really much of a difference. Let me give you an example. When it comes to music, there are different genres. Rock, metal, blues, pop, rap, country, and so forth. However, there are subgenres that the average person wouldn't be aware of, but people who are really into music or are avid fans of the genre would know, like heavy metal, Glam metal, hair metal, death metal, and so on. So to most people, this would be a meaningless statement. It just sounds good. However, that would be if John was even accurate on this point. A post-post-apocalypse setting should be more removed from the apocalypse, but still suffering from the long-term issues that arise. The Mojave hasn't moved past the post-apocalypse in any truly significant way. They're still living in the shadow of it. The whole game, along with the series as a whole, consists of factions trying to push their perspective of the best way to put society back on track, and very notably, the philosophies of these factions are not necessarily ideal. New Vegas is about rebuilding. The savagery of the immediate post-war era has mostly been swept away. There's plenty of water and electricity, and rads are basically a non-issue. In fact, it's almost weird how little radiation there is in New Vegas for a game literally called Fallout. All of the Fallout games are about rebuilding, except Fallout 3, 4, and 76, that is, which are more akin to Fallout-themed amusement parks. Fallout 1, 2, and New Vegas all clearly show a world that is rebuilding, whereas Fallout 3 and 4 show a world that is stagnant, that isn't progressing, that isn't making anything new. Outside the Institute, of course, but they're riddled with plot holes at every level, so they're not even worth considering. Fallout 1 had the Gunrunners making new weapons, and Shady Sands having made their own buildings and growing crops. Fallout 2 saw Shady Sands grow into the NCR. It had Vault City and the Miners of Redding, the community of ghouls, super mutants, and humans in Broken Hills, working and living together. There were people everywhere attempting to rebuild society. In New Vegas, we see the NCR after its peak, as it starts to suffer from similar issues pre-war America democracy began to run into. The Mojave has a load of NCR resentment, and it presents the player with a question of if the NCR is the best route for civilizing the wastes. Beyond that, are House and Caesar any better? New Vegas, like Fallout 1 and 2, still involves fighting over what is the best avenue for rebuilding society. Fallout 3 gives us a world where no one is growing food. It gives us a world where no one is building anything new. Everything is just scavenged in a world that has supposedly been lived in 
for 200 years. No factions have arisen aside from the two already firmly established factions from previous games, and a group of generic mercenaries who are just raiders but better equipped. But Fallout 3 is set in an entirely different world, a lonely, desperate world of chaos and surviving day to day with a habit of making you feel tiny and alone. And I think the entire world design is built around that core idea. A lonely, desperate world of chaos and surviving day to day. Which is why we have the Nuka Cola bitch, or the costume dipshits in Canterbury. You can't have a sense of things being so grim and desperate when you have shit like that destroying the tone. Fallout 3 presents a world that's entirely unbelievable if you actually look at what it's showing you. No food, apparently no water, yet, as mentioned earlier, no one seems to care, unless it's convenient for the sake of a quest. For example, when you ask why the Temple of the Union doesn't take slaves in, they cite food as being an issue. They don't have enough food to feed every escaped slave who happens by and grow their numbers. Well, what is their food source? They don't have one. They can't survive themselves. They shouldn't be alive. You're supposed to just take what the quest tells you and not think about it at all. Just accept it and move on. It's funny John complains about New Vegas telling and not showing, when it's a far more dire issue for Fallout 3. You see, the first thing to grasp is how crucial empty space is to Fallout 3, and that's a bold choice to make, and one that Bethesda didn't repeat in Fallout 4. Instead, in Fallout 4, the map is densely packed. You're always only a minute away from some clear sign of current habitation, reinforced by the revised Skyrim-style compass, which replaced subtle tick marks with large symbols, clearly advertising what was around the corner. In New Vegas 2, the map is densely packed, and in a game in which major world powers and nation building around you, you'd kind of expect things to be busy. Also, just in case you're confused, yes, Fallout 3 and New Vegas have pretty much the same map size, yes, New Vegas has 20 more locations, and yes, Fallout 3 is still less dense. This is actually because Fallout 3 has a huge concentration of locations in the DC ruins, where they look very close together as the crow flies, but actually aren't because of the blocked off streets and the need to use the metro stations to get between them. And this cluster of locations in the ruins means that the Wastelands locales are actually much more spread out. You see, Fallout 3 is the only game in the entire franchise that truly embraces the horror and loneliness of a silent, dead, post-apocalyptic world. Now, it might seem odd to hold that against Fallout 1 and 2, as in those games, world exploration is handled via the map screen, except you're pulled out of the map screen for random encounters, and those encounters are overwhelmingly because your character has just run into something relevant to the current world, a faction, or some wildlife, a caravan, some raiders. In fact, I went through the entire list of random events in Fallout 1 and 2, looking for those that put any focus at all on the fact that there was an apocalypse that wiped out the vast majority of the world not that long ago, and that's kind of a horrific nightmare, and there aren't any. There's a ruined nuke truck in Fallout 1 and a cave with a vault that never got completed in Fallout 2. They kind of count, I guess. The reason Fallout 1 and 2 mostly only had encounters related to the current world it's because that is what mattered, in the context of things you randomly come across. The apocalypse was in the past, and being reminded of it constantly was both unnecessary and irrelevant to the here and now. These random encounters provided enemies to fight as you went from point A to point B, but also showed that the world was surviving and rebuilding, not lingering on the past. Also, Comparing the exploration of Fallout 3 to the random encounter system of the classic games is grossly misleading. The primary form of exploration of Fallout 1 and 2 consisted of finding items and talking to people within the primary locations. Exploring through the glow, an area that was literally hit directly by a nuke, offers a conversation with Zax, who gives plenty of information on what went on in the days leading up to the apocalypse. The Ace computer in San Francisco offers information on AI before the Great War, along with the computer's own thoughts on how AI may have tied into causing the Great War. Most notably, areas like Necropolis, the LA region, and the GLOW are all indicative of the apocalypse occurring. Fallout 3's many locations that show off the destruction brought upon by the apocalypse is a good touch, but it's certainly a result of the game going from an isometric RPG that utilizes a world map for travel to a fully 3D first-person shooter in which exploration is much more emphasized. In fact, let me give you an interesting comparison. In Fallout 1, you leave the vault, 
and you find a corpse by the vault door immediately. That's Ed. He's someone who previously left the vault, which we know because he's wearing a Vault 13 jumpsuit, and he's there to teach you how to loot, give you some ammo, and indicate that the world is dangerous. In Fallout 3, something very similar happens. You leave the vault, and there are corpses by the vault door. But it's not vault dwellers who left, and it's not there to give you anything. Instead, you see the signs they're holding, and you instantly know. These are people who came to the vault after it closed, immediately after the apocalypse, and begged to be let in, and they were left outside to die. I hope you remembered that thing I said to keep in mind about 489 hours ago, because it's time to reincorporate it. The skeletons in front of Vault 101 are an issue too. So apparently these people just sat here and allowed themselves to die, rather than trying to survive or do anything else, which is fucking stupid on its own. But worse than that, the people who were rejected from the vault were the ones who settled in Megaton. You know, that town 50 meters away from 101? So, which is it? Did the survivors of Springfield settle in Megaton, or did they allow themselves to starve to death outside the vault? Unless, of course, we're to believe nuclear fire burned the flesh off their bones, hence the darkened bones, but it didn't burn their wooden paper signs, nor did it burn the wooden entranceway to the cave. While details like this do show a good attempt at meticulously building the capital wasteland, it illustrates Bethesda's problem with set pieces giving way to inconsistencies and nonsense. Straight after that you leave the vault and the first thing you see isn't Megaton, it's Springvale. The houses are broken but there are suitcases on the doorstep. You can find the Vault 101 acceptance letter for Officer Gomez's ancestors and a letter denying access to one of their neighbours. There's a silent children's playground and beyond that there's a school with skeletons of children locked away, with what happened not entirely clear. There's a silent children's playground. Yes, because a ruined playground in the post-apocalypse is going to be swarming with laughing and screaming children, right? John is putting far greater importance into the set dressing, pulling out meaning that isn't there. It's all just stuff to fill up the world, because something has to go there. In fact, it'd be entirely unrealistic for there not to be playgrounds in the world. Is this the point we've reached? Where to defend Fallout 3, he has to take mundane things and make them seem like a really big deal? Fallout 3 is full of these moments, tiny, unspoken stories, couples who died in each other's arms, suicides, and if you want something truly horrific, listen to the Keller family transcripts. Mom, it's Candace. Oh my god, it's really happening. I can see the cloud. It's so big. Mom, I'm so scared. Now I've heard that several times before and I still find it pretty harrowing, but this sort of thing makes Fallout 3 work, because Fallout 3 is the post-apocalypse Fallout. Things are horrifying, and lonely, and violent, and desperate, and that ties so much of the game together. While these details are a nice thing to have, and they do add a bit of visual storytelling to the world, they're not the substance of it, nor is it the thing that makes Fallout 3 better. Sorry to say, but there's so much wrong with the fundamentals of this game that no amount of neat details can save it. Yeah, sure, the main story is garbage, but look at these skeletons of people who died in each other's arms. If the story, characters, and world building were actually done well and consistent, then these details could be something that improves the game greatly, that elevates it up to another level. But as it is, it's near meaningless. It's like having a cake that's burnt and disgusting, but has an expert level icing design. The details don't save the substance of what it is. So there's a rather large section I'm basically going to skip here. I don't care enough about the DT or DR to make a big argument against this point. However, I did receive a comment on the original video that refutes the point fairly well, the one I'm showing on screen now. You can pause and read if you feel like it. This comment also counters the nonsense point that New Vegas wasn't built around its survival mode, but Fallout 4 was, despite the fact that Fallout 4's survival mode is garbage. It took nearly five months to actually be implemented after fans begged for it. It's not really built around the mechanic existing if it wasn't out on release. Sorry, that was a bit of a digression. Let's get back to Fallout 3's atmosphere. 
Naturally, this damage resistance system suits the grim post-apocalypse perfectly, because in Fallout 3's early and mid-game, you are vulnerable, and you can go down pretty quickly, as anyone who's ever accidentally run into an early game super mutant brute with a minigun knows all too well. This also works alongside Fallout 3's combat mechanics, which I think don't deserve all the criticism they get. Yes, combat is slightly clunky in Fallout 3, and that's good, because Fallout 3 isn't a shooter, it's an action RPG. And because your character isn't a soldier, they're a teenager from a sheltered environment whose only experience of gunplay is their BB rifle. I still can't believe he's trying to defend the poor gunplay here. Clearly John is missing the fact that shooting in general could be done better, and still within the realm of being an RPG, without being garbage like it is in Fallout 3. Weapon sway, for example, is something that can decrease as your skill in guns gets higher. However, Fallout 3 has more than simple weapon sway. Fallout 3's bullet spread is so poorly done that it results in bullets flying out of the barrel of your gun at random directions, rather than straight out of the barrel as it should. When the variation on where the bullet goes should be down to weapon sway, your character's inability to hold their gun still and properly. New Vegas is also an RPG, and yet it manages to handle its gunplay far better. Also, it should go without saying, whether or not there is a lore reason for the game having lousy mechanics doesn't change the fact that the mechanics are still shit. This excuse would be somewhat valid if by the time the player has maxed out their weapon skills these problems go away, but they never really do. But what's worse than that is that Bethesda actually did try hard to make the gunplay good, completely contradicting John's point here. Our game is primarily first person, so when you have guns in first person, the bar has been raised. You know, you've got Halo 3, Call of Duty 4, you get to approach that level, but it's tough because we're an, we're an RPG, not a shooter. What we definitely wanted to do with the gun stuff is not do everything that everyone else has done. So, you know, we have some weapons that you can craft and some unique weapons, you know, like the rocket launcher that shoots all the crap you find in the world. It can shoot it as projectiles. Uh, the hardest part has definitely been how you do gun combat within an RPG, how your stats affect your aim, affect your damage. Uh, we've been over that hundreds and hundreds of times, how much the guns spread, how much damage they do, and trying to make you feel like you're getting better as you get more powerful. We had a build that was just called Guns. And all the build was about was shooting guns. Like, how do they feel in your hand? And so there was no, it must do this, it must do this, it must do this. It's just about guns. And that kind of will get us on a path of something that is just a lot more fun. Yes, combat is slightly clunky in Fallout 3. And that's good, because Fallout 3 isn't a shooter, it's an action RPG. And because your character isn't a soldier, they're a teenager from a sheltered environment whose only experience of gunplay is their BB rifle. Oh my god, how embarrassing. But there's one more genius twist in Fallout 3, and that's how the game quietly turns you into an explorer, and thus provides you with a reason to explore its wasteland magnum opus. Jesus Christ, get a rum already. I'm pretty sure this video should have an adult rating because, well, I probably shouldn't make such a crude joke. John is once again overselling aspects of this game to make them sound infinitely better and more significant than they actually are. Always pay attention when people start using flowery language because there's a good chance they're trying to sell you bullshit. Now we mentioned previously how New Vegas is a curated experience in terms of its enemy placement, and that's still true. We also looked at a couple of maps earlier, and perhaps looking at them again, you might realise another way that New Vegas is a very curated experience. It's the roads. New Vegas loves roads. I don't care what your father says, let's run away together. In literally the first town, people are giving you instructions based on the assumption you'll be following roads. Sunny even specifically says you should stay on the roads to be safe, and the quest markers agree. The road out of Good Springs perfectly syncs up with the They Went That Away quest marker, and then you can walk pretty much all the way to Benny without ever leaving the tarmac if you wish. Stay on the road, nice simple enemies, a few raiders. The road is king, and if you have a new quest, there will absolutely be a road that leads there, which will be the safest way to get there. A road is a wide way leading from one place to another, especially one with a specially prepared surface which vehicles can use. Roads consist of one or two roadways, British English, carriageways, each with one or more lanes and any associated sidewalks, British English, pavement, and road verges, a bike path, British English, cycle path, a road used for by bicycles may or may not run in parallel with other roads. 
Other names for a road include parkway, avenue, freeway, motorway, or expressway, tollway, interstate, highway, thoroughfare, or primary, secondary, and tertiary local road. Historically, many roads were simply recognizable routes with any formal construction or maintenance. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development OECD, defines a road as a line of communication traveled way, using a stabilized base other than rails or airstrips open to public traffic, primarily for the use of road motor vehicles running on their own wheels, which includes bridges, tunnels, supporting structures, junctions, crossings, interchanges, and toll roads, but not cycle paths. The Eurostat ITF and UNECE Glossary for Transport Statistics Illustrated defines a road as a line of communication, traveled way, open to public traffic, primarily for the use of road motor vehicles, using a stabilized base other than rails or airstrips. Included are paved roads and other roads with a stabilized base. For example, gravel roads. Roads also cover streets, bridges, tunnels, supporting structures, junctions, crossings, and interchanges. Toll roads are also included. Excluded are dedicated cycle lines. I can't believe we're at the point of talking about roads, but let's do this, I guess. Roads are pretty important for any kind of civilization. Maybe not necessarily roads as we know them. Paths, trails, and so forth. It's easier to drive on the road than it is over rocky, uneven ground, which is why we have special vehicles for that. Similarly, it's easier for people to walk over flat, even ground rather than uneven ground. This is why out in the wild, away from cities and civilization, you may come across trails in nature, such as hiking trails or portaging trails. Point is, these are signs of a society, particularly in the case of New Vegas, one that is rebuilding. It only makes sense that people would follow existing roads. Fallout 3 wipes most of the roads off of the map entirely. There seems to be little rhyme or reason for their placements in most cases. Now even that is fine. There's nothing at all wrong with that, but you'd think in a world where people are trying to survive, and one in which trade is regularly cited as a solution to many of the other problems in the game, that at the very least some trails would start to get worn in the dirt from the travel of caravans or hunters that supposedly bring necessary supplies to each settlement or potential travelers. But there isn't. Yet another victim of Fallout 3's abysmal world building. For a world that's supposedly trying to rebuild and survive in the post-apocalypse, exactly as I said earlier, it seems as though this entire world is static, as if nothing at all is happening, or any kind of significance outside of the player's influence, as if it's just a bunch of ideas and set pieces nailed together with no rhyme or reason, and only poor excuses for why it's built this way. An amusement park with a Fallout coat of paint on it. But in Fallout 3, what, for example, is the optimal way to get to Vault 112 and Smith Casey's Garage? How does the game want you to get there? Because the road near Vault 101 doesn't go that way, it veers north, and the largest road south is a raised freeway you can't access. The simple fact is, Fallout 3 doesn't have a route it wants you to follow. Fallout 3 doesn't think like that. Fallout 3 is just an open space. In fact, trying to follow roads in Fallout 3 is a terrible idea. They're no safer than the waste, all the same random events are being drawn. In fact, they're probably slightly more dangerous, as the odd fixed military checkpoints can be manned by all sorts of nasty robots, and the Enclave often set up shop on roads too. And that is arguably a fault of Fallout 3. A lack of paths for people to follow implies a general lack of travel, which is an issue in a world where you have to hunt or trade with other settlements in order to survive. Fallout 3 lacking roads to some locations isn't even a big deal, though. There's no road to Vault 22 in New Vegas, for example, just like Smith Casey's Garage. That's neither a positive or a negative. It only makes sense that some places wouldn't have road access, or would have less traveled paths or trails. But Fallout 3 generally lacking trails between towns and other major locations is another world-building problem. It doesn't have to be a literal paved road, either. Looking back at New Vegas, the game's roads provide the player with extremely easy access to the game's quests, as well as grounding the world in reality. What I mean by that is, the primary locations in New Vegas feel very cohesive and interconnected, with each of them having some sort of element to them relating back to the central tensions of the Mojave. What makes this notable is that Fallout 2 was criticized by Fallout creator Tim Kaine for how each area was made in almost complete isolation from the others, 
There is no overarching theme, and no attempt to make sure the different areas were cohesive. It felt like a lot of Fallouty areas placed adjacently and connected with a storyline. Those areas were individually well done, but they suffered from a lack of a strong central design. Now that lack of obvious roads in Fallout 3 means you'll often just head off into the wasteland as the crow flies, and here's where everything I've been discussing starts working together. I've discussed earlier how Fallout 3 has a lot more empty space than New Vegas, and all of these factors are a recipe for a sensation of exploration. In a game series that has never been about exploration. That's not to say this is even a bad thing. It's just not really what Bethesda should have focused on. Most people aren't going to care to explore every random dungeon or location they come across. It's just not necessary, especially when so many of them look so similar to one another and start blending together. It's also worth noting that, once again, this is a totally unnecessary comparison to New Vegas. In fact, I can show you this live. I was literally just heading west to record some footage and I saw this big radio transmitter thing and I couldn't remember what it was, so I went to go and have a look at it. Keep in mind, I chose the route that I'm on. No road, middle of nowhere, and now I'm diverting to go and have a look at something. To me, that feels like exploring, and that's where the empty space comes in. If everything's so densely packed together that you just accidentally wander into location after location, you're not exploring, you're not discovering, you're just encountering. A distinction without a difference. Even stumbling upon something could still be exploring if you're, you know, exploring. To give an example, Morrowind similarly has empty space in its map. However, in the vanilla version of the game, the render distance is so low that anything that isn't relatively close is obscured by fog. As such, it's possible to be out and about exploring and find locations because you happened upon them. And I have to stress this point again. Random dungeons aren't the substance of what Fallout games are. And I know John is going to refer to non-dungeon locations as well, but the vast majority of locations on the map are dungeons. But Fallout 3 was big and empty enough that if you wanted to, you could 100% walk quite a significant distance across it without hitting any named location. But of course, you'll see things. A church over there, a power plant on top of that hill, the radio mast I just showed you. And because there's enough space that you don't have to go to them, going to them becomes a choice. It's something you've opted into, and that means you're actively exploring. Why would a map marker change how much you're exploring or not? Let's take the scenario. You pick a direction and walk, and you see a building in the distance, and you choose to go up to it. How is that any different than seeing a map marker instead of a random building? John is acting as though map marker somehow removes choice. He literally just referred to approaching an unmarked building as becoming a choice. Yet, it's still just as much of a choice to approach a location with a map marker. You're not forced to go to the map marker. It's no less of a choice than going to that random building. Now what is in these random buildings? Maybe a few generic enemies? Raiders or super mutants? Some typical loot? Ammo, stim packs, chems, caps? And typically not a whole lot else. It's a neat thing to find in most cases, but once again, it's not anything substantive. In the case of the radio tower John sees, it's actually the location of a quest, Agatha's Song. The goal of which is to retrieve a quest item from a dungeon. Literally the most basic a quest can be. On top of this, John is literally just describing what is to be expected from these types of games. New Vegas, a game which doesn't seem to emphasize exploration, has similar elements, such as Black Mountain satellite dishes and the Mojave Outpost statue. Skyrim handles exploration exceptionally well compared to the Fallout games, likely because exploration actually is a key focus of the Elder Scrolls. In Skyrim, major locations can be spotted from super far away. These aren't random buildings on the horizons either, but are clearly designed with beckoning exploration as seen by the dungeon structures jutting out from the sides of mountains, and points of interest like the Statue of Azura. I mentioned rewards in Fallout 3 earlier as well, and that fits into this too. Exploring in Fallout 3 works because you can be certain that there'll be something worth looting there. Between bobbleheads, weapon schematics, unique weapon variants, hundreds of skill books. You can be certain that you'll always find some kind of loot in a world full of loot around every corner. I guess that just means the exploration is great, because you can find things that have value. Is it really so easy to please people? 
Man, for the next game, they should really do something to give every item some kind of value to the player. Because of that will make the game infinitely better, won't it? Maybe they should have just put a quest or something instead of a shallow dungeon with generic loot. But there's one other thing I've already discussed that comes back in here as well, and that's quests and locations. Because as we saw on the map earlier, Fallout 3's main quest uses a relatively small proportion of the map, and some of its most fun areas, from Andel to Oasis, are reserved exclusively for explorers, and that's... Wonderful. Some of its most fun areas from Andale to Oasis. Just a reminder, John himself said Oasis was simplistic earlier. And Andale are just a bunch of cannibals. Literally the most generic and boring thing you could do with a group that eats some kind of unknown mystery meat. 99 times out of 100, it's cannibals. You know what, ladies and gentlemen? I could go on. I could. I could talk about every individual quest in detail. But you don't because the few examples you cherry-picked are the ones that support your arguments best, and the rest don't. It's hard to defend the game from the lack of choice criticism when quests like Agatha Song or Nuka-Cola Challenge exist. Funnily enough, there are few enough quests that one could probably go through every individual quest in detail. But instead, I'm gonna hope that I've said enough to persuade you that maybe some of the narrative about Fallout 3 and its terrible, utter betrayal of Fallout isn't fair. That in some ways, Fallout 3 is actually a great success as a sequel to the classic Fallout. As opposed to the narrative that Fallout 3 is an utterly genius masterpiece that actually did do pretty much everything really well, and the critics are all just a bunch of hypocritical morons who don't know what they want and can't appreciate that Fallout 3 actually has everything they complain that it doesn't. That it's a very different but very worthy companion to New Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe even that in some ways, in some of the experiments it did, with the mechanics it mixed together, it created one of the most interesting representations of the wasteland in the entire Fallout franchise. Just think of everything I've talked about up until this point. How terrible the world building is on every level. A dead world, utterly incapable of supporting life. A world in which there are no consequences upon the wasteland for nuking a town. A world in which a water crisis is treated as a total non-issue by just about everyone in that world who is affected by it. A stagnant world that has been lived in for 200 years, yet nothing new is being made. Everyone survives off of scavenging, or the power of the developers saying they just are because of reasons. A world in which every building in Megaton has power, but no power source. A world in which killing a character results in a name being painted on a sign, but that character's employee still complains about that character as if he never died. A world in which characters have somehow obtained enough wealth to be rich snob stereotypes with no source or reasoning behind it. A world in which a town full of children exists because the developers thought it would be cool, yet there's no source for new children, and their flimsy wooden barricades have held off the super mutants who have far greater strength not to mention access to powerful weapons and who have been a plague to everyone else in the wasteland for decades. A world in which slavers run an extremely lucrative business, yet no one owns or uses slaves. At every turn, at every location, every piece of lore in the game, there are issues. One of the most interesting representations of the wasteland in the entire series? You've got a pretty strange standard for what is interesting, John. But perhaps best of all, I might inspire you to replay Fallout 3 and give it another chance with fresh eyes because I think it deserves it. No, it really doesn't. As I said at the start of this video, I'm not here to tell anyone they're wrong for liking Fallout 3. However, most of the criticism against the game is accurate and deserved. Criticism is important, because if we want better games, we have to be willing to criticize their failings or their weak points. Because when you give a pass to garbage, it's telling the developers that low-quality work is fine. It's why we got the likes of Fallout 4 and Fallout 76. When people make videos praising this garbage, flating the game, and the company responsible for their bad decisions, it only serves as further encouragement. Hell, despite how they were implemented super poorly, it was still nice to see Bethesda try and add new factions to Fallout 4, as well as make the gunplay less clunky, 
both of which were issues with Fallout 3. While it seems unlikely to happen, the criticisms people have of Bethesda's Fallout games offers them a lot of information that could make Fallout 5 and other future games really worth playing. But that's all for now. I'm going to leave things off here. But do, if you happen to be new, hang about. I do a lot of Fallout to this day. Hopefully, you'll join me for some of that. But in the meantime, I've been John. This has been many a true nerd. And Fallout 3 is better than you think. I said this the first time around, and I'll say it again here. Fallout 3 is far worse than I imagined. Before doing these videos, or even making this channel, I knew Fallout 3 had issues. But I had no idea the extent of them, how deep those issues went. This is now my third time covering Fallout 3, but the first time being the original response to John, and the second time being my standalone analysis, and despite all that, I'm still finding new issues with the game. It really is a disaster on every level. As for John's video, he barely had any valid or accurate points throughout. He removed context that was inconvenient to his points. He twisted the facts and misrepresented situations. He exaggerated aspects of the game to make them sound bigger and better than they actually were. He regularly used logical fallacies in order to defend the game from criticism. He misdirected and seemingly intentionally misunderstood criticism of the game to a pretty fucking absurd degree. He took another YouTuber's quote and applied it to an entirely different part of the game in order to debunk that quote and make the person who said it look like a moron. He conflated things constantly in such a way that was super convenient to his arguments. He outright lied about at least one thing I could verifiably confirm, and that argument was already based off an extremely flawed premise he came up with. He used his own speculation and assumptions and headcanon with little to no basis to defend the game. He even went on an extended tangent about New Vegas not having dungeons, based entirely on a theory he had. When looked at critically, and compared to the facts, most of his arguments and defenses for the game fucking crumble. Fallout 3 is better than you think? No, 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 no. Fallout 3 is abysmal fucking garbage.